We've been working our way to finals day all week long and we have arrived. This is the Visit Huntington Beach Dawn Patrol, part of the Vans US Open of Surfing. It is a beautiful morning here in Huntington Beach, California. We're live from the south side of the pier. Our finalists are arriving. Zhao Chianka, Rachel Tilly, an incredible group of surfers. There we see your surfer going out in their first heat, Caitlin Mickelson. Caroline Mark still in the draw. This is going to be an epic morning of surfing. And right there on screen, a perennial finalist anytime they're out there. That's Sugar the dog ripping. And uh, that right there is a great indicator of how much fun we're going to have today and that the waves have hung in there. It looks nice out there. Chris Cote, Shannon Hughes, Mitchell Salazar. So uh, it's been a long, intense week of surfing, and it all comes down to this. We've got Vans, Duct Tape, Invitational, Men's and Women's, Semis and Finals, Challenger Series, Men's and Women's, Semis and Finals. What that means is a big package of action. I know you both are looking forward to it. What is your most exciting thing that you think is gonna happen this morning? I think we're just gonna see really good surfing. I love that we're also gonna see that pairing of, of disciplines, longboarding and shortboarding going back and forth throughout the day, just like we saw at the Sydney Surf Pro. Yeah, and Mitchell, you know, we watched a little bit this morning, still nice waves out there. I think every surfer left in the draw is going to give in uh, quite some opportunities out there this morning. Yeah, absolutely. And I think everybody's going to give 110% too, but I really like the implications that this uh, day brings to the rankings for a lot of the Challenger Series surfers too. Joao Shianka, Zeke Lau, pretty far outside of the top 20 right now. And I do think people like Macy Callahan have a big opportunity right now to move up into the top three spots on the women's rankings. Yeah, so whatever the rankings were on Monday, throw them away. It's going to be a total shakeup on both the Challenger Series rankings and on the Vans Duct Tape Invitational rankings. Well, to start our day, let's go down to AJ McCord standing by with Kira Seal. All right, Kira, we have had all of the conditions you could possibly want or need in the Vans US Open of surfing throughout the first week. What can we expect for finals day? Well, Mother Nature gave us a bit of a surprise. The waves are actually really good. There's a lot of high quality waves out there. It's glassy and today we're seeing a lot of different peaks rather than just the pier bowl we see some peaks in front of the buoy to the side so i think there's going to be a lot of good surfing on tap a lot of good options for a finals day walk us through the order of operations so we're going to start with the women's semifinals, and that's for the longboard they're going to be 30 minute heats and then we're going to follow along with the men's semifinals for the longboard then the women's shortboard semifinals men's shortboard semifinals and then we're going to go to 35 minute heats and we're going to start off with the women's longboard final men's longboard final women's shortboard final and then kick it all finish it all off with the men's shortboard final all right so we have a ton on tap a ton to preview so we'll send it back to you guys in the booth thanks aj and with that it is on finals day here at the vans us open of surfing and as you can see on screen right there, still waves coming through. Let's take a look at your official surf line forecast for here in Huntington Beach, California. Mitchell, it looks like a couple of those blobs helped us out, pushing a little wind swell towards the pier. Yeah, and it actually looks like a winter day from my personal perspective out here right now. But as you do see, still some south-southwest in the water. It is decreasing throughout the day, but with the addition of that wind swell, there's going to be plenty of waves out there. And wind conditions, as you can see there, between three, six, eight knots throughout the day. When I see onshore wind, I actually get excited because that's air wind yes, for a sir. lot of these surfers in the Challenger Series. And for the longboarders, well, they've surfed through all types of conditions, so we know that they're up to the task. So we've got 30-minute heats. We're going to start off, as Kira said, with our women's longboard. That is the Vans Duct Tape Invitational Semifinals Heat number 1. This is a great matchup. Caitlin Mickelson going up against Kalis Kaleopaa. Uh, both these surfers, you know, have a different story coming into this event. Caitlin Mickelson right now ranked number ninth on the World Surf League Longboard Tour. Kalis Kaleopaa just always seems to be ranked up in the upper echelon of these tours. Uh, but right now she comes through as a wild card into the second event after not having surfed in Manly. And with that horn, we are on. So 29.50 on the clock, both surfers out the back right now. This is a, a research document right here. This is where we study the waves, study the technique, and study some of the strategies that we're seeing. Uh, Shannon, 
Caitlin Mickelson has had a dream run. We saw in her last heat yesterday, everything go her way in probably one of the most toughest situations uh, in terms of waves throughout this event. And Caitlin rose to the occasion and really thrived out there in some wild conditions. Yeah, Caitlin's been on an absolute tear. I like that she's been kind of switching between equipment. She's got two different boards with her. One here that has just slightly more rocker and is a little bit lighter. The other one's a little flatter and just has a little bit more weight to it. Uh, at the moment, she's out there on that board with just a little more weight, which she also rode in her early heat yesterday and then changed it up. So we could see her change uh, equipment if she paddles out in the finals later today. But Kalise getting that opening ride. Kalise starting off our finals day straight from the outside. So she has to kind of drop in and straighten off the wave crumbling around her. And here's where we're going to see the graceful transition from outside to inside. Nice turn there. So that was uh, one nice, long, smooth combo. Unable to pull off that last part of the wave, but uh, a decent start there for Kalis Kaleopa'a. What would you say her strengths and weaknesses are? Her strength is her grace. Um, I think for her, even just her approach on that entire wave, she didn't get too much with some huge scoring potential on it. But just to be able to keep that, that smooth flow coming all the way through, we'll take another look at it here. So quick footwork up and back. That was a really challenging section, and that's where we're going to see those surfers. If they're really quick on their feet, they're going to maybe be able to get that first nose ride. But coming through to this inside section is where we get to see that grace really come alive within her surfing. Nice nose ride, beautiful S turn cut back right in the pocket. And then here she just misses that little bit of projection that she actually needed for that board to carry through and ride through complete on that finishing maneuver. But really solid surfing for her. And she's the younger competitor of the two. She has far less experience at this level of competition. But she just seems to be real steady all the time. Here she is, the queen of Cardiff Reef. Caitlin Mickelson riding a Valerie Duprat surfboard, mermaid surfboard, so a female-owned and operated hand-shaped surfboard under Caitlin's feet. And she had some of the most spectacular finishes. Mitch, uh, our head judge, Corey, Tori Gilkerson, uh, of course, laying out the ground rules for what we want to see. but. How have you seen that inside section come into play for some of these longboard heats? Well, actually, Caitlin was the only person that kind of did in there yesterday, right? That kind of hop in the afternoon. But I think today with the wind swell, it's going to be just as crucial as the outside because it's so peaky that a lot of these waves are going to fade out real quick on the outside. As you see there, the replay, decent footwork at the beginning. Didn't really get a connection with the lip line, but you were mentioning that short break section. This is where it gets tricky because you need to be able to commit to one direction before you actually get to the shore break section. Luckily for her, that wave kind of backed off at the end. And some real nice cross-stepping right there. And Shannon, this is where I tend to see a lot of these people with a little bit higher level of experience kind of defeat their opponents before the heat even starts because they've been here, they've done that so many times before. And especially here in Huntington Beach, you need that level of, of experience to at least make it to finals day. And that's so true, given that we have seen such a variety of conditions this week. I mean, yesterday afternoon, the women's quarterfinals were run in, I have to say, conditions that we would typically not be running heats in. Mm -hmm. uh, but given that we were down to finals weekend, there's so much going on here at the Vans US Open of Surfing. We just had to get through the heat to be, to be set up here for, for finals day. And the surfers that had that knowledge really took it home. There's Kalisa's mom, Malia, there on screen, feeling a little bit stressed maybe, but there's still 25 <laughs> minutes on the clock. But really it is, Caitlin's had so much experience surfing the south side of Huntington, mm -hmm. Huntington Beach Pier from her Grom years all the way through to her current level of competition that she might have the upper hand. Quick cross step. Oh, and she gets to the nose, our first hanging five of the day. Definitely not our last. Beautiful footwork from Kalise as she makes her way through this mid portion. Wave completely dissipates under her feet. Trying to get her weight forward, but the wave just disappeared. Like the first look at that. I'm, I'm seeing maybe a little bit of uh, tentative surfing right now with that outside section. Maybe they're kind of testing to see when and if the wave closes out. And as I say that, oh. forget about it. That was all action right there for Caitlin Mickelson. Charging to the nose, gets the five, but then the wave collapses around her. You know, she's got to swim in and get her board with 25 minutes to go. Small scores for now.
It could be meaningful. We never know what's going to happen in these heats. 2-1-7 for Caitlin Mickelson's first wave and a 3-6-7 for Kalis Kaleopa'a's first wave. So we've got a heat on our hands with 24-45 to go. That outside nose ride was really good. That's going to be a very difficult section today, especially as we're still approaching that low tide. Right. Really sucky, really peaky. And if the surfers can get to that outside nose ride, it's going to be something they really need to capitalize on. She was even able to stick there for a second. And that's unfortunate that she gets literally blasted off of her feet um, in comparison to this of Khalees. Beautiful footwork. She just had that a little bit more of that line opening up on the left, which has tended to be the, the situation, especially with, with the, those morning conditions looking like this. So for her, she'll probably get the better score. Um, we'll see as she kicks out here. That score came through as a 4.5, so the judge is rewarding that outside section, but also wanting to see a lot more to be able to get a better score. Yeah, and the background of these two ladies in the water right now is really cool. You have Kaylin Mickelson, who actually runs and operates her own uh, physical therapy clinic. Her husband, Niles, here with their baby as well. And um, Kaleese Kaleopaha, uh, Kaleopa, excuse me, her father, JP, one of the original Beach Boys from Waikiki. There's Niles, Kaitlyn's husband. And um, I was actually talking to him the other day about different types of equipment. And this is the one thing that I feel longboarders have in difference to shortboarders, they tend to ride a lot more difference of equipment. Um, a lot of shortboarders don't tend to ride long border, longboards. Longboarders tend to ride a lot of shortboards or twin fins or different kinds of subtle little differences, maybe a mid-length too. And I think that's where as shortboarders, we can kind of come together and start to like learn different types of craft and better our equipment eventually too. Yeah, you will surf better. Uh, the more boards you ride, it reminds me of the documentary North Shore, mm -hmm. where a guy from Arizona learned how to surf on a bunch of different boards. Oh, uh, best from, documentary yeah, ever. Past to present. 23 to go. Kalis Kaleopa in the lead. That last wave for Caitlin Mickelson. Just a 1 2 3. So that tells me that the judges are putting a lot of emphasis on the completion of the maneuver. And the difference that you see here in uh, on the longboard tour is a maneuver can last 15 seconds. I mean, it's about walking to the nose, doing your nose ride variation, walking back, and you're not done yet. You have to remain in control all the way through. That's why we you know, watch these longboard waves so closely because it really is all one fluid motion. You know, It's a little bit different in the Challenger Series when you basically have to stand up in the white water, get your nose in front of it, maybe give the judges a look. Hey, I did it. And you know, you'll be deemed complete. But uh, I like that from Monday all the way till now, the judges have been really spot on with what was a completion and what was not. So a great example of that was Caitlin Mickelson. It was a valiant effort to get on the nose on a big, sketchy closeout like that, but she wasn't given the credit that uh, she would have gotten if she had ridden out of that clean. Here goes Khalees now. Beautiful little kind of mid-sized wave. This wave just has the look that uh, it could potentially push her all the way to the shore break. Oh, switching it up. I couldn't tell you her stance. <laughs> She's so good going both ways. And contrary to what I thought, that wave completely dissipates under her feet. Yeah, it's going to be really hard to find those connections. I did talk to a couple of the surfers that are paddling out today, specifically on the longboard side. And they said that if you can find that outside connection, that's going to be really good. And you have to be super quick to your feet. Like for Caitlin's nose ride, that was a really, really critical section. Had she been able to straighten out enough to ride out complete, I think the judges would have rewarded her really well for it because the, the risk and the commitment to the right. critical section at the back was a lot higher than what we've seen from Kalisa's two waves, mm -hmm. but it just didn't, she was unable to ride out of it. Um, but to be able to actually find a wave that connects through the inside is gonna be pretty hit or miss. It's not really the easiest thing, which you notice as well. Not at all. And I actually wanna bring up some pretty relevant information um, for both of these ladies right now. Um, we say that Huntington is a super hard wave to surf, and it is, but I think Caitlin coming from that north area of San Diego, Carter Freef is actually a wave that actually breaks similar to here. On the outside, kind of reforms on the inside of the shore break at Shark Park, Chris. It tends to be a real difficult wave to surf and manage on the shore break. Same with Kaisers and, and Queens and even Koala Basin. You go into that left, it hits deep water, it tends to reform too. So I think attributing their success to those kind of waves that they have actually surfed for a majority of their lives has been a successful part of not only their relevance in this event, but so far how they're doing in the heat too. Yeah, for sure. And I would say just comfort level. I think uh, when we had that big swell mm -hmm. with all that water moving around and the wind and the, just the wild conditions, I think it really threw a lot of surfers out of their comfort zone, especially 
in the Vans duct tape invitational just because, you know, uh, on most given days, if it's big, closed out, windy, chunky, wedging, you know, I wouldn't think the log would be your first go-to and pretty much all these surfers in the Vans duct tape uh, will have a quiver of twin fins and fish boards yeah. and kind of, I think, uh, you know, quote unquote longboard specialists uh, oftentimes have the best quivers ever because, you know, they know that uh, ride the craft what the waves want. And uh, it was cool, though, to see people throwing out of their comfort zone. I really enjoyed watching that. They all rose at the occasion. 1924 to go here in semifinal heat number one, our first heat of the day. The sun is out, the sand is filling up, and Louisa Florence is on the scene. Yes, I am. Good morning, everyone. It's a beautiful day. It's finals day for Duct Tape Invitational and Challenger Series here at Surf, US, Surf City, USA. Look at this. It's 7.46 local time. The sand is filling up. So if you're thinking about coming, come over soon because this is going to be packed. Look at this. We even have a walkway for our surfers to come down. And you know what that means. It means crowd. <laughs> Thank you so much, Louisa Florence in the front row. Good news is all those seats right there, they're free. No uh, no admittance fee to get down here or to get your spot on the pier. It's going to be hard to get a spot on the rail. Our photographers have been out there since about 6 a.m. this morning. But if you want to learn more about this great surf destination, this iconic spot, check out Visit Huntington Beach and uh, plan your trip. I do see a lot of people around town from all over, you know, the Midwest, the East Coast yeah. during this week. And I think for years and years, people have really learned that uh, it's a good idea to plan your summer vacation around the Vans US Open of surfing because it just gives you one more super fun thing to do. Um, a lot of visitors from from out of town here. And it is, uh, it, it's, it's really fun to walk around at night and you just kind of see people taking in the spectacle because the action doesn't stop when the sun goes down here in Huntington Beach. It was popping last night on Main Street. Yeah, it has been very crowded. It's been a little difficult after work to actually get in and get some <laughs> dinner somewhere because everywhere has just been so packed. But that's one of the things that we love about this time of the year is the fact that it is it does have that draw card of just getting so many people from around the world, from around the U.S. here to be able to witness something special. And I think that's also been something that's been really cool to see what the Vans U.S. Open of Surfing has done around this, the entire beach setup here. There's so many different activations going on to plug into and yesterday my family came down and for the first time ever my little niece and nephews were able to see a surfboard being shaped they got to see it being planed to the van doren village they got to see the glassing process and i think that's something that's really unique that this contest is offering is that space for people from around the world to come and be able to see those little intricacies to be able to understand what these surfers are riding in the water how to build a skateboard and then how to ride them and be absolute experts Hey, Chris, uh, if you don't mind me chiming in right here real quick, but that last shot from the pier kind of looking out into the water was actually re real crucial. This one right here. So you see how the angle of the swell, where it was more of a south-southwest, the hurricane swell was going into the pier. Now with that northwest wind swell, it's actually bringing that sand back to where it was originally. So it's kind of going to keep that reform next to the pier a lot more difficult for a lot of these surfers later today. They're actually going to have to get the reform right in the middle of the peak at the pier bowl. So check out one thing later, especially when the shortboarders come on. 16.20 to go. Khalees in the lead for now. Caitlin Mickelson looks like she could have a good run here. She fades left. Nice drop there. Edging her way to the nose. Gets a nice turn in there. And here's where she's scanning the line to get to the sand. Trying to get weightless there. She tries to make that connection so close. And uh, just trying to kind of make that board plane on top of the water as much as possible. If you engage the rail through that mid portion more often than not, you're going down. You know, it's kind of like when you're snowboarding, right? You've got to get over a flat spot, try to get weightless and just keep that board flat. Uh, and I feel like if, uh, if she couldn't make that connection right there, no one could because she had speed. She had that perfect plane, but the wave just completely disappeared under her feet. So now I'm thinking, Take off early, get up early, get to the nose, get your nose right in, out the back, well, or do a beautiful turn like that. Elise Kaleopa'a, yet to see a transfer made from the outside to the inside. And when I... There she goes. When I keep saying it's easy, see, I didn't say it right there, and she did it. No problem. Kaleese Kaleopa'a, all the way to the sand. 
nice. Oh. Ooh, that was scary. That is a huge fin coming at her. Keep our eyes on police. Oh, yeah, I think it did hit her in the back potentially. So. Oh no, Kalise. Yeah, we'll, we'll keep our eyes on Kalise right now. That's a really scary way to fall. Well, this wave started out so beautifully for her. You can just see that approach. Nice cross stepping, beautiful S turn, nice engagement of the rail. She's riding that Kai Salas longboard co. She typically rides the Waikiki model. Just has a little bit of a softer rail to it and trims through sections like this really well. And here, I just loved this approach because she linked herself up. She didn't try and force anything. She really wanted to go for that finishing section, but that board flipped. It goes underneath uh, those umbrellas. Ah. She's definitely landed on that fin and the rail, and those are not the kind of positions you want to be coming down on on a longboard. She's a warrior, though. I mean, she's paddling back out like if nothing happens, so plenty of time still left on the clock, and I would have to think this is her best wave, too, so she's going to go further out into the lead as well. All right, we'll, we'll keep our eyes on Khalees. It doesn't look like she's... Uh, well, she's not giving up, obviously, charging right back out there. So a lot of toughness with these surfers as well. And they have been surfing a lot over the past two days, many multiple heats. So uh, as we go now, semifinal heat number one, or we're halfway over 13.36 on the clock. Score comes through for Kalis. It's a 5.07. So she is in the lead. Caitlin Mickelson needs a 7.14. We're going to be right back with more action. Can Kalis fend off Caitlin? You're going to have to stay tuned and find out. You're watching the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. From the farms to your shelf, U-Theory Turmeric is the gold standard. Quality is the key ingredient every step of the way. Our turmeric features curcumin C3 complex, the most clinically supported turmeric extract in the world. We blend it with black pepper for enhanced absorption. And it's USP verified, so you know what's on the label is in the bottle. Available at utheory.com, all fine retailers and health food stores. Welcome back to the Vans Duct Tape Invitational, part of the world's largest action sports festival, the Vans US Open of Surfing. A huge day of finals today. We're already into the semifinals of the women's Vans Duct Tape Invitational. We're going to follow this up with the men's semifinals, Challenger Series semis, all the way till we get through four finals, long boards and short boards on display today in the water and on the sand. The Vans Showdown all wraps up today as well directly after we hand off the last trophy boom we go to the skate park and things will get wild some of the footage that uh i saw last night of the skating in the van showdown was insane they are going off over there and you could actually hear the crowd cheering during some of those preliminary rounds so it's going to be a fun day of quote action sports happening on the sand here but also a lot of fun to be had in the van Dorn village 
10 minutes to go here. Kalis Kaleopa'a in the lead. Caitlin Mickelson did get a wave during the break. It was a three-point ride. So uh, she bettered her position. Still needs a 6-5-7. And I feel like the, uh, the fin to the back for Kalis. Uh, we'll have to just wait and see how that affects her next ride. But this is uh, Caitlin Mickelson's last wave. Yeah, that was a shame. Caitlin was unable to get all the way to the nose there. You could see her get that first cross step in and just kind of assess the situation. Nice smooth trim line through to the inside. Let's see what she gets up to here. Beautiful redirect and then taps the five, but that nose just bites in with a little double up on the inside yeah. section. That's going to be a really hard section to negotiate, Mitch. Yeah, and I think getting to the nose as quickly as you can before the short break actually tends to stand up is going to be a big key of these lady successes out there right now. Elise has been finding these little gems. Kind of not all the way outside, but picking off medium-sized waves. No one doesn't give her the uh, opportunity to transfer to the inside, but it was a nicely done carve out the back. So now we're under nine minutes. Kind of a... Conditions right now. Beautiful blue, glassy, and a great looking wave for Caitlin Mickelson, and she can't get in there or does not want to get in there. Most likely kind of closed out around her. Yeah, she was right in the middle of that peak. Look at this left, though. This could be the one. She's chasing a 657. Mm. No. Yeah, I was about to say kind of a misuse of priority from Kalise, I felt. And then Caitlin lets two, wave go, two waves go. I think um, the lack of commitment on both of the, these surfers' parts um, have. They've left a little meat on the bone as far as the scores go, I personally feel. Um, especially these last two waves by Caitlin. It seems like she wasn't fully committed to the first paddle and then the second one even less. So a couple of missed opportunities, it seems. Yeah, she's actually had like three waves that she's really looked at dedicatedly, but while Khalees has been on the outside. So she hasn't lost that priority, mm -hmm. but she is starting to question things now and that's becoming very apparent. And I think where we're sitting now with seven and a half minutes on the clock, it comes back to that moment, that 1.23 that's on the scoreboard for Caitlin, where she had that really good nose ride right. on that super critical section, but fell. She had to swim for her board after it. If she had completed that wave and ridden out clean, she would have a very small requirement on the board right now to catch up to Khalees in the lead. And I think this situation, she would sit, be sitting with a lot more peace and patience right now. But all from that moment of her not getting that ride complete has set herself up now to kind of question some of those sections. Is it worth going on those bigger waves? If she falls again, it's going to go incomplete. She's going to have to swim for her board. All that questioning is starting to come into play. Paddling hard for this one. Turn there and goes down. So Caitlin Mickelson, another mistake there. But the good news is she has six minutes and 58 seconds to go. So she'll make her way back out to the takeoff zone. Mitch, I'm looking at the pier and you know, when we did have that big sweeping south swell, there was kind of an indicator that you could look way down the beach and know when a set's coming and yeah. maybe be able to time it. Are you able to look out towards the pier on a wind swell like this and see sets coming through? Do the pilings, does the water raise up on those pilings and give you a hint as to when a set's coming? To be honest, I couldn't even notice it yesterday. Um, I was in the athletes area for Joao and Ryan's heat, and I couldn't notice a lot of those sets breaking before they actually did. Identifying a wave right here, Caitlin Mickelson. This is with second priority. Good start to this one. Could have a line to the beach. Patiently waiting for this thing to form up. Now she's cross-stepping. Nice turn there. Getting into this crucial wow. shore break and that wave just flinging her off her board. She was pretty busy on that wave, running back and forth. Didn't get much time on the nose. Uh, you do get credit for cross-stepping and using the entirety of the surfboard, but of course, uh, the main goal is get on the nose and pose. We didn't see that on that wave, but it was nicely done. Yeah, that first kind of stall setup was really nice, but she still didn't get that that little bit of lift or projection out of the nose ride that she would have needed for it to be really kind of crucial and critical. This little section is really nice as well, and she wants to look 
for that nose ride. But one thing you'll notice and where the judges pay close attention to scores for nose rides specifically is when you're nose riding in a downward projection or when you're actually nose riding in that straight line yep. to lift up to the top of the wave. Nose riding in a downward projection, especially on the type of board that Caitlin's riding right now, means you gain so much speed that it's almost impossible or highly difficult to pedal back off the nose and then complete or go back to the rail. So for her, that wasn't really a section that she could even get to the nose because that board was already going so fast in a downward projection that she would have probably fallen coming off of the nose right. Mm -hmm. No, it's a great point because if you see the amount of great scores that we've seen on the outside from the nose right, it always seems like they tend to go on the ones where the section's steeper and they're always going at a faster speed. And in contrast, a lot of point break waves, you're seeing people nose right for a longer period of time because they don't have the same amount of speed as if they're going downwind, like you just said, like Caitlin. We've got four and a half to go. What do you guys think the ideal scenario would be? In my opinion, it would be take off on the outside, run up to the nose, get at least five over, come back, maybe a couple stylish kind of carving turns through to the shore break, and either, uh, you know, a subtle kind of, I don't want to say snap, a foam bounce finish or, you know, a cheeky little cheater five on the inside. It's kind of the combo of maneuvers I would think that the judges are looking for. What do you think, Shannon? Man, you are nailing longboarding. I'm so impressed from day one to day whatever we're on, 500. Your knowledge of longboarding, your eye for what the judges are picking up on is spot on. I would have broken that down very similarly. Getting that outside nose ride, extremely crucial today to be able to get those scores. Even for Khalees, she doesn't have anything over a five, but control, smaller section, she's been able to get those nose rides and then actually connect it through, which is gonna be the hard thing. And I think for some of those waves as well, it's gonna be important for those surfers to try and eye out where that white water is still running. Right. For the longboarders, it's it's challenging sometimes for us to commit to go cutting back to a section like that because we just want to try and find that nose right on the clean face. But here at Huntington, it tapers off so much and goes to dead water. You actually have to just commit to going, I'm going to be back in the foam, but at least it's going to push you all the way to the inside to find that reform. That's the biggest error I've seen all week long uh, with the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. I feel like too many people have been trying to go too far out into the open face. You can't do that in the midsection. It's too flat. It doesn't have enough power anymore. I was just going to say, I'm sensing a subtle momentum shift. That last wave for Caitlin Mickelson comes through with a 393, and she's at it again, trying to make the transfer. She's not going to get it, but you can just tell that there's a little bit more urgency right now. Caitlin's feeling it. I mean, look how she's paddling. She is trying to get right back out there to sit next to Khalees, who does have a lead, but the requirement now for Caitlin, a little bit, a little bit easier to grasp, a 564. She was looking for a 6.49, I believe, before that last wave she caught. So chipping away at that score line, 2.26 to go. This is a nice looking wave for Khalees Kaleopa'a. And she gets right up under the nose with a hang five. Beautiful turn there, setting things up. And she's definitely gonna make the transition to that inside section. You see the momentum that she has, the wave forming under her feet. And like I said, she's probably not going to make that transition to the inside section. <laughs> but it looked like she had the line, but it's crazy that all these different camera angles that are being covered right now, I mean, it looks like a different break from any angle. You go up on the pier, you're looking down, you go, oh, it's, it's lefts, right? It's all lefts from the beach. Uh, maybe it's rights. I mean, this is a very confusing lineup when it's like this, uh, just because you kind of never know what the wave is going to give you. But let's take a look at Khalees Kaleopa'a's last wave. Yeah, that was a really nice nose ride to start things off. She got a little bit of hang time on that hang five. Beautiful carve, cut back into that speedy section. And then this wave again, Mitch, it just fades out on her. She was probably going to be unable to make that connection anyways. But the judges rewarding it just because that outside nose ride was in a critical section. She had that little lift out of the nose ride as well, which is super important. No, and the commitment to the first section too. You know, she went straight to the nose as, as soon as she took off. And how about the composure from the young lady from Waikiki too? Um, she's not really known as a competitive surfer on the longboard scene, but I think so far she's used priority well in the last five minutes of the heat and she waited for a wave. It was actually gonna better win over scores. And now Mickelson's requirement, much larger, Chris. Yeah. Caitlin Mickelson now needs a 731. That last wave was uh, very telling because I feel like if you're stubborn in your approach and think that you need to make the shore break to get a decent score, you got to take that out of the equation. All you, you know, you saw right there, Khalees got up early, got to the nose, 
did a turn, so did a lot of work out the back, not having to rely on that inside section. Absolutely. And, you know, those kind of smaller turns or the straighten outs in the whitewater, they're cool looking, but most times they're only going to give you maybe 0.5, maybe yeah. one extra point. So I like Khalees's, uh strategy there to just get up, get her maneuvers in, and uh, get as much as she can from that outside section. And most likely, I think we're going to see that uh, be a trend in these next few heats, knowing that that transition to the inside is not going to be easy. Caitlin got the memo straight to the nose on the takeoff with a turn. So she needs a 7-3-1. It's a good start so far. Gets back to the nose, trying to push her way to the shore oh. break. And so close. Literally three more inches into that wave, and she would have made the transition to the beach. But as it stands now, Kalis Kaleopa'a is a finalist here at the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. Full credit and congrats to Caitlin Mickelson, a semi-final finish. That is huge. Came into this event, ranked in the top 10 on the World Longboard Tour. So she is going to put herself in a great position heading to Malibu. But it's all Kalise heading into the final. We got more longboard action. The Vans Duct Tape Invitational continues after these brief messages. We'll be right back. My job is professional surfer. My goal is to win titles. That's what I'm here for. The world's best surfers in the world's best ways. We've had a shark attack. Whoa. It's the most intense surfing scenario you can imagine. I have to step up my game now and not make any mistakes. Oh my god! <laughs> this is a war. You have to find a way to win it and do it at all costs. <laughs> Welcome back to the Vans Duct Tape Invitational, part of the Vans U.S. Open of Surf. Chris Cote here with Shannon Hughes talking you through semi-final heat number two. This, for all intents and purposes, is a final. Two of the top-rated surfers on the World Surf League Longboard Tour, Honolulu Bloomfield coming in ranked number one. Rachel Tilly ranked number five, but surfing like a number one ranked surfer throughout this entire event. She has definitely been one of the standouts. Oh, there's so many things to discuss within this heat. Uh, in some ways, I'm really happy they've met up again, but this is their sixth semifinal matchup at this level. And Rachel Tilly looks like she's getting that first wave. Nice section on the outside, unfortunately unable to make the connection. Honolulu got a piece of the action as well. I love that little stall fade to take off. Nice five to 10 combo. Let's see if she's able to make that section. That trim line is super impressive so far. I don't think that wave's gonna actually turn into a wave again because she was pretty much on flat water. She got this second wave as well. Nice footwork straight up to that hang five and finds that little white water just to give that extra push, which is what you're gonna need in some cases to try and make that inside reform. That was super impressive. Wow, she just, did it. Just the way that she was able to find that trim line. Nothing exciting on the finish there, but goes complete. So a couple of small scores. I don't think anything that's going to be like exceptional uh, between those first two waves. 
they're both getting those long those nose rides at the start and they're finding that little trim line coming out of it so Honolulu Bloomfield you're three-time Longboard World Champion 2017, 2019, 2021. Currently in that number one spot, uh, headed towards Malibu if she can get herself into the finals here. Obviously, she is going to be going into that Malibu finals with even more of a chip on her shoulder and more of a, a chance to uh, take yet another title. But Rachel Tilly has uh, really been on a roll and she's tasted that glory as well. She's your 2015 World Longboard Champion. Shannon, you know any backstory between these two surfers? You said they've competed against each other a lot of times. They've been doing it for a long time. We've got the, you know, classic Hawaii versus USA matchup happening here. But uh, what's the history between these two? Well, in their actual head-to-head -head matchups, they've had five total prior to this event, and every single time it's been in the semifinals, which means they've both been highly consistent and making it into finals day. Both of them, it's very rare to see them fall out before that quarterfinal finish. Um, I think for either of them, they probably haven't fallen out of the quarterfinals since they started winning world titles. For Rachel, that's been, what, eight years or something since she's not made it into the quarters. Same for Honolua. Um, but in the matchups, Honolulu's had Rachel's number. She's gotten the win four times to Rachel's one, and she's got a pretty high number for the fan picks right now. That's right. The Pacifico fans have spoken. 67% say that Honolulu Bloomfield is going to get the edge, but a solid 33% for Rachel Tilly. Uh, in terms of what Rachel's trying to do right now, I lean back on the words of Joe Wood. TSOL. This is for revenge. This she for wants revenge. to get a win here in the semifinals. Uh, you know, of course, making the final series feels so great, but there's got to be a bitter sweetness to it. I made the semis, you know, that's great. One more heat and it's a whole different story, but we know how uh, good and resilient Rachel Tilly is and uh, Honolulu Bloomfield on a roll as well. So this is the perfect semifinal matchup. Looks like a couple set waves rolling through here. Both surfers having a look. It's going to be Rachel Tilly, so she does have priority. Her pick of waves, a nice fade right, straight to the nose. It's a kind of a cool ride out, little elevator drop. And she's a little bit further up the beach, so we'll see if the transition is easier up there. It's not. Same situation. So again, it's about getting up and getting at it early. Get to the nose as soon as possible and then try to fit in a turn. That's where we've seen sixes come through in the score lines for surfers that have been active at the very beginning of the wave. And we'll see if uh, Honolulu does that. Stands up, yep, gets to the nose. And here comes the turn. Textbook ride right there. So she's probably already looking at a score around a four or a five at this point. The judges don't, you know, increase or decrease their scores throughout the wave, but you know, if uh, if she finished right there, it's probably where it would have been, but she makes it all the way to the sand. Gets that wild style finish and rides it to the beach. So she will get a little bit of extra credit for completing that ride. Love what she did out the back. I mean, that was exactly what we talked about. Stand up, nose, turn, boom. You've got yourself a decent chunk of points. Oh yeah, that's gonna be the best uh, score of the heat so far. Taking a look at Rachel's wave here. Nice approach, lovely bottom turn, swoops it into that nose ride, and then just gives that little crouch down to make it around the section. And then here, if she'd been able to get that bonus inside connection, she could be looking at a decent score. But this is the wave that they've both been looking for. Honolulu perfectly perched up to that hang five. You could even see that foot so far over that she's got like the arch of her foot hanging. And then she goes into a nice powerful cut back, which the judges are gonna love. And then here she's gonna make this connection, that reform, love the little kind of use of the hands there. And she doesn't get back to the nose here, but she does really good to negotiate this little double up backwashy section. And she actually makes it out in front, which we haven't seen at least in the first heat of the morning. And yesterday that was really challenging for surfers to do. Um, I think in the matchup and in the, the list of names in the women's side of the draw this week, both Honolulu and Rachel are probably the best at finding that little bit of extra momentum they need to ride out clean of those funny in sections. Um, so I'm curious to see where the judges are gonna go with that score. I really like the look of it. I think it'll probably be the best score we've seen this morning on the, uh, for the women's onboarding. Well, Rachel Tilly's wave comes through at a 4-3-3. That's enough to get her in the lead for now with one more score to come in for Honolulu. And it's exactly where we thought it was going to be a straight six. So uh, 
The nose ride, the turn, the equation comes through the highest single wave score of this heat. Rachel Tilly by no means out, needs a 5.58. Five, so she would need to basically match what Honolulu did on her previous wave. Still plenty of time to go, 21.14 on the clock. And uh, this one's starting really strong. Some big scores coming through. I think this is going to be a battle all the way to the buzzer blows exactly how we like it. So now both surfers out the back. Rachel Tilly has priority. So Honolulu identifying something, trying to get away from Rachel and potentially snag this wave out from under her priority. And Rachel is engaging, so she fades left. Honolulu goes right, Rachel jumps off her board, and Honolulu now carving back a beautiful cutback of a nine foot plus board. Trying to remain weightless to make the transition. Can she do it? Wow, that was... That was amazing. I shouldn't have said wow, because when I say wow, they don't make the transfer. Commentator curse right there, but either way, great turn out the back. Probably one of the best turns we've seen so far in the Vans Duck Tape Invitational semifinals. I don't know if she got up to the nose right out back, and here we go, take a look. All right, so we saw that split peak. That's the longest nose ride we've seen so far this morning. Nice control, nice section of the wave as well. A little bit of space, not like a super steep section, but that would have felt super, super good. And then somehow she just keeps making this connection. She like transfers now into the next wave in front of her and then just can't. So she goes from wave one to wave two. She can't quite make it onto wave three, but you know, pretty solid. Oh, Rachel now up and riding on a set. Yeah, this wave has uh, some energy to it. She runs up to the nose, cross-stepping the entirety of her board. Remember, the judges want to see you use all nine feet of these long boards. And of course, some of them are nine three, nine six, but nine feet plus, and they want to see you use the whole thing, turn off the tail, get to the nose and back. You know, basically like uh, in, in gymnastics, right? You think of the balance beam, about the same length and uh, about the same uh, danger element when you're running back and forth. 19 to go, winner of that last heat was Kalis Kaleopa'a. She is standing by now with Louisa Florence. Kalis, it's always super tricky to be the first heat of the day. Such a huge day, lots of emotions, and you're the guinea pig in the water. So tell us, how are the conditions today? I think today is probably one of the better days of the competition. Normally the morning heats have been very tricky that I've noticed, um, but this morning it's like super clean and glassy and like the waves are super fun for longboarding and I think the shortboarders will have a really fun time too. So yeah, we scored this morning. I saw you just coming out of the water a little bit like hurts. Tell us what happened. If like it's going to affect the finals or how is how are you feeling? Um, I get hurt very easily like back home like whenever I surf I always get hurt but I just hit the end section I landed on my fin like on my back. Yeah but it happens it's like the prices you pay when you surf so hopefully I, it just like doesn't bother me later on. <laughs> Tell me, how are you going to prepare yourself mentally, physically, spiritually for the finals now? Um, probably the same that I've been doing this whole time, just cruising with my friends and my family, you know, not really like overthinking. Um, the goal was to just make it to the finals, so now that I'm there, I can think of hopefully winning. Obviously, like that's the goal, so yeah, just kind of cruising. Amazing. Congratulations, girls. Thank you so much. Finals. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Our first finalist for the 2022 Vans Duct Tape Invitational, Kalis Kaleopa'a. Meanwhile, the Terminator is out there catching another brilliantly surfed wave. Honolulu Bloomfield is looking unstoppable. Rachel Tilly now needs an eight point ride. You know, we've talked about Honolulu just being so consistent, uh, picking all the right waves, always seems to uh, just find these little gems. And this wave didn't look great out the back, but she made full use of it and more beautiful hang 10 to start that, that wave. That was such a nice nose ride to start off. And like you said, it was a wave that you wouldn't have expected to offer that kind of potential. And she just eyed it out. She is so good. A true Hawaiian water woman at reading the ocean finds another hang 10 on the inside section. And then we'll take a look at that replay and just so gracefully finishes off. Rachel, she's just kind of making some of those mistakes. Maybe on wave selection, she's not quite able to find the one that's gonna offer her that good pocket. That one also had a lot of froth, a lot of white water on the surface of it, which on a longboard is kind of challenging to negotiate. You really wanna have that smooth section. 
And um, yeah, she's she's got to kind of make some adjustments now. She's still got plenty of time. Well, we'll see what happens next. 16.20 on the clock. Honolulu Bloomfield in the lead. Semi-final heat number two is uh, starting to lean heavily towards the corner of Honolulu Bloomfield. She has just dropped the highest score of the day, an eight-point ride displaying grace, displaying flow, complete control over that massive board. Um, that's why I call her the Terminator because she is almost unstoppable when she gets on a roll. We've seen it. That's why she's a three-time world champion. And uh, it's funny when... You know, you see her in the water, you're going, wow, she must be kind of really aggressive and intense. And then she comes to land and you're like, oh, Hawaiian style. Just, oh, you know, it didn't happen. I don't, it's, a, it's a pretty cool moment. There's uh, Clay Kreiner right there. And uh, that's one of Lua's pup. Uh, Clay, one of the best vert skaters on the planet. Um, check out his Instagram. If you have a minute, you will have your mind blown. So I think we got a power couple in the works. An amazing skater with an amazing surfer and a beautiful dog. They got the life. Shannon. They got the life. They've got little puppy Goober with them. And Honolulu just dropped an eight point ride for that last wave. So before that, I was going to say that Rachel Tilly was the only surfer with an excellent score in the draw. She got a, she got an eight point ride in her round two heat. No one else has been able to match it. There's been a couple of other sevens, but even Honolulu has struggled to find anything in that six point range. Before that score dropped, Rachel was chasing the eight, but now she's got a perfect score of a 10 point ride. 15 minutes on the clock, so she's probably just looking for two fresh scores rather than that single one. And let's see if she can replace something with the scoreboard with this. Great bottom turn to start. Gets those toes over the nose. Fades back to the right. And you see the wave just slowly fading. And all she can do is smile. And that's one element of Rachel Tilly surfing that I am in love with. I love that the minute she stands up, the smile starts. Uh, I feel like that is the right way to do it, especially, you know, on a longboard because you have a little bit more time and more, you know, there's more kind of fluidity in the moments between the maneuvers. So why not smile? You know, it's like the Beach Boy said, right? Catch a wave and you're sitting on top of the world. Of course, you're going to be smiling. Even when you're, you know, needing a perfect 10 to get through a heat, she's still out there having fun, doing it for the love of longboarding. And it, it really is a joy to watch. So I hope we get to see eight, nine, ten more waves from each of these surfers. I mean, we absolutely could. They're on long boards. They can catch waves a little bit easier than a short boarder. And here she goes once again, the three-time world champ. I mean, straight into the uh, the perfect spot right there. You know, if she has the luxury, I feel like, to get a little greedy on the nose there. Why not just get out there hood ornament style, ride the nose for as long as possible. You've got an eight, you've got a six, three. It's time to start putting on a show for the crowd. But Honolulu Bloomfield in complete control of semifinal heat number two. But don't count Rachel Tilly out just yet. We've got 12.40 to go. We're gonna take a quick break and we will be right back.
the Kaka Yama family steeped in history. Oh, on a little second priority, you're going to take a look at this ball right on the inside. Oh, no, it's going to be a lot of No, it's going to be a lot Such quick feet the way she's swinging the board from left to right, right when she gets up on that. I grew up in Huntington Beach, California. Seeing women in the water was pretty rare. And so to be here today and to see so many Groms, it's awesome to just be part of it. So we're down here for WSL Rising Tides and we have the very best of the best of Californian surfing. This is the future of American surfing here on the beach today. It was just so sick that all the pros were like pushing everybody in and giving high fives and it was just amazing. Living in Santa Ana, only surfing on the weekends, moments like this is what inspired me. When I was 10 or 11, like most of these girls, there was like four or five of us. Now there's about 20 to 30 of them I see now. We're really grateful to have a brand like Pura Vida involved because not only do they align with our values and what we believe in, but Pura Vida understands and sees the importance of investing in the next generation. The new generation's coming. <laughs> Rising Tides is where we basically prime the future of surfing for, uh, for women everywhere in the world. So far, all the stops that I've seen on Rising Tides have just provided not only so much joy, of course, when you see the smiles on all the surfers' faces, but uh, it really is a, it's a, a seating system, right? I mean, we've already seen surfers come through the Rising Tides uh, up onto the championship tour, so those events, yes, they're fun, beautiful moments, but also a little bit of a scouting report to the future of female surfing. That's right. It's amazing to see Gabriella Bryan with the success she's found past the midseason cut on the CT, who got her start at Rising Tides just a few years ago. Rachel now with a chance, had that nose ride to start. Just a quick kick in and out, so that's not going to really factor into her score line. Uh, but it's just so cool. I love, I've loved seeing it back on the calendar this year. Obviously, you know, with the pandemic and different things, they weren't able to run Rising Tides last year at the first half of this year. But it's all back in the works, and it's been so fun to be a part of it and to see that inspiration to the next generation. I got my Pura Vida bracelet and my jersey. I gave it to my 10-year-old niece, Adeline, who wasn't able to be there, but is just as stoked as any of the Groms that were on site that week. Very cool. 8.45 to go. This is your women's longboard tour leaderboard way out in front, Honolulu Bloomfield, and she is just going to add to that total. Rachel Tilly now tied for fifth. Uh, we'll see what happens with Rachel regarding her positioning on tour. Meanwhile, out the back, Honolulu back on the nose, has a good section to work with here. Into the white water, a critical turn on such a huge board. She rides out nice and clean. So just adding to a super high heat total right now, Honolulu Bloomfield, she's got a 6.33 and an eight. This might even be better than that 6.33. And she still has eight minutes to go. Honolulu is looking unstoppable. That was such a good wave. I cannot wait to see the replay. And she's just looking so steady. I feel like at this stage, there's still time on the clock for Tilly, but she's got she's about to have a huge ask in front of her. Look at this. Nice quick start. Little pivot set up for that nose ride. Finds that perfectly perched hang five. And then this next section just continues to unravel. But the way she's able to bank it off the foam and continue keeping that momentum and that flow, that's everything the judges want to see with a turn on a longboard. Not trying to whack it, not trying to go in too hard, but just placing it exactly with what the wave is asking. Then she finds another nose ride and gets that straightened out with the extra section here on the finish. That was an extremely impressive wave. It had the size as well, the critical nature to it. Um, so yeah, really, really strong performance. And thinking about the matchups that these two have had in the past, they've really been in that conversation of world titles. Honolulu obviously has three, Rachel has one. Hono's taken the world title out every year that the tour has had multiple events. So that consistency has really come into play. And for her this year, she's already that front runner, runner with 5,000 points to her name. Rachel's not gonna give up. Quick five, hanging off the tip. And she's fading back now, right? Another little hang five there. It's weird water underneath her, so she opts out, needs a 15.43 total because that last wave for Honolulu Bloomfield, a 743. 
It's got to be one of the highest heat totals of this entire event. 15.43 total. And another big heat coming up next featuring two titans of traditional longboarding. Taylor Jensen going up against Kaimana Takayama. Taylor Jensen, multi-time world title holder. And he's going to have his work cut out for him because Kaimana Takayama has been in the flow since day one. That's right. Taylor, he's also trying to find that fourth world title. His father-in-law, Nat Young, has got four. He would like to match that, I think. But having three has been extremely impressive. And I think that's going to be a really exciting semifinal to watch. Um, scores through. Honolua has just put Rachel into a massive combination situation of a 15.53. Once again, it looks like out of the sixth matchup, we could have five going to Honolua and just the one to Rachel from a few years ago. Now, within that, coming into the world title race last year, Rachel Tilly and Honolua Bloomfield were actually tied out of the first event. But Rachel, living in Australia, was unable to travel and compete last year on the world tour because she wanted to keep her job. She wasn't able to travel in and out of Australia with the border closure. So she decided to take that focus there, which may have been one of those things that kind of opened up the door for Honolulu to continue with that run to get her her uh, third world title, especially because two of the waves, right hand points that Rachel really thrives in, Malibu and the Surf Ranch, she wasn't even in the draw for. She's gone down on the outside section and Hono just has the rhythm. Something that we really, we really have come used to seeing. Now back to that conversation around points and the way the tour works. So just give a little bit of a, a, an update to our audience. We do have three events in the world longboard tour this year. The first two events between Manly Beach, which was just a couple months ago, and here at Huntington, they are worth 5,000 points each, but only the top result is gonna count because we're dropping a score heading into Malibu. So for Honolulu Bloomfield, even if she takes the win here, she's not gonna be heading into Malibu with 10,000 points on the line. This event actually doesn't even matter for her because she's the front runner coming into it, same as Harrison Roach. Where for Rachel Tilly, she's already bettered her results heading to Malibu because she had a quarterfinal finish at Manly and she's now improved to a semifinal. So that is gonna keep her sitting in those top three surfers within the world. So you're telling me even on the, the longboard tour, we're going to get a winner in the water. We are going to get a winner in the water, not necessarily the winner of the event. So last year, it was the same thing. We had three events that counted. Honolulu won the world title by winning her quarterfinal heat because of how other surfers fell out within the draw. Alice Lemoyne then went on to win the event and finish runner up in the world. Um, but we are going to be seeing our world champions for longboarding cr crowned at possibly the most classic wave for longboarding in the world at Malibu. I would say so. So with three minutes and 20 seconds to go, it looks like Honolulu Bloomfield is all but locked up her spot in the finals. Rachel Tilly has three minutes to go. She needs a combination of 15.43, which is a, a huge, huge hill to climb. She's had a great run in this event. A semifinal finish is massive for any surfer on any tour. Well, speaking of massive, you know, we're watching some beautiful, calming surfing right now, but around the corner, get ready for it. The outer known Tahiti Pro is coming in hot. August 11th through the 21st. Uh, this is the battle for number, uh, for number one in that spot. You know, you're looking at surfers like Carissa Moore and Felipe Toledo, who may be going, you know, into Tahiti with that yellow jersey, but the top spots are definitely up for grabs. Joanne DeFay, Jack Robinson, they're not far behind. And uh, as we both know, Jack Robinson, Joanne DeFay, highly capable surfers. But of course, Tahiti, Chopo, that is the ultimate equalizer. You know, this is where every surfer on tour will be tested. Very excited. August 11th, put it on your calendar. Make sure that your workload is light that week because you're going to want to give yourself some time in front of the screen. Final stop on the championship tour that will set us up for the Rip Curl WSL finals. It's all going down at the end of the road, the outer known Tahiti Pro, August 11th through the 21st. I got chills just thinking about it. I can't wait to see the women back there. They haven't been in the water since 2006, and we get to see them charging some solid Tahiti Chopu this year. Honolulu Bloomfield on a victory lap. Couple of nose rides there. Nice looking turn. She is just, I think she's fallen once 
in this entire heat. That's the thing about Honolulu, she just doesn't fall, which is pretty much to the detriment of every other woman in the draw. Yeah. Well, I don't know if the Terminator nickname will stick, but it sure does feel like that right now. And now this is setting us up for a really fun final. Kalise Kaleopa'a got through her semifinal against Caitlin Mickelson, so she is on the sand right now, most likely watching Honolulu thinking, oh man, what do I have to do to beat the Terminator? What can she do to beat Honolulu? Oh, it's going to be such a fun matchup. The two Hawaiians hitting the lineup here at Huntington Beach. Now they both made it into the finals of the 2018 Vans Duct Tape Invitational, which at that stage was no had nothing to do with the WSL World Tour. It was just a duct tape event. Honolulu took the win. Kalise Kaleopa'a in second. So those two are finalists there. We're going to see a repeat of that matchup. They also had the world champion Jen Smith and Caitlin Mickelson from that last semifinal were in that final heat for the 2018 Duct Tape Invitational here. But um, I mean, looking at the draw, it, it, it's no surprise to see it, to those two surfers heading into the final and to see a big smile on Rachel Tilly's face knowing that she's not going to get the score she needs to win here because she can't get a 15 point ride, but she's going to have some fun and find some flow anyways. You know, it was subtle, but that little turn she just did, the little bounce off the wild water was so cool looking. It was sick. It probably felt nice. Reason to smile, gets on the nose, and she will make it all the way to the beach. So congratulations, Rachel Tilly. Well served all weekend long. She just had the uh, unfortunate uh, half hour going up against Honolulu Bloomfield, who was absolutely on fire. She's throwing away sixes. She pairs an eight with a seven, four, three. The surfer to beat, your current number one seeded surfer on the planet, Honolulu Bloomfield, is going to match up with Kalis Kaleopa'a in the finals. That's right around the corner. So before we get there, we gotta find out who our men's duct tape invitational finalists will be. Stay tuned, we've got Kaipo Guerrero and Pete Mel coming in on the call. We'll be right back. The Vans U.S. Open of Surfing is brought to you by Vans, off the wall since 66. By Pacifico, official beer of the Vans U.S. Open of Surfing. Live life anchors up. By Shiseido, official sunscreen of the World Surf League. By Foo Wax, official surf wax of the Vans U.S. Open of Surfing. And by Sambazon, bringing you the delicious powers of acai every day. The official acai of the Vans U.S. Open of Surfing. Lining up on the Huntington Beach Pier for the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. The men are in the water. Semi-final number one is already started and we got a show for you today. Matter of fact, we got a show for you all day long. I'm Kaipo. This is Peter Mel. Matt Janoski. Joining us as well, the Waxhead. And you know what, Peter and I are twinning. 
because you look someone, good, Typo. Well, I'm, we're twinning because someone's gonna is gonna be winning today in four different categories: men's longboards, women's longboards, challenger series for men, and challenger series for women. Okay, but how does that have anything to do with us twinning? Because twinning and winning. Oh, rhyme. rhyme. Hey, you're a rapper. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, let's get caught up for the uh, heat in the water. Taylor Jensen versus Kaimana Takiyama, and uh, looks like Taylor. Got off to a strong start, Waxhead. Yeah, look forward to seeing the replay of this one. Uh, he'd been watching that. He would have been seeing those rights that uh, Honolulu connected with at the end of that last heat. And here he is starting off a uh, quick trip to the tip, as Kaipo says. Four steps back into the bowl. Banks it off the whitewash. Um, that's something we haven't seen a whole heap of in this event due to the size of the waves. Uh, but he's toying with this one. Will he get the inside connection? With that 7.83, I would imagine there's going to be a little bit more left on this one. And finishing that wow. in TJ style. Wow. So that's about as good a wave as you could hope for this morning. Taylor Jensen, three-time world longboard champ, two-time US Open champ. Kaimana on the answer back here, gets to the tip. Oh, great, steady performance. <gasps> and out of the blue, falls. Oh. That was that nerves, Pete. I don't know. I mean, from what I understand, I didn't get to talk to Kaimana this morning, but he was feeling very confident about today. Taylor Jensen, again, master of working the board, great footwork, and he combines that wax head with extreme power in his turns. Yeah, I really like that uh, step back uh, sort of setup slash um, kind of gets him back in that power source and. Really delicate feat for a bigger guy, Taylor. And tapping that one off the top again. So an amazing start here for Taylor. The opening five minutes, he's, he's going to be locking in two keeper scores. It's really cool when we look at the family tree of surfing. And three-time world, world longboard champ, Taylor Jensen, married into surfing royalty in a way. Nava, his wife, is Nat Young's daughter. So... Really cool connection there. And of course, Nat Young, the animal, um, multiple world titles going back to the 60s. But in most recent years, Nat Young won the 88, 89, and 90 longboard world titles. Kaimana Takayama, well, he's from some great lineage as well. His uh, grand uncle is Donald Takayama, who set a precedent in surfing as well as board design. So cool. It really is. I mean, you talk about the history and the heritage of not only this surf spot at Huntington Beach, but now the competitors are involved in it. Uh, that's why this duct tape invitational is so classic. And it needs to be part of the longboard tour. It also needs to be part of this fans US Open of surfing uh, at Huntington Beach. I mean, it's just all of that stuff just encompassing uh, such a historical part of surfing. And we always value um, all of our history, uh, especially in surfing. Well, we got some deep roots uh, here, and we're celebrating classic longboarding. Of course, when we go to the criteria for this, style, grace, and flow, and utilization of the entire board, Wax Ed. Yeah, and that's something that we talked about Nat Young before and winning those world titles in the 1980s, and that's what Nat brought back to longboarding. It had a 20-year hiatus from 1966 to the mid-1980s. Uh, longboarding really died away, and it got to a point where surfboard blanks uh, weren't even uh, available mm. to shape longboards. Uh, and that resurgence in the 80s through to now, we're actually seeing um, a single fin uh, resurgence here with guys like Kai Takayama and even uh, Taylor adopting the single fins, but it just works so well in this size, perfect shaped waves. Well, on the women's side of the fans duct tape invitational, we're gonna have an all Hawaiian final because Kalis Kaleopa is gonna be joined by Honolulu Bloomfield in that final. And here is an interview with Honolulu coming out of that semi-final Hon win. You're just telling me how freezing is in the water today. Just walk us through this heat because we saw you surfing yesterday in the scores and you could get an eight today. So what's different for you? Um, I just don't think I could really find my groove yesterday. 
um, was kind of a bummer, but I'm stoked. I was stoked to come down here uh, and see that there was actually waves and like it was glassy as opposed to yesterday. It was like on the shore break and hard. Um, so yeah, I just had fun, you know, that's what it's all about. And I ended up getting some good scores, so I'm pretty stoked. Yeah, and it's impossible for me not to feel the Hawaiian vibe over there in the athlete zone. You guys are such a big one family. How is the heart now to go against Kalis on the final? It's amazing. Honestly, like, she's an amazing surfer, of course, but it's, it will just be fun. Like, I love surfing heats against her because we just go back and forth and, like, I don't know, it's... It will be a good, fun heat. I also know that you have this fierceness inside of you that you just turn it on. Do you think you can put in words what goes inside of you in finals and like what takes you to, you know, to the winning? I guess like maybe just the feeling of winning and how much I love it. <laughs> so I guess that would be it, right? That's it. Yeah. Competition. We'll see you at the finals. Good luck. Thank you. Yeah. Well, there you go. And um, gosh, it, uh, that's going to be a great final coming up, Matt. Um, Honolulu Blo Blo Bloomfield and Kalis Kaleopa. Your thoughts on that final? Uh, you, I, it's it's going to be phenomenal. We've got some really fun lefts out there and some really tasty rights. But Kalis's smooth style and the way that she utilizes her body in that free flowing nature. And, and Honolulu's got an underlying um, power to her where she can change direction. Uh, really quickly so i'm excited to see they're going to bring everything they can to yeah. that final well you know earlier in this heat we we're talking about heritage and the family tree of surfing for more of that i'm going to throw it down to the sand with aj mccord yeah we've talked a lot about the takiyama name and just how deep it goes in the world of surfing of course kai in the water his dad michael right behind me michael the nephew of donald takiyama a very very famous um shaper and surfer in the in the surfing world and when donald passed away he told michael kai's dad make sure that my tools collect us the right way not the wrong way so michael has been shaping boards for friends and family for years but then after nearly 40 years in the flooring contracting business he switched three years ago to full-time building boards and kai is actually riding a board in this heat that michael built for him seven years ago he calls it his magic board michael telling me kai has a a ton of backup boards that are newer but this is the board that he says is just sort of like the old shoe it's very comfortable he feels great on it certainly something he's going to need today taking on taylor jensen looking for a spot in the finals great reporting aj and uh wax you were enamored by that board by that michael takiyama design you were really you were checking it out just the other day yeah it's uh kai's brought that board to noosa to the noosa festival many times and i remember the first time he brought it uh, we're watching the replay. I was commentating that. And we've just perplexed, excuse the pun, the name of the board. It's called the Perplexer. And <laughs> honestly, the way it moves through the water was very unusual. And we're trying to work out why it nose rides so well. And we talk about pocket nose riding critical sections. And getting that nose ride tucked right deep into the pocket is, is, is the goal. But this board travels between flat sections to pockets. Look and at back the tail. Again. You, you can, can actually see it. see it. It's got a little kick tail on it. I mean, if we can get it right there, look at that. Yeah. So they see how foiled out it is and refined. So it allows them to basically steer, stay on the nose from start to finish, uh, which is not the goal of a perfect score, but it's certainly cool when you know your board's capable of something extraordinary like that. And this thing has like full creases, like full stress cracks, yeah. the entire nose of the board. And he, here's a replay of um, a nice So that's the nose pocket. Ride. That's the high pocket nose right. He steps back here and oh, that pearl. wide nose pearls, yeah. And we noticed earlier he actually started off with a great nose ride on his um, third wave. And he basically, the one of the side washes off the pier um, knocked him off. And that's something you might get with a lot of wider boards. Yeah, and, and in regard to the creases there, uh, Peter, I talked to Michael Takiyama about it, and that's the gloss coat. So yeah. he he goes, hey, you know what? Those Don't creases are just they're just superficial. Yeah, they're not really a crease board as we would see with a short board. No, and it's it's because the gloss coat. So you gloss a board, and, and there's different ways to manufacture board, but the very end coat is actually a gloss coat. It's like a clear coat on a car. Yeah, where you can actually sand it out and make it nice and beautiful. You use in like really fine sandpaper to get it all glossed and beautiful, and that's that shiny coat. Yes, you're right. That little layer of resin gets little cracks on it sometimes. 
sometimes. It, it did flex, right? So to just crack that part of it and not actual, the, you know, the fiberglass, which is uh, something that holds it completely together. And an in interesting point, it was actually our uh, surfer in the next heat, Connie Ellis Stewart, that did the creases. Oh. <laughs> Uh, Oops. Thanks, thanks, Connie. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, but that board's been around a lot, and Kai's had a lot of victories on it. But uh, heating up now, Taylor with a 7.83 and a 6.17. So Kai's needing combination scores to get through. And um, Kai, as you said, Pete, he's so motivated. He's he, he The way he's talking is he, he wants a world title this year. And he wants to get to Malibu, so he wants to prove a point. You know, he's not in the contest. He's here as a uh, replacement. Misstep there for Kai Takayama. Just uh, went up to walk to the nose and missed a step. So I hope that the nerves are not falling on the shoulders of Kai Takayama here. What went wrong here? Well, um, as you can see, he's got a, a big gap there on the nose, like the last foot. It's a texture deck. So he steps up, adjusts it, goes to the nose, and he fully just overstepped it, oh, which yeah, we don't was, see very often. Yeah, he wanted, he wanted that five. He wanted to heal fives right there to uh, get there. So, uh, again, just pushing it a bit, you know, and I think that that's something that Kaimana knows, obviously, and that's what Taylor Jensen competitively, by getting that 7-8-3 out of the gates for the, you know, all of a sudden it applied a ton of pressure to Kai. Now he needs to feel like he needs to do something a little bit different, um, and that's something, I mean, he's, Kai's young, right? I, it's something that he's going to be learning in this process. Taylor, a lot more experienced in these situations, obviously applying pressure very very early, looking very relaxed. Uh, so yeah, Taylor, you know, not a gigantic lead, although um, 14 points is a really great two wave total. There's still opportunity here for Kai. So here we go, utilizing priority. Taylor Jensen gets to the nose, hangs five through that section, another five. Some great footwork, and now it's turn time for Taylor Jensen, carving turn on the outside, little mid transitionary section in the wave glides effortlessly through barrel Beautiful cut yeah. down oh. and back to the nose for taylor jensen yeah. <laughs> and a nice big off the top for a finish so taylor jensen so far in this matchup has been dominant and uh peter likes a barrel and well, you know, he sees it he's just gonna scream it out yeah i know i get caught up in the moment sorry <laughs> it's, I, it's one good. of those things dude i, I can't help myself uh, apologize um but yeah i get excited yeah I mean, especially a barrel at Huntington. Not that often you see it, right? I mean, that was a great opportunity for Kai. It would have been a point of difference. Oh, I mean, look at this. You. Saw it there. Look at it. It's actually a true barrel. I mean, he was under, in, deep. Yeah. Did he point at the, at the beach before that barrel? That was pretty <laughs> styly. Speaking of styly, check this out, Matt. You know what I love about his footwork, Matt, is that he literally takes these big steps on his boards, but it doesn't look like it. You know, like there's these surfers that will delicately kind of move their feet up, but he takes these gliding big steps, and it doesn't look like he's even, uh, you know, moving. Uh, he's surfing so well right now, and um, I did say in an earlier heat that uh, he was CJ Nelson's pick, even though he wasn't, uh, you know, capitalizing on those massive uh, excellent range scores, but he was warming to the occasion, and, and that, that is phenomenal surfing. Oh. Taylor, Taylor has won here. He won in 2003 and 2008 as well, and in an interview on my Instagram Live, actually, he did say he knows this wave really well. There's a bit of Oso uh, Oceanside pride here, too. These guys are familiar with this type of pier surfing and they're kind of dueling it out the young and the old they sure are well so far big advantage to taylor jensen he just dropped a flat seven seven point ride 7.83 that puts kaimana takiyama into a combination situation where he needs two rides of a 14.83 or better he wants to break the combo right now gets to the nose and steering from the nose like you were talking about matt Beautifully done. That's going to be a point of difference for Kai Takayama on the outside. Let's see if he can make the connection to the inside. And he does it gliding, uh, head on the swivel, fading back and forth, a lot of redirecting, great footwork, and a nice finish. So best wave so far for Kai Takayama. That'll settle the nerves in a big way for Kaimana. Um, you know, in relation to what we've already seen, there was that point in difference. Steering from the nose, not easy to do. And I think that that design, like you said, off the tail is allowing that. It actually pulls the board and keeps the board. The, the water will run up the back of that tail and hold the nose down. And then he's able to really kind of start to work the, from the very tip of the board, which is unique. And it's got that, uh, like, almost double concave out through the tail as well. So here he is, bends, twists the foot, the back foot readjusts. Very technical. And you can see the texture deck in that last foot on the nose. Um, which is also a very unique uh, adaption here to the design. You can sort of see where the wax stops there. And right where that nose flips up, 
there we go. So lost a little bit of control there, and that one was just a, a bank off the top, uh, just to make sure he finishes cleanly. So his best way of yet to be locked in, but it's a flat five. Wow, flat five for Kaimano. So he's uh, broke the, well, the good news is, he's broken the combination. He just needs one wave score to take the lead. Kind of the bad news is, it's nearly a perfect requirement. He needs a 9.83. I think some of that momentum, he was going left, going right, and there was a lot of setup work. But Taylor's surfing's been very engaged. He's looked like his maneuvers are very purposeful. You know, the waves allowed him to perform what he's been performing in the right place of the wave, very critical. I want to make a quick reference to Kai's wave before he slipped right off the nose. In one of the old Bruce Brown films, Nat Young surfing in Western Australia, and. Uh, he said he's 16-year-old Nat Young, and he walks up the nose and he goes five right over the top. Um, and Bruce Brown mentioned something about Nat, and Nat being the uh, father-in-law of Taylor. It's just quite ironic that we have the exact... <laughs> it just reminded me, you know, the five right over, and he tips straight over the top. Um, just those little tiny things, and obviously Nat ha has really giant feet, and I'm assuming it's the same with, uh, with Taylor as well. But uh, those little things are what longboarding's about. Storytelling, you know, culture, and... It's just a shame it dropped right off for that 20 years. Some of the names that have won at this event, like Corky Carroll, David Nueva, um, LJ Richards, and then, yeah, all the way up to, you know, we've had people winning five, six, seven US Opens. Justin Quintal's taken four duct tapes here. Um, Taylor's won the two. Josh Baxter. Um, yeah, phenomenal. Yeah, a lot of history here. I mean, we're making history today. Kaimana Takeyama needs an excellent score to make his way into the final. Let's see if he can do that. That'll be on the other side of this break. We are with Wild Coast and Shiseido and Debbie Sal here doing a beach cleanup. We're just picking up trash up from HB and collecting as much trash as we can. At Wild Coast, we are all about saving our wild coast and oceans, and we have partnered with WSL to help clean up the beach and save our oceans worldwide. To have them kind of come into the surfing world and also want to make a difference in terms of keeping our oceans and beaches clean and to be able to collaborate with such a big brand on that level has been really, really cool for me to be a part of. What she said is doing is so amazing and I feel so proud to be a part of it. It's our way of giving back to the ocean. Uh, not only surfers, but the whole world, we all need the ocean. You know, we're not only spreading the message, but also physically doing it. This is where the big change happens. It's when multinational companies are coming together to do this type of work at this level on the ground and building a community around it. You bet we are one ocean. Tag WSL, WSL Pure, hashtag we are one ocean. Show us what you're doing to clean up the beach. Getting back to your action here with Kaimana Takeyama. Trying to mount a comeback. Yeah, that was a nice uh, tight five there. Um, obviously not getting the 10. So if you see a, a slow-mo of that or a replay, um, there's a difference between something that looks like a hang 10 and an actual hang 10. 
But Kai actually just like moved his feet close together, which is a, a form of actually momentum and projection. Uh, it's something that a lot of us do just to keep flying down the line. Um, it's you know, nose riding can be really functional as well as a, a trick, but in that case, it was a functional uh, adjustment for Kai, although the judges, you know, won't deem that overly technical. Yeah, they kind of weren't buying it. 3.27, so Kai Mana still needs an excellent score of a 9.83. One more time on the replay, Pete. Well, again, you touched on it, like a 10 is is actually getting both toe, both feet all the way up over and actually having the 10 toes over the top, and that's a true hang 10. Um, very difficult to do, especially if you hold it for a long period of time. Today's beach breaks, you're not going to get uh, that opportunity. So if you can do it and do it for a period of time that longer than uh, your competitor, you're going to get rewarded for that. I mean, I think that that's why you see longboarding uh, happen at such great breaks like San No Free, uh, Malibu, um, up in Santa Cruz, all of our, our waves that we have up there because the fact is you got these long, beautiful rights so you can just trim the nose for a very long time. Speaking of Malibu, that is where we're going to crown a world champion. That's going to go down October 3rd through the 13th is the waiting period. That's the third and final stop of the World Longboard Tour. The Cuervo Classic Longboard Championships going down on the Classic right point break that people have been sliding for decades, Matt. Yeah, we talk about timeless waves, talk about events that mean a lot to surf culture. You know, Bells Beach, we talk about Sunset, Pipeline. I mean, Malibu for longboarding is, it's where hot dogging began for those that are not, you know, laugh at that word, hot dogging. But that that is the, the fun and frivolous nature of surfing. It's performing maneuvers in the pocket that's having fun. And actually, it's, it's the first place where surfing became uh, where maneuvers were actually performed in surfing in and around that pocket. You know, that, that Malibu style of surfing is why in Australia, longboards are referred to as Malibus because what they saw in those early films were, was all Malibu and in the early uh, photos, Malibu style surfing. And there's not a lot of events in Malibu either. So that's one thing that's kind of special is the fact that you can actually surf there with uh, just a few surfers, other surfers in the water. Well, heat recap, it's been all Taylor Jensen so far in this semi-final number one. Taylor powering as well as utilizing beautiful footwork. Taylor Jensen gliding effortlessly, making the difficult look easy. Uh, and he just, you, you can see he's utilizing the entire wave. Even through that midsection, he's gliding, carving, uh, you know, moving his feet around to keep the momentum going with this board. You know, it's not easy to keep that nice flow. And he's just great at being able to read that and keep the trim of that nice long nine foot board. Or you probably nine six, you think? Nine six. Like nine six, yeah, that would be the, the, the length that Taylor Jensen being that he's a little bit bigger. But man, what a, a heat for him. Just very, very easy right now, being that he got that first wave of 7.83. Kai paddling into this one. Here we go. Trip to the nose. There's a 10. Back wow. to the 10. Stylish cutback. He's hanging with the white water. Smooth footwork with the cross step. Cross steps back. Lining up for the inside shore break. Waves are steeping up again planing in the middle of the board here we go another trip to the tip touches the nose hangs through and oh, oh no on his a, way you know, he was on his way to a number that was um you know again we hadn't seen uh, a full true 10 yet in this heat that was there uh, man and if he just completed that ride we would have been uh, going hey he's right in this one would have improved i mean he probably still will improve on the five but I mean, we would have seen a, a score that would have matched taylor jensen yeah, so up high in the wave, 10, readjust, 10 again through the whitewash, super technical. See that sort of like a, a slashing direction change um, just to get him back into the power source, but it's with those wide tails, you can't really smoothly transition. It's got to be a pretty exaggerated turn like that. Well, he has a ton of rocker in that, t in that tail too. So it's, it is, once it gets onto that curve, it wants to follow the curve of that exactly. tail. And the big pin, the, so you've got these big square tail and you're sort of like uh, surfing from point to point and he's just laying that over. But uh, Kai, yeah, that was a 5.57. A five, five, so I think that one would have been well on the way to a, you know, maybe a mid six or something. Yeah, no, I think it would have been at least, you know, yeah, probably upwards, uh, you know, close to the seven. Another point for sure if he had just uh, completed that final move. Connie Alice Stewart readying himself for semifinal number two where he's going to face off against Justin Quintal. That's going to be a um, great match between the two. Big opportunity for the young Hawaiian, but he's coming against a master out here at the south side of Huntington Pier. Quinny, Justin Quintal, four-time 
duct tape champ. Very used to those beach breaks and uh, being able to surf those kind of shorter, smaller waves being uh, from the East Coast. He's just uh, very comfortable in uh, those types of waves. Yeah, former world champ. Well, this guy, he's a three-time world champ. And let's dig into some deep stats. Powered by Hydroflask for Taylor Jensen. Three world titles, career event wins 19. And look at that heat winning percentage, Matt, 77%. I account for probably 1% of that, uh, <laughs> of, of that, uh, well, I have beaten him, but I've been lost a lot more times than, I, than we've surfed against each you other. You took some but, numbers um, off him. I did, yeah. But, um, uh, yeah. But one thing I wanted to note with Taylor is his ability to surf a wide variety of waves. You know, he's surfing a pintail 9.6 out there, which is pretty much, that's the only pintail in the whole event. Maybe Ra Rachel Tilly had one as well in the female draw, but uh, he, he's just, so professional and the way he's adapted through the criteria of the last five years uh he's surfing so doing some of his best surfing right now and that's a testament to uh how engaged he is in longboarding well 90 seconds left and um the requirement for kai takayama has been reduced just slightly a 9.26 is what takayama needs um a nervous time as well as the fact that Kai is under the priority of Taylor Jensen. Now, Taylor's looking the other way. He doesn't look like he's interested in covering Kai no, at no all. No defense for him, defense. Huh? No defense. And I think that the substantial lead is helpful for <laughs> allowing himself to give him, you know, uh, Kaimana the, the room. Uh, but also the fact that with priority, he feels like that that zone that he is sitting in, I mean, the reason why Kaimana has moved away is to, because to, he doesn't have priority, is to fight, be able to find that kind of maybe a lucky wave off to the side in this last minute, not giving up. But Taylor holding position in the, what he believes to be the most consistent region of the beach. Well, holding court, Taylor Jensen and Kaimana, you can see he's just slide underneath him just to give himself any kind of chance. Not a lot of waves on the horizon right now, so the clouds are looking dark for Kai Takayama. But hey, a third place finish out here, equal third. That's a decent result. Most likely get him a, a, a chance in Malibu. Yep, yep. Absolutely, and uh, yeah, Kai uh, didn't get a run in Manly, and um, you know, semi-final finish is Keeper. super encouraging for him. If yeah, it gets a run in Malibu, and and Taylor bettering his his performance there in Sydney as well. Oh, it didn't compete in Sydney. Taylor Jensen on to the finals, and we are going to be on to a quick commercial break, but we'll be right back with semi-final number two of the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. In the water, semi-final number two at the Vans Duct Tape Invitational and on the pier, onlookers enjoying the day, finals day here, and Taylor Jensen earned his way into the final. Who's he gonna match up against? 
Well, it's going to be the winner of this semifinal number two. This is Matt Shinovsky, also known as the Waxhead. This is my good friend, Peter Mel. And we're such good friends, we called this morning saying, what are you wearing today, Pete? And he's all, oh, I'm going to wear the black black and pink uh, hummingbird shirt. I'm like, dude, I want to wear it too. And uh, so... But we got different shoes. Yeah, different shoes. Same Let's pants. Go. Same pants too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, right. we did the. I, mean, I was. That's... Yeah. We're just like, hey, Pete, you look cute, and he's all, you look cute too, and said, okay, let's go. Let's have a great Are you finals. Are gonna pull day. the chain out at all at some point? Yeah. So, yeah that comes out for the finals. Okay. All right. Here we go. Justin Quintal, a four-time Vans Duct Tape champion, is out in the water. He's also the 2019 World Longboard Champion. He's up against. Kaniala Stewart coming from the south shore of Oahu, a young, exciting surfer with tons of style. I uh, love this matchup. Coming from a semifinal finish in uh, in Manly, Kaniala was, uh, you know, arguably surfing, um, you know, very well. Was looking like he was going to take out the contest, and it was an yeah. upset for him to be knocked out there. Uh, so he's he wants to go one better, and that extra uh, 1,100 points is going to help him at Malibu. But uh, Justin not competing at uh, Manly, it's, this is an important result. So Carney, middle of the board, that's a really nice wave for Carney, a bigger, a bigger set wave. And he's just feeling his feet rolling around on this wave. He's going to see if he can link the inside. I love the style of Carney Alas Stewart. It's a, just a classic style. Quick feet, look at the footwork that he's able to, to get. Using the board up and down and a nice finish. Look at that's a great start for Kaniala Stewart, Peter. It is so true, Kaipo. Again, just utilized the entire wave, had the outside maneuvers done, made sure he got the inside maneuvers done, especially when he had his foot kind of lift off his board, but able to get it back planted. Nice work there by Kaniala. Yeah, we have a look. One of the biggest improvements in Kaniala surfing uh, has been his footwork in between transitions. See that utilizing that middle, stepping back into that carve. That's something we wouldn't have seen a few years ago. Um, and there he is just setting this up. You can see that uh, little cross step to maintain momentum through the trim spot in the middle of the board, stepping back. And this wave's dead. You're Huntington hopping on a short board, and he gets two little quick fives and finishes. Now, very crucial he finished, and see how he rides out of that with momentum and speed and is able to get the, uh, the pull off there. And that's, that's something that a lot of the surfers were being penalized for yesterday, uh, not being able to ride ahead of that whitewash with control. Beautiful start for Carniala, 7.33 locks in, Pete. That's a great pressure builder straight on Justin Kutal, so it has to answer here. Justin's been very, very consistent in Huntington Beach, been very difficult to beat. So this is going to be something that we haven't seen yet because Justin's been getting those quicker starts throughout most of his heats. He's been applying the pressure, so now he's going to have to answer. And uh, Kanyala, this is exactly what he needed to do against Justin, is to see what, you know, because all of a sudden now it's going to be able to see, there's a little difference in, in, your, in your psyche when you're already starting behind. Not to mention we had that Norwest wind swell really bluster up yesterday afternoon, almost killing what little south swell from Frank that we had left. So those big drawn out lefts aren't there this morning. It's more peaky, and we're probably not going to see that dramatic uh, peer shooting uh, action that Justin's been getting those excellent scores on. So, I mean, Taylor did capitalize on some great lefts, but it's not, you can see there, you can sort of see that, that swell coming from the right of the screen over to the left. Yep. Uh, it's a different lineup. Yep. It's clean, it's smooth, it's no texture, but it's peaky. One more time on this 7.33. Check it out, Peter. Yeah, again, just that quick tip. You know, this angle almost took away from the fact that he did get his five off there. We had that other angle where we looked on it, and we could see that it did definitely get there. We mentioned that midsection where he was able to cross step and still move the board in the right moment to be able to follow the energy of this uh, wave through the inside. He did it so well, especially here. That moment when his foot lifted off his board, you're like, oh, no, and I uh, was able to control it and pull it back down. 7-3-3, three, three, way to go. I mean, there was a couple seven fives from the judges, a couple sevens, and then a, an actual eight. What, judge one had it as an eight. We have Justin having a look here. He's, uh, he did surf before the event because um, it is a different lineup. So I would imagine most of his, and I've been here for some of those victories, it has been on those um, typical South Swell days running into the pier. But Justin's from Florida. He's surfed all around the world, super experienced in a variety of beach break conditions. So uh, he's going to be ready to go, and he knows exactly what he needs to do. Let's hear from Taylor Jensen, because he's in the finals. DJ, 
Jay, I was talking to you earlier today and Kai, and you were so relaxed, and I could tell that he was really nervous. So I'm wondering, how do you think this emotional state carry you through these heats? Is it just like a veteran skill? Yeah, I mean, look, I'm used to it. I've been doing this for a long time, and it's just kind of a comfort thing. Once I made the semis, I knew I'm giving myself a good chance going into Malibu that if you win, you pretty much win the world title. So, you know, the comfort level went up and just got relaxed. And, yeah, I mean, I'm just having fun. And talking about comfort level, you have your entire family here. Your wife is an amazing surfer. She's, you know, surrounded by amazing surfers, too. Do you think that vibe also elevates her surfing? Absolutely. I mean, having a support crew like my wife and my kids here just keeps me happy and, and you know, the energy light and fun. And I'm just enjoying my time here in Huntington and, and being around all my friends and getting to surf pretty fun waves out front in the contest. Is that the fun, the, the, like the main strategy for the finals now? Yeah, I think so. I mean, if you're having fun, you're generally surfing pretty good. And <laughs> if you get too serious, things get tense. So I'm just enjoying my time and yeah, just trying to get good waves and, and make them work. One more, here you go. One finals, more. congrats. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, well, congratulations to Taylor Jensen. He's occupying the first spot in our finals. We're gonna have a final today. We're gonna crown some champs, Pete. Sounds light, right? I mean, obviously he had mentioned about uh, the family and kids here that keeps him, uh, you know, you, you, your dad first, right? Mm -hmm. um, always, always, right? Yeah, yeah. so uh, <laughs> that part is just kind of keeps it normal, you know, even though this is a um, very critical and uh, important event, especially since he wasn't in Manly to, to make sure that he able to uh, get a, a solid result because if he wants another world title, a win here is a, a great way to start because then however high he finishes in that uh, Malibu event, which I'm assuming he would be here for as we watch this replay. So sort of like a, a grubbly wave by today's standards, but a nice backup there, a 4.5 for Carney. He's trying to build that pressure on Justin, who now needs a combination to jump back out and well to jump into the lead he needs to open up his scoring nearly nearly 10 minutes gone and he hasn't had a wave to look at really liked what uh Kanyala did as he moved away a little bit and that set wave that came to him was uh, a place that wasn't where justin was and I, I feel like you know we saw taylor jensen win kind of in that region that justin's at right the pier bowl uh, but no waves have come there. So I like what Justin's doing. He's being patient because he's going to need a set wave to answer to Kaniala Stewart's wave because that was a definite, you know, one of the bigger waves we've seen this morning. Well, this wouldn't really be in, in Justin's plan for this heat, I would imagine, to be sitting in. Uh, I mean, now he ha he's committed to waiting, but just to have be in a combination right now. I mean, every other heat that we've seen him in this competition, he's had that quick start. He's yeah. put the pressure on his on his the other competitors and uh, put him in the corner. But this time he's going to have to s change gears and change strategy, Matt. Yeah, he's absolutely no slouch on a right hand wave either. But if you were to look at all the events on the schedule, you'd say, you know, Manly would have been fantastic for him with those long stretching lefts of that Norrie swell, uh, which is uh, what you hope for when you go to Manly, uh, but you often don't get. Huntington, uh, this is this would be it. If you compare this and Malibu, this is where these 5,000 points would should be Justin's if he was to look at it in a favoured event. Malibu, well, that opens up. You've got Declan in the semi-final finish in Manly. You have Carniella, you have Taylor, and you have Ben Skinner, and you've got all of these names that have got that, that you know, 3,900 points. But, and Harrison, of course, with that 5,000, Justin's not going to fancy himself against those five guys on a right-hand point break to take the win over them, obviously. Oh, 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 Stewart camping out on the nose with that 10. Oh, he threw a tent, campfire, <laughs> had some coffee. <laughs> he was on the nose so long he had to pay rent, I bet. You know what I mean? He just, <laughs> here oh, we go. No connection, oh, though. Didn't make the connection on the inside, but what a beautiful start for Kaniala Stewart, Matt. Yeah, I think uh, I'm going to do another Bruce Brown reference there. He's up there long enough to make himself a ham sandwich. Lance Carson <laughs> at Malibu. Um, you know, tying in the Malibu reference, I mean, wow, Carney Eller at Malibu is going to be a sight to be seen, but his intentions are known here. He hasn't let a single wave that's broken go. He's just turned and surfed. He's not being fussy. He just wanted to feel confident. And yeah, 18 minutes, 40 left on the clock, and he's stoked. You'd be really happy right now, I think. Well, there is the rumors of uh, the chilly water. Um, and uh, just uh, I had to scan through a lot of the, the near shore buoys. And there's a significant difference in between just buoys that are just, uh, you know, a couple 50 miles apart. Like uh, Long Beach buoy is at 60 degrees. And uh, the buoy just down south of us is 66 degrees. So there's a five degree difference. Yeah, cold water. Um, but you know what? Let's get 
a word from Kaimana Takayama. He came here to the Vans Duct Tape Invitational, and he's walking away with an equal third. He's with AJ. Yeah, so there's a lot to talk about here, Kai. I know you wanted to get one more surf in today, yeah, <laughs> but what did you learn going against Taylor Jensen in the semifinal? Yeah, I've been surfing against Taylor for a really long time. Well, we've only surfed against each other a few times, but I've looked up to him for a long time, and it was fun sharing the water with him. Uh, I was kind of banking on that left into the pier being there, and maybe I had a couple good ones, but I just, I think I maybe put a little too much pressure on myself, but I didn't feel like me out there, but I really had fun. Uh, what I learned, just got to sit, wait for the better waves. He got me from the rip, you know, but props to him. Good man, go win the thing, you know. Still a fantastic result for you. How proud of how far you got in this competition? You know, I, I think my surfing is validated. I, I want that shot at Malibu, you know, to whoever may concern. I mean, I could have done better out there today, but my run was yesterday. I, I'm really proud of my, what, equal third, third result. Yeah. So I'm stoked. You know, I came here with nothing, and now I kind of got something, so. I'm, I'm, I'm actually really excited. You know, just it means a lot to me to be here and play so well at the U.S. Open. You know. Well, we have to have a moment for your board because everybody has been in love with this thing. I know it's something that you and your dad worked on together. It's one of your, it's your magic board. So yeah, tell me about 100%. it. So actually, um, so back in the day, the story of this board is, I, so David Argonda had his model. You know, it was, we call it the Annihilator model today. Would rather been on that out there because like wide point four, blah, blah, blah. But I told my dad, you know, so for all these years, I was trying to remake uh, a board that he made for me and I just, we couldn't get it right. It's, it's one of, it's like me, like a me problem. You know what I mean? It's like, I told them to just go crazy. He has all these ideas, go crazy. I'll ride the thing. And he came up with this, you know, the tail was based off of like the back wings of like a Harrier jet and uh, just, a lot of ideas went into how to make a board lift so you could properly lock into some real long hang tens and you know I'm a this is my favorite board I've been riding the same thing for five years you can go back in my Instagram I rode this thing in overhead Taiwan surfed it at you know Noosa Malibu um, just everywhere this is my favorite board I got <laughs> there's some D-Lam I cut out of it I'm just trying to keep it alive you know I got a big patch right here and Connie who's actually in the heat right now I let him borrow it at Oceanside one day he put all these stress cracks in it but I'm not mad it builds character you know this is our spear logo no no names no gimmicks but on the tip up here um, I like to put it's kind of like a slip check but it's really just fiberglass no hot coat gets that it's like a skateboard grip, you know, because wax can get sticky. So when you're doing big turns, it's nice to have some sticky wax on the tail. Stay, you know, planted where you are and be able to wrap a cut back. But nose riding, you're making so many little micro adjustments and things. Um, it's kind of like a skateboard in a sense, you know, you're shuffling your feet, getting, you know, setting up for like a kickflip or something. And I'm always moving my feet on the nose. So this is easy to stay gripped to the board, but I can kind of get around a little bit. But design wise, you know, narrower nose, a little more hip and then that's a lot of a lot of tail kick you know ah. pretty foiled but i love this thing man it's the best board i'm I'm, I want to take it to Malibu. <laughs> I was just going to say, I'm sure we have not seen the last of you yeah. or your beautiful board in WSL longboarding. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it, you guys. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you, AJ and Kaiman. I love the stories of the board. Hey, sometimes a board, you get that magic board, Peter, and that's oh, your yeah. best friend. Oh, yeah. No, I've got them. They're still all in my rafters, each one of them. I bust them out occasionally, um, especially for special events. You know, that's one thing that you can do. You feel comfortable. You know it works. Uh, you know, and we all touch on, uh, I think every surfer has a magic board. Yeah, I, I keep mine in board bags and will not. Out of the sun. Yeah, out of the sun. Yeah. Just pull them out every once in a while and get some good memories on them. Yep. Um, and that Nothing was cool. wrong with that. Yeah, that was cool. You talked about that texture deck in the front. You know, as a board builder, uh, you can get those texture decks. That's when you do the sand coat, but you actually don't sand the board you know yeah well you, you can do it up with a couple different ways to do that texture deck um it's looked like to me that he's basically got that oh look at that tip of ride so if we talk about uh, kai talks about lifts with his board um what we saw with there with justin is he had his board so far in the pocket the tail weighted down and he was levitating and you have two different types of nose riding so watch he comes from behind the section hasn't broken yet he's at the top of the wave gets it now that probably is a 10 his back foot is over the rail 
and he's tucked in tight. So that's a super functional hang 10 for a tight wave like that. If you'd have both toes over the front, he would have outrun the section. There was no wall ahead of him there. Uh, but that's the judges obviously. Uh, so it's almost a, pa a way to pace yourself, right? Like and not overcook it and get too much speed. And hold your line in tight and really like, because what, what's happening when you're leaning in, you're, you're lifting, you, you can lift that chest and, and soul arch, which is, we'll just watch Carney on this one and continue in a moment. So this is might have been a defensive move there for Carney uh, with Justin dropping that 5.93. Sorry, seeing that left going, okay, I need to keep him off this one. I will say that it feels like backhand to be able to get that lift on the nose is way more challenging. Um, I mean, that's in Cunningham, like in that moment, uh, you know, you could see he wasn't able to get to the nose and the heel edge. It's almost like you outrun stuff uh, pretty, pretty quickly. And you're not able to kind of control that speed as easily as you can on your forehand. Exactly right. And we saw Kai in that previous heat actually take off on the left, do that really cool adjustment with the feet. And then as the board kind of like straightened out a little bit, hit a chop and it sort of bounced him. We're on the forehand, you can tuck in tight, get that back foot moving, and you can adjust and steer, as we saw Harrison Roach do in the bowl. We saw Tosh Tudor do it a lot as well, um, really utilizing that technical nose. So interesting, Kai said wide point back, the other model's wide point forward. The two differences there is you have probably more steering. You do have more steering on a wide point back board, but you lack that... Um, that the lift table going forward the <laughs> yeah. table yeah so, so you can be up there and uh, you can actually uh, park it <laughs> that's why they've got that crazy uh nose flip and the tail flip to counteract that and it's, it's a spaceship surfboard but it's doing wonders for car surfing and i must say a lot of people have tried to emulate that in a few years and they haven't achieved anything remotely like what michael creates under the priority of justin quintal is connie Alice stewart taking off on this one the current heat leader takes a trip to a nice hang five through that section great cross stepping and footwork a nice pivot turn there for Kaniala Kani on the inside looking to make the connection does so multiple steps in the wave and has to just pearl that one as he got behind the wave Justin Quintal has been searching the left finds it Whoa. finds a five to ten levitating there and a big turn as he nears the piling here at Huntington Beach. Needs a connection. Mm -hmm. Quintal looking for the get connection it. and does not get it. Yeah, it's unfortunate. It seems like that pier ball, uh, very challenging. You know, once you get into that deeper water, that's all the, the current that was moving the other day with all that extra swell has created a, a much deeper hole in that zone. So, I mean, the cutback actually needs to be pretty much another 50-yard cutback to go back all the way the other direction in order to really uh, get that inside connection because, uh, you know, at this point with that 7-3-3, you got to match it and you got to get that inside. There's no section coming at the surfer on the lefts at the moment. Where in the last few days, we've seen that wall continuing. You've seen two solid uh, maneuvers on longboards and the shortboards. At the moment, it's just petering out into that typical hey. deep water. <laughs> <laughs> as, we, as we mull that over and we wait for a couple of scores to come in, we're going to take a break, but we'll be back with the conclusion of semifinal number two. Can Justin Quintal make a comeback? Yeah. 
Bands Duct Tape Invitational here in Huntington Beach. It's finals day. It's been nine days of competition, fun, and much, much more. The world's largest action sports festival where we have a lot of stuff going on. The retail store just opened up. We also have the street market workshops, the Van Doren Village Duct Tape Festival where you can try some hand shaped boards shaped by some of the superstars of surfing and skateboarding, shaping and glassing down right here on the beach. And of course, the skate finals this afternoon, 2 p.m. to 5 p.m., the Vans Showdown Skate Finals. Lots going on. Right, right when we end, basically, we go right over to the bowl over there and uh, get to do the showdown. That's going to be exciting. I know that the prelims were amazing yesterday. From what I understand, some of the best skating the folks have ever seen here on the beach at Huntington. Uh, I can't wait for those skate finals. Yeah, I heard uh, Grant Taylor so far has been a standout um, in some of those qualification runs. And uh, but we have so many talented skaters. And we got a whole new generation actually coming up, and it is absolutely amazing the board control you'll see there um, over at the Van Skate Park. I don't, I don't get how it happens at like 14 years old. You know, that's the whole thing I'm tripping out on. Is that like you, you watch the kids and what they're doing at that age. Um, it, it's truly amazing. So, I mean, uh, what's going to happen in five years? <laughs> Progression. Yes, obviously. We only progress <laughs> forward, not backwards. But, yeah, a lot of skate parks. Kids getting started so young. And, um, yeah, that's why we see so much progression. But right now we're seeing, in a way, the pro progression of traditional longboarding, Matt, where it's traditional longboarding, but the performances are progressing, are progressing in this field. Here we go, Jay Quintal. Absolutely. So uh, tight five, quick touch 10 for Justin. Now this one, he really needed the connection here, but it was very critical nose right on the outside with that walled up left. A 6-2-3 was Justin's score on that one. If he could just get something more, I'm assuming that 6-6-1 six, six, would have been long gone. Uh, that was probably one of the most dynamic starts we've seen in this heat. Uh, super critical, but that left, as we said, just tapering out towards the pit. Yeah, didn't get that reward of the shore break to try to elevate that score. So Justin Quintal still seeking a 6.61 to turn the heat. Five minutes and 40 seconds on the countdown. Well, let's see if he makes an adjustment on that, you know, and uh, gets that, that turn done earlier and then really tries to, you know, push his way back to the south because that's where he can be able to get that connection, I think. Showing interest in this one, but... Oh, a waste of priority right there. That was a bummer. Yeah, priority air to Justin Quintal. Now priority switches over to Kaniala Stewart, our heat leader. And Kaniala aware of the situation and knows that he has an advantage. He control. Quintal, though, sneaks over to a left, gets to the nose, gets oh, some heels, heels. And some great footwork to walk it back to the tail. And a little switch stance as well here we go he's got a plane 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 in the middle of the board to get through this no. and into the shore but he's not going to do it Kaniala right behind him with some beautiful footwork and nose riding connie banks that section on the backhand is going to have to hang on through some turbulent water and does so Ooh. now kicking out realizing um yeah maybe he's he going for, some, for priority yeah no that's straight up defensive move there and uh that's just competing right there it's with four and a half minutes understanding that priority is a very critical moment to have in the back half of the heat and he's going to get it yeah that was one of the first set of uh that's a proper set of hang heels that we haven't really seen much of this event uh mostly because of the unruly nature and the chop in the waves uh, you can do it in fact on a bigger wave it's easier there's more area to do it but with that pier looming on those lefts the right's almost impossible to do it in the last few days but will we see more of that in the final and the uh and the female and the women's final, I think so. Well, I mean, he didn't get the inside connection, but man, watch this. I mean, now he snuck away to get this one to the tip. There it is, heels, and he held it for a bit too, which is pretty cool. Um, I, I, you know, this is something we haven't seen. The judges haven't seen, and you wonder what um, the judges will score it. And Connie Alla gets a good ride on his own, but smart right here, competing right. Finishes off, sees where Quinny is, kicks out and goes, hey, I'm going to take Almost it. Almost. Typo. Just shy. A 6.43 yeah, for Justin the, Quintal. Not six, enough. 6.61, right? He needed the 6.61, and it's just two tenths shy. One judge actually gave it to him. 
the average out a little bit shy and uh, that was huge in Kaniala by understanding exactly. that and, and getting himself priority position with the last three minutes. Matt, Kaniala actually played that with the presumption that Quinney got the score and that's why he wanted to get that priority because he knows how valuable that is in the final three minutes. Absolutely, but also a smart decision uh, letting Justin go on that first wave because Kani's was actually better. Mm. Uh, if Justin had that wave, performed the heels and maybe a tap off the top, we could have seen that score go excellent. So really smart heat from Carniella, starting early, capitalizing, not waiting, uh, and not being too fussy. Surfing what's in front of him. A little bit of cat and mouse now is what I'm expecting in this final two and a half minutes, Peter. And Justin's, a, he's a wily competitor, right? He loves winning. He does not like losing. Um, uh, you know, from all of my experience watching these duct tape invitationals, he has been one of the most fierce competitors. Kaniala uses his priority, a little defense at the beginning, now some offense as he surfs through this wave, wants to better his low of a 5.6. Some nice board redirecting there, weaving through the flat section on the inside here. Gets a five, that wave doubles way up. Banks, this a is beautiful huge. two for one finish for Kaniala Stewart. He's going to better the 5.5 five, um, or the 5.6, right? He's going to hit the 5.6 actually came in from the wave previous. But this is a, it feels like to me it's going to be an improvement. Matt, would you agree? Yeah, I agree. He, uh, the, the beginning of the wave is a little sleepy as we see here. So it was, a, it was an offensive uh, move for him to paddle for this wave, an opening five. Now he sort of has to make the choice here. Does he pull out and go back and put pressure on Justin? No, he stays with it and he knows that he's, he had that 5-5. Five five, so he has to be dynamic here. Stepping back, moving rail to rail, stepping forward again. This is all part of the criteria, keeping flow, momentum. Steps back now, keeps that hit and rolls out. And then another one for good measure, just for the crowd. And that was a really well surfed wave for Carney. So uh, I think that was a 5.6. So we'll wait to see what the judges lock in for this. And yeah, yeah it'll extend uh, it'll extend his lead and Justin will be requiring. So we're waiting for the last score for Carney Alice Stewart still and see if he extends his lead over Justin Quintal. Numbers are coming through and Justin is going oh. to need a larger requirement to take the lead off of Connie Alice Stewart. 5.97 drops in for Connie. Justin Quintal now needing a 6.88 with just 35 seconds remaining. There is a wave out there. It's a turnover in the shoulder. I can see a little bump, whether or not it'll capitalize. Oh, here we go. Look at, we're gonna get to see it. It's gonna have at to least be the some, opportunity, right? Yep, gonna have to be some clutch surfing for Justin Quintal. Here we go, to the nose, gets a 10, walks, walks it on back, tries to plane through this section to connect to, to the wedge coming at him, little drop knee, turn. There's some energy in this one, Kaipo. Energy carrying him to uh, the shore break section. He's gonna need a little bit more on this, making sure he's sticking with the wave. Quintal now looking to the right oh. and hurls it in the shore break and that is going to be the undoing of Justin Quintal. You can see the expression on his face. Yeah, he needed something on that inside section. It just didn't provide it. Yeah, unfortunately for Justin, he left it to the last minute and he gave it his all though. You, you know, you can't deny that. He, he knew that left was out there somewhere, but unfortunately in this heat, there was just not enough of them for him to build momentum. One more time, Peter. Yeah, again, uh, going towards that pier section. And he saw that there was some energy bubble next to the pier, stayed with it, kept the trim, was able to redirect a little drop knee. Again, trying to showcase some sort of point of difference, but the inside just didn't provide it. It really didn't. It just shut down on him really quickly. So that was unfortunate for Justin, but uh, fun to see that, that he got that last opportunity. And you know, it's uh, he was the form surfer in this competition, but so was Carniella in Manly. So Carniella gets his revenge on uh, on the competitive spirits out there, and he gets a chance in the final. It is going to be a final with Taylor Jensen and Carniella Stewart, and uh, that is the making of an incredible final as we look at <laughs> Carniella Stewart with a celebration <laughs> in the water right now. Gotta love it. Well, loving what you're seeing. We're going to take a break, but when we come back, it's going to be the Women's Challenger Series semifinals in the water.
Nothing left of news now. Everything to prove now. As long as I'm alive, I'ma fight back. My fire never cools down. I'm about to catch fire. So the Andy U.S. Open of Surfing here in my hometown of Huntington Beach, California. We've got a huge stacked lineup for the women's semifinals. And I get to call the action alongside my good friend, also Huntington Beach, well, Southern California local here in Mitchell Salazar. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Shannon. How about yourself? Yeah, really good. We had some really fun duct tape invitational heats, but now we're into the Challenger Series. Yeah, and halfway through the through the year already in the Challenger Series, too. So a critical point for both of these ladies that are about to paddle out. Both Macy Callahan and Caroline Marks looking to gain momentum, and especially for Macy, being in the top 10 right now, at least in the semifinals, she has a good shot of moving up into the top three in the rankings right now, Shannon, with the final appearance. Maybe even a win if she kind of gains momentum, but Caroline Marks has been competing so well this week. She knows this break well. It's going to be an exciting one. Yeah, this is going to be huge. Macy with a lot on the line looking for requalification to the championship tour where Caroline Marks is just so hungry to finally get her name on that list of Vans U.S. Open of surfing winners. She's taken the win out on the pro junior level, but I've got to imagine that coming into this year's event, she's got everything set on that uh, first place finish. Yeah, absolutely, because Caroline has won the pro junior division here at this event. She hasn't won the Opens yet. She's made quarters, but she hasn't really been one of those final day standouts that you're thinking, okay, she's gonna be one of the winners. So far this event, I would have to say she is. She's been very impressive. Every single one of her heats, besides, except the last one, she had an eight point ride, but the last heat, it was a come from behind win against Molly Picklim. There you see from Melbourne Beach, but has been residing in San Clemente for many years now. So no stranger to Southside HB, Shannon. Yeah, she's feeling really comfortable here. She's riding equipment specifically shaped for waves like this here at Huntington Beach. Macy Callahan out of Avoca Beach, New South Wales, Australia, just north of Sydney on the east coast of Oz. And she's been on a great run. Walked away with that uh, great result in Bolito. And we're gonna take a look now at her opening ride coming out with a lot of speed. Find some aggression into that turn, but I think that flat section got the better of her. Yeah, she struck first. So now Caroline with priority and looking right now, Shannon, this might be a decent wave. Straight into the pocket for that first section, tags it for the second. Let's see if she finds a reform. Sticks with that foam just to see if she'll get the stand up on the inside. And I'm gonna say she'll get there with absolute ease. Nice snap to start and a bowly section to finish off with. She'll win that first exchange. What a start for Caroline, too. Riding that epoxy, it seems like a driver with the Kolohe and Dino fins underneath. And typically, you see a lot of those Mayhem surfers. Big shout out to Gian Bernini and the whole crew at Mayhem Boards. But they not only make suitable boards for these Southern California conditions, they also have some of the best athletes from this same region, too. Looking at the, at the replay here, beautiful setup from Caroline. Just a carb to kind of start things off, but got the two for one on the outside and then committed to the inside section, making the reform. And that board just glided over these sections really well. Did the Huntington hop real quick. Little bit of a setup turn right there, but a fantastic finish yet again. And the way she pivots off the bottom and sets up her backside bottom turn going up into the lip. I don't think there's anybody better in the world, especially on the female level. Oh, she's so dangerous looking for those rights, and she's been able to find some really good ones throughout competition. We're waiting for that score to roll through, so let's go down to catch up with our second men's finalist, Kanye Stewart, into the finals. Louisa, take it away.
Yeah, Kai, Kenny, you were just like, starting your heat was a 7.33, so you, you were feeling good. But I wonder, like, on that last minute when you see, like, Justin Cantal just taking off on the buzz beater wave, like, what goes through your mind? Oh, just so much, so much things run through my mind, you know? Um, especially with Justin, Justin's such a good competitor that he can get a score on any wave, you know? And um, that just makes me super nervous, but I mean, I got lucky, you know, um, just blessed to be here. I was praying the whole time, this morning, <laughs> last night, before the heat, um, and it's just, can't, I can't be more thankful than this. And yesterday you were telling me that after your heats, you know, you have the whole family, the whole Hawaiian crew is here just giving you tips and advices. So what did you carry from yesterday to today? Um, so what I carried was, I kind of went back, I watched, I, I, I watched me surf, and then I watched all Justin's seats as well. and. Um, Pretty much the main goal was kind of just to try and keep Justin off those lefts, you know? And um, I know he can get the score on all those lefts. So um, the goal was just try and find the good rights that come in and try and keep Justin off the lefts. You and Taylor Jansen now in the finals, world champ. How's the mind? How's the heart? How are you going to do it? Uh, feeling good. Um, you know, warmed up this morning. Hopefully later on some of the rights kick in. Me and, me and Taylor can go at it. Amazing. Congratulations. So we'll see you soon. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Aloha. Stoked for Connie. And how's that strategy? Going back to watch his own footage, yeah. but also of the opponent he's beating in the draw. No, he's made leaps and bounds in terms of improvements, in terms of competitive surfing. I noticed two things in that heat with him. One, that he was much more strategic when it came to using and recovering priority. And second, he was very aware of what his opponent was doing at all times too. So I would be thinking he's going to take the lead in the rankings, had the semifinal finish at, at Manly, at least a second place here. So he's looking good. I actually think he has a chance to be world champion at Malibu. So keep it up, Connie. You got big things in your future. He's got huge things in his future. He took out the win back in the 2019 Longboard Tour season at the Longboard Classic New York in small beach break conditions. So we could see him doing it again as Caroline Marks goes for the air early in the heat. Second wave, to be specific, and already launching. Yeah, well, good strategy, especially because she opened up with a 4.5 on her opener. There's not a ton of opportunities, I feel, with those big sections on the outside, and Caroline has that one pivoty snap, especially on the back end where she's capitalized on big opportunities. The thing is, I think there's more rights than there are lefts today, and as you said, going for it on the second wave, I love the wave. The, the way she just set up, immediately as she set up, she was already bottom turning into the air. So a beautiful approach, but there's way less lefts today than there were on previous days. A lot of rights, and I think that's where Caroline really needs to take her approach and utilize her backhand to her advantage, Shannon. Wow, what a way to start things off. So Caroline Marks, just a 4.5 for her opener and a throwaway score. Macy also just a one-point ride for that opening, you know, kind of turn to bogged rail but already seeing that tenacity come through in their surfing. We're into the semifinals, and they're both looking for some big results here. Macy now chasing just a 4.57 to take that advancing spot. And very surprisingly, this is actually the first time that these two have ever met up in head-to-head -head competition. Now, they've met up in other draws before, but actually head-to-head -head between any, any level of, of event, mm -hmm. it's the first time they've drawn each other. Pro Junior, Challengers, QS, even on the CT, that is impressive. And looking at the results so far from Macy Callahan, a pair of ninths in the first two events and then a second place finish at Polito. So at least getting a semifinal finish here for young Macy. I mean, she's definitely in the top five. I think she's a top five surfer. If she actually makes it back to the CT, she has the capability to do so. Riding an Inferno 72 out there, mostly DHD fins um, made by Future. So they tend to be a lot stiffer, those ones, despite being honeycomb. Normally, you'd ride those at a kind of a point break. And there's Sakura. She's watching herself on screen. She's coming up against Sophie McCulloch, another one of the people that I would say is a favorite to win this event today, especially with the conditions we have. Yeah, she's been looking so strong in her heat sessions as well as some of those warm-up sessions out at the north side of the pier. And it's the first time those two have drawn each other in these head-to-head -head matchups as well, which is surprising knowing, you know, the familiarity that these names are starting to have, household that we're talking about on a very consistent basis. And I love seeing some of these new matchups as we're seeing different surfers fall out of the draw along the way to finals day. And a little bit of a sleepy start to this one. 20 minutes still on the clock, or 19 specifically. 
and we have yet to see the tone really be set. Okay, we're gonna crown four new different champions today at this event. I don't know if, I, if that's ever happened before. There's gonna be a new champion in the women's challenger, there's gonna be a new champion in the men's challenger, and both Connie and Taylor have never won this event, I believe, and then Kelis and Hono, oh, Hono has, yeah, so three. Actually, Kelis Kaleopa'a won in the last time she okay. won the 2019 event, and Honolua won the 2018 event. Okay, so three different champions. Three different champions. My bad. That's okay. I like that you're going for it, and uh, that we do have some new champs in the in the water today, which will be fun to see. As we see some sets rolling through throughout the day, we'll see some fun waves ridden. These two have spent some time on the championship tour together. Macy, currently 21, is about 18 months older than Caroline at 20. And Caroline's maybe had the, the better results to her career within those championship tour conversations and in the Olympics, but Macy's been right there fighting for it. And in that last heat, we saw Justin Quintal, the favorite in the draw, going down to Coniella Stewart. So Justin, I know that heat, not the way you wanted it to end, but what do you think uh, happened in the water? Um, it was just a little bit of a slow start. Uh, it seemed like the waves were a little more consistent earlier. And yeah, you know, there's only so much you can do. And I think I did surf the waves that I got, you know, the best I could. And yeah, Connie got that first good one right off the bat. And I think that was that. And you're no stranger to winning here at Huntington Beach in the Vans Duct Tape Invitational, but what is it like for you to see the next generation come in and start to find their footing here? Yeah, I mean, there's so many great young up-and-coming surfers, and Connie is obviously one of them. And, uh, yeah, so to lose to him, it's, you know, it's all good. And uh, just stoked to see the talent that's coming up in the next generation and see where they can take longboard and how far they can push it. Thank you, Justin. Yeah. He is the man to beat out here. Impressive performance from Coniella Stewart heading towards that event in Malibu where we will be crowning our world champions. Now, Justin finished off number seven in the world last year on the Longboard World Tour, which means okay. he's already qualified for that event at Malibu. We are taking the top 10 Do surfers need me for like from Malibu last from year. They'll be advancing. Um, and then we will be filling in the AJ bottom Darema. 10 positions with uh, some other surfers in the draw. But we'll have to wait until we kind of get those results past the finals here to find out exactly who will be filling in those bottom 10, 10 results. So looking at the conditions right now, we're actually going to hit a low tide of 2.6 later on in the day at around 11 a.m. And, I mean, we do have decent conditions out there in terms of the consistency. You're seeing the swell direction from the south-southwest with that northwest wind swell filling in too. But the wind has really been the primary factor for me um, due to that kind of consistent wind that we've seen from the northwest. And you can see on the north side of the pier, it's still very clean. We're not expecting any wind until, I want to say, 3, 4 p.m. later today. It's going to be a strong onshore again. But it's also been because of that northwest wind that we also had a lot of availability in terms of that consistent northwest swell. So. What it's doing is that when it's actually shutting down, there's going to be less amount of waves that are coming through during this 30-minute heats, and it's going to make things a lot more difficult for the people that are going to have to play catch-up. In this case, it's Macy Callahan. So I think as of right now, with 15 minutes to go, that 4.5 of Caroline Marks could easily be in her top two at the end of the heat. And that's a surprising conversation because we've seen both of these surfers dropping scores in that, you know, six to eight point range throughout competition. But to know that, that a solid start of a 4.5, given the, the change in the conditions, is really impressive. Now, taking a look at that leaderboard, we do have Macy Callahan. She came through into this event ranked number five. So every result she gets past here is helping her to jump up in that leaderboard. But we do have those top four out of the conversation. Yeah, well, she's at least moving up to number three, I would think, after this. But Betty Lou also has a chance to overtake her if she wins. Sophie McCulloch as well. They're both tied at, at uh, excuse me, uh, Betty Lou's number six and Sophie's number eight. But... I think just going back to the rankings and seeing the people that lost out very early, Teresa, Nikki, not only was that surprising, I also think with um, the amount of events that we have this year on the Challenger Series and now going back to four, it's going to be a big loss for them early on here at the Vans U.S. Open. Macy uses priority on a left. Nice snap to start. Links it together wow. well for the second. 
Just a two-turn combination, but that's going to set herself up chasing that 4.57. Best way with the heat to me personally, you know, big two-turn combo on the outside, utilize that left to her advantage. And going back to those, uh, well, first of all, the sharp eye board looks great, the Inferno 72, but those DHD future fins um, look great as well. The way she pivots off of the bottom right there and snaps it straight up into the lip for the second one. So good variation too. Big fan of, uh, of water on the first turn, but the second turn, more of a poke straight up into the lip. And the stiffness that those kind of fins bring, being more of a point break kind of fin, is that it allows for her style to be more cemented at a beach break, whereas Caroline, she wants to be riding those kind of Kolohe fins because she wants that springy kind of action that suits her style well. So get equipment choice for both ladies according to their styles of surfing. I love that they have those options, that it's not just what board they're riding, but they can change up those fins. I know Keely Andrews still occasionally pedals out with a board with glassed on fins, mm -hmm. but she's really the only one that we're seeing uh, at, at this stage do something like that. I think you're limiting your, the amount of uh, different types of surfing that you can provide, especially at a beach break like this, Shannon. Caroline Marks in the lead, still waiting for the score of that two-turn combo from Macy Callahan. We'll have those results in the full situation update when we return. The Vans U.S. Open of Surfing is brought to you by Vans, off the wall since 66. By Flying Embers, official hard kombucha of the World Surf League. By Hydroflask, every adventure starts with two simple words, let's go. And by 805 Beer, proud partners of Connor Coffin and the WSL, properly chill. Macy Callahan, Taking off on another left. Snap to start in the pocket and she'll kick out. Now her last score before we cut to break was a 6.5 has come through as the highest wave of the heat. And it does put Caroline now chasing a 4.24. So we got some helicopters flying around the side today. Yeah, Coast Guard making sure everything's nice and beautiful out there, which so far it seems like it is. The beach is packing up and it's been crowded here. I got here at around 6.10, I wanna say this morning. And the parking lot was already at 80% capacity, Shannon. So might as well get down here right now when we're still in the semifinals. You're going to want to watch the finals later on today. There's so much fun action happening after the semifinals for the Challenger Series. We'll be kicking off with the finals of the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. And then our final two heats of the day will be returning to our Vans U.S. Open of Surfing with our Women's and Men's Challenger Series rankings filling themselves out. So I just want to point uh, something out right here is that, you know, despite Macy Callahan having the 6.5 and the best wave of the heat so far, her backup only being a 2.23, I would still say that Caroline Marks having priority and having control the last 10 minutes of the heat despite that 6.5 of Callahan, you'd still think she's in real good striking distance to at least match something or even better the 6.5 of Macy. So look for her here to utilize priority and especially look left now, Shannon. 
Here we go with priority, Caroline. We've seen her hunting down those rights and finding excellent scores. Can she do it on her forehand? Nice connection with the lip. Wrap for that second maneuver. And now she's going to hug that foam, look for that reform on the inside if she can cut past that dead section, and she'll kick out with control. Callahan now up and riding smooth off the bottom into the lip, and that section just dies on her as well. But a nice kick out to start. Paddle battle right here, too. It seems like Macy is still far out back enough where she's going to recover priority, go back to the primary takeoff zone. Smart surfing right there from both ladies. But I feel like Macy still going to be in the lead after this exchange. Looking at Caroline's first, though, maybe just a bit too deep right there. Shannon had to come around the corner, floated that section right there. It was a tricky one. And then a strong carve for the second one as well. Tried to get the reform. The wave went too flat. Even with that epoxy, wasn't going to make it to the, to the shorey. And then Macy with the answer back. Beautiful pivot off of the bottom. And that's where those honeycomb fins really just kind of hold that ground and are so stable when you're coming into those steep sections on the outside. So she's easily going to better the 2.23. The real question is, how much is Caroline Marks going to get on that wave, especially compared to the 6.5 of Macy? Scores to come through for both surfers. Macy Callahan chasing a result here on the Challenger Series. She's looking to improve on the f on the two ninth place finishes that she started off the season with at home in Australia for her as well. Earlier knockouts than she would have been wanting. Of course, finding that second place finish to Molly Picklum in Bolito in South Africa was a huge jump for her in the rankings. And now she's on her way to another kind of jump in those points for Caroline Marks. Not much on the line when it comes to the, the conversation around her tour this year, but for her wanting to win the Vans US Open of surfing puts her into the conversation with the greats of her peers, of Sage Erickson, of Courtney Conlog, Carissa Moore, Caitlin Simmers, but also will add her name to a list of heroes that have come before, of Frida Zamba, of Jody Cooper, of Kim Merrick, of so many others like Lisa Anderson, who have taken out this victory in the past. Yeah, and remember the youngster too, Malia Manuel, winning when she was 14 years of age. So Caroline won't be the youngest winner if she actually does end up crowning herself a champion later today. but. Either way, I mean, the list and accolades that she's had, but I think more than anything, she's just trying to get back into a competitive groove, get some rhythm, and obviously winning here, the prize money ain't too bad either, it being a challenger series now. But looking at the scores, I mean, they both got the exact same score, 3.83 for both ladies. Um, you know, the high and the low gets, get tossed out, and there was a difference of opinions for some of the different judges up there too. And there's different ways to get to a score as well. And I think it's really crucial for us to explain that to our audience because the surfing was different, but the similar types of waves only allowed for that kind of surfing too. So Macy had the one strong turn on the outside. Caroline had a combo, but you really want to reward that verticality that Macy Callahan had on her first turn on the outside. There was the team for Caroline Marks with Snips, Mike Parsons there alongside Caroline's parents and some friends. Snips just told me this morning they're they're all I mean we're all so excited to keep, see Caroline back in competition free surfing so well she just seems like she's coming into a space now within herself and maybe within her career where we're going to really solidify the longevity of Caroline Marks in this competitive scene obviously making it through to the semifinals for her return back to the championship tour in El Salvador was massive to back it up with another semifinal finish here at the U.S. Open with such a stacked field it's not a championship tour field all across but the names of the women on the challenger series I mean we're looking 10 spots down those who who didn't quite qualify last year and they're all championship tour level competitors if that field were to grow on the women's side yep. and so there is these names that she's having to take down now and snips was just reiterating how good it is to see her in a space where she's feeling happy and light and and ready for competition and i think it's a really lethal caroline marks now even heading into tahiti for uh, uh the event next year for the sorry next week as well as coming into the season next year, that preparation is already beginning for her. Yeah, and I just got a text from Gian Bernini from Lost Surf Boards 2. It's a 5.3 driver 2.0, and that epoxy is a light speed construction, actually. It's a stringless EPS with carbon stripes, so that's what it allow it's, it's allowing for so much flexibility through those kind of flat spots. And it's looked great so far all event long. It's the thir third time she's ridden it in the event. and. 
an interesting situation there with priority. It didn't seem like it switched at all. Taking a look at the heat recap with the opener for Caroline Marks. Yeah, so a 4.5, her personal best. But then Callahan with a 6.5 on the backhand. Beautiful fan right there. And then an excellent combo to finish off, too. And then immediately backed it up with a 3.83 afterwards. Bettering her low score. She's looked great so far in this seat.
Surfing, skating, music, they all have so much to do with each other and to keep that culture developing here in Southern California where so much of it all began. We're at the U Vans US Open of Surfing and we've got two semi-finalists looking for a chance to match up with Macy Callahan. Betty Lou Sakura Johnson getting out to a quick start. A couple snaps in the backhand goes incomplete on that opening that second maneuver. And she is in the water against Alexandra Head, local from the Sunshine Coast of Australia in Sophie McCulloch. Yeah, and a decent star right there from Betty Lou. She's going to be on the board. That's kind of been what she's stuck to all week long in terms of, um, you know, getting a score on the board and then eventually just manufacturing something better than that at the beginning. Back-to-back -back finals for this lady on screen, second place at Belito. And that's awesome, taking time, knowing that a lot of these people come to see you down at the beach compete and just being only 20 years old I think Macy Callahan has, has a very bright future after this event too. Some baby shakas being thrown down on the shoreline. Baby That's shaka. just so good. That was baby shaka for sure. <laughs> Betty Lou Sakura Johnson up against Sophie McCulloch. First time these two have met up head to head. Sophie did mention that in the multiple four surfer heats that they've had in the past maybe down to three surfers as well betty lou has always taken the win over sophie even if they both advance through so she's pretty hungry to get one back yeah and the local product of haleiva on oahu big win for her last year in the last event of the season she qualified because of that and having a get a result here at this first event what excuse me last year was the first event of the challenger series she at least made it to the quarterfinals and having a semifinal finish here after doing well in Belito as well. Looking good, entering in the top 10 right now. She was number six, and this lady on screen was number eight coming into the Vans US Open. Sophie McCulloch from the Sunshine Coast in Queensland, Australia. Some warmer water, beautiful right hand point, some great beach breaks around as well. So very well-rounded, stylish surfer, similar to the likes of Akili Andrew mm -hmm. coming through in the draw. She kicked off the start of her QS season this year to qualify for the Challenger Series with her very first ever QS win as we take a look at the replay from Betty Lou. Yeah, so Sakura got a 4.17 on this one. That firewire board of the Slayer Designs looking good underneath her feet. And this was just a 2.0 to back it up real quick. Incomplete there on the second one. Didn't completely ride right out of it, but I mean, she is a workhorse. She works with Ross Williams on the North Shore, Halaiva Boy as well. And when she's competing those mo in those mock heats against Luke Swanson, John John Florence, everybody else there that trains with Ross, she's winning about 90% of the heats. So if she's doing that against the two-time world champion, and do some people consider the best surfer alive right now, this means she got skills. She got skills. She's being trained by the best alongside of the best. And it's just so fun, too, to see the development of surfers when it's surfer pushing surfer, whether it's guys, whether it's girls, all together. And that's where we're seeing the likes of a young Betty Lou Sakura Johnson just rise to the top at such a young age. Another surfer that came out with massive potential at a young age at 17, 18 years old on the women's 
Championship Tour was Macy Callahan, and she's looking for that requalification now. Back-to-back -back finals might do it for her. Take it away, Louisa. Yeah, Macy, you were just telling me that you're feeling emotional. And I totally understand, looking back, your career was full of ups and downs. So how is this all landing on you right now? Yeah, um, I was almost in tears, actually. Uh, Caroline and I were both super young when we made tour. She was 15 and I was 17. And yeah, we've had a, some great ups and great downs. Uh, we've traveled the world together and it's been a great journey and we've had some great memories together and that was like a really special hit for me. Um, I'd love to obviously be back on tour with Caroline and um, yeah, it's one step closer. So from this week, what do you think you could use as far as knowledge and like mental tips that you had that you used in the water today? Yeah, I think I've just been putting a little less pressure on myself compared to other years. Um, two back-to-back -back finals, I would have never imagined doing that this year. I wasn't even sure if I wanted to do the Challenge Series this year. I wasn't sure whether I wanted to get back on tour or um, if competitive surfing was even, you know, the thing that was for me. But uh, I think it might be now, I guess. Um, pretty, pretty happy, yeah. <laughs> Betty Lou or Sophie, who would you want to bat on now? Um, oh, I can't pass up my Aussie mate, Sophie. She's been ripping, and to have two Aussies in the final would be amazing. But um, I know Betty Lou is amazing as well, so uh, either would be great. Let's see who you're going to face in the finals. Congratulations. I'll see you there. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Another huge result for Macy into the finals. It would be fun to see the two Australians. There was obviously, you know, there was that chance that we could see uh, another fun draw between the Americans, between Betty Lou Sakur Johnson of Hawaii and Caroline Marks of California. But now we've got the potential of a two Aussie final here at the south side of the Huntington Beach Pier. If that happens, might just have to start calling it the Australian Open or something like that, but <laughs> takes place in Huntington Beach. Sydney might be a little sad to lose that title. It, yeah, family for sure. But how about that start from Sophie McCulloch? A 7.33 catapults her up into first and with 22 minutes to go, this means that Betty Lou in these next five to 10 minutes would have to get something close to that score in order to really get back into it because you know that Sophie's eventually going to back this wave up. I really love the takeoff. Nice and patient. Slid the tail. Almost even lost control a little bit. But it added to the kind of flavor and variation that we've seen so far this week from her. And a beautiful finish right at the end too. Throwing the tail out the back. Kind of drifting those fins. And this is a big score. It's not only the best we've seen this morning from the ladies, but I also think it's an excellent score in order to make it through these 30-minute heats, Shannon. Yeah, that is a huge score for her to start off with as well. First wave she took off on, sat patiently waiting for it, wanting to go big on the first opportunity. Yeah, and I was telling you, 12, 13 points is really where you're going to make those kind of amends for those mistakes in the beginning of the heat. Luckily for her, she waited patiently with priority had not committed a mistake, I feel, in the last two heats that she served. So, so far, not only is this a great start, I actually think against Betty Lou, it's the only strategy you can really have because Sakura has started off a lot of these heats with at least 10 points on the board. And I think that's something that Ross and her have actually worked out this week to perfection because without it, there would have been a lot of heats where she would have been squeaking by with those smaller scores that she would have had at the end of those heats. But luckily for her, you know, she's still in the game right now with 21 minutes to go. Under priority, Sophie caught behind the section. No scoring potential once it hits the, that flat zone into the pier. Got it right here. Or left? She's taking a look at the left. Didn't even really glance at that right. Nice and vertical for that first snap for Betty Lou. Now cutting it back for that reform. Taking two the traditional Huntington hop to make it through the section, and now she's gonna have some speed. Again, wanting to go on that backhand attack. Two-turn combo, whip to finish. And the crowd goes wild. Great response. So the big turn on the backhand on the outside. From our perspective, it seemed like the right was kinda gonna bowl up, but it might have gone flat. That's why she decided to fade left here. Yep, it did exactly that. So strong first turn. Got just slightly hung up coming out of it, but recovered well here with the inside Shory, getting the two for one little setup and more of a place turn right at the end. She didn't really fully bottom turn, but she couldn't because the section wasn't really there to do it. So she just had to put that board up into the lip and luckily for her, she landed it. But a good response to the 733 of McCulloch Shannon.
Right now, it's small scores required. It's just a 3.77 to put her into that leading position. But Sophie does have a 7.33 on the scoreboard. Curious to see where the judges will go with this one. And great to see it's such an easy paddle out today for finals day with fun waves still available in comparison to what we saw at uh, you know a bit earlier in the waiting period. Yeah, and when that happens uh, on a one-on-one -on -one heat, you need to start thinking that you're going to need a score almost exactly like your, your opponents. If it's a three or four person heat and there's a chance you can make it in second, you want to look at their kind of opportunities or what the scores that they've had as we're seeing Betty Lou drop a 6.5. But it's crucial for her to at least have made it competitive with her last score because if not, you're just thinking, okay, what if she gets another score just exactly like that, that I'm going to need a combination of scores anyway. So you need to start thinking small in order to look at the bigger picture eventually too. Love that breakdown, Mitch. So Sophie McCulloch down into second, now chasing just a 3.34. Betty Lou dropping in a 6.50 for that last wave. And glassy conditions here for finals day at the Vans US Open of Surfing. So many people on the pier taking a look at the conditions, maybe wishing that they could be out there with just two people in the lineup getting a few fun waves. Betty Lou with a quick kick in and out, just sussing out the lineup now that she's sitting under priority. Yeah, and not a, not a bad strategy to have. I was actually going to say I think it would be smart of Sophie to move a little bit deeper and maybe to capitalize on one of those deeper lefts that have been running closer to or towards the pier bowl. I think she's kind of going to stick to her guns, though, Shannon. Her best scores so far in the in the event have actually been right. So wouldn't be surprised if she just kind of stands her ground right here. Fairly consistent in some heats. Others have been very slow. Right now, that consistency seems to be in favor of the two women in the lineup as they just keep trading off waves. What a great wow. two-turn combo from Betty Lou. <laughs> oh, that was incredible. Top turn to bottom turn, finds the reform now. This could be a massive score. It's already gonna be great, but let's see how great it can be. Finishing off to the inside for Sakura Johnson. And Sophie McCulloch got busy out the back. She's now with the answer on the inside with a great bowl standing up in front of her. Snap, but digs the rail and can't ride out complete. That wave of the Hawaiian Betty Lou, unbelievable. If there's one thing I will say about Sakura is that she is determined and she has the conditioning to prove it too. We didn't see the outside of Sophie's wave. Here it is. Ends up going left. So a decent first turn on the outside, carves it back. So a cool combo. And then here, a big mistake on her behalf. Maybe went a bit too big for how flat that section was right there. But to me, that was the most crucial mistake so far. She let Sakura have this wave and an excellent combo on the outside. I mean, beautiful variation. The one down carve, the big turn, busting the fins outside. And how about this two for one at the end too? To me, no doubt in my mind that this is going to be the best wave of the heat. I could not agree more. That was such beautiful surfing. So well executed. Like you said, the variation in that outside section. Well, and how many people have done a carve on the outside section too? It's been running so fast that they haven't been able to do that. So it presents a kind of unique perspective that we haven't seen from a lot of the shortboarders lately. Scores to come through for Betty Lou Sakura Johnson as well as Sophie McCulloch but looking for that biggest score of the heat to drop in from the judging panel. They're taking their time, watching those replays, analyzing maybe the sections, the different angles as well. Calling that wave live for Sophie, it looked like that inside section was really standing up strong, but it was maybe just the angle of that camera for us as well, just viewing here on, on webcast, where you could see with the execution of that turn how flat it was, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Especially on the inside, you gotta be real careful with those sections when you make the inside connection. 15 minutes on the clock. Scores starting to drop through for Betty Lou Sakura Johnson in the nine point range. And there it is, a perfect 9.00 for the Hawaiian. Put Sophie McCulloch chasing an 8.18 to take the lead away. And what a crazy exchange. 
So much more action to come, but out and about around the contest site, we have our very own Chris Cote with one of his other favorite sports of the skateboard. Oh, thank you so much. And wow, it sounds like things are heating up out in the water. They're heating up behind me as well. This is going to be the scene of the Vans showdown. I would say this is the calm before the storm because it is about to be going off at this skate park. They're gonna be skating all day long, so if you're in or around the area, come down and check this out in person. If you're at home watching, around 2.45, we're gonna start the broadcast for the Vans Showdown. That's best trick and our overall winners. So right behind me, you see the skate park looks absolutely amazing. And uh, these skaters are gonna do their best to destroy this place. That's what they do. So uh, after the surf presentation, you can tune in and watch some of the best skateboarders on the planet it throw down right behind me as part of the Vans showdown. Oh man, look at this. That does look like so much fun, Cote. Thanks for giving us that inside look at the skate park. We've got Betty Lusa Kerr Johnson now up and riding, finishing off on the inside for another good looking wave and she'll just go incomplete. But that nine point ride for Betty Lou has set the standard for our women's challenger series. Yeah, and took away an opportunity right there from Sophie too. It was a close battle battle back for priority. Betty Lou ended up getting the upper hand on that. And looking at the replay here, speeding down the line, made it up into the lip with a great snap right there. And just more of a check from the second one. The, the second section really didn't stand up the way she wanted to. And a bit of a mistake right there at the end. I think she didn't meet the section with enough speed. Doesn't better her low score. It comes in as a 4.53. But with 13.20 to go, I would think that Sakura really just needs to be patient and add some more pressure. You've done the hard work already, Shannon. You've added that 15.5 heat total to your excellent heats that you've had so far this week. But looking at the, the performances that Sophie McCulloch has had all week long, you should know that she's more than capable of getting an excellent score. That's right, she's done the work. She's also found her third excellent score of the event. So in the round of 16, Betty Lou found an eight against Sawyer Lindblad, took the win. Then in her quarterfinal matchup against Bronte McCauley, when she needed an excellent score to take the advancing position, she dropped in a nine point ride. Mm -hmm. So this is her second nine of the event, her third excellent score overall. And to find that consistency now, conditions fairly similar from what we saw through the round of 16, now into finals day, she's looking like the one to beat. Down to 12 minutes, 23 seconds on the clock. Sophie McCulloch chasing a massive 8.18. We'll find out if she can find it right after this. Why do I want to be on the championship tour? It's because it's all there, everyone wants it, and you're doing the Challenger Series to be there. It's the next step for me personally to pursue myself and learn more and be better as a competitor. 
I mean, I'm still learning, I'm still a kid, and I think this is the best way for me to like push through it with the positivity. I think we're all just stoked to keep going, and we know we're gonna be back there. 10 minutes on the clock, Sophie McCulloch is chasing an 8.18 to get the win over Betty Lou Sakura Johnson and book herself a spot in the finals. Now for both of these women, they've had semifinal results already on the Challenger Series. It'll be a first for either of them to be advancing into that final round. As we take a look at what Sophie got up to during the break. Yeah, so a good start on the outside. Big bottom turn into a good re-entry. Waited patiently here. For this thing to stand up on the inside gets a little combo right here too so not a bad wave right there for sophie mcculloch don't think it's going to be an 818 but if it betters the 733 she's going to make the requirement lesser the one thing i will say is that looking at the replay right there i felt like the turn on the outside was much bigger than it seemed live so you know could be a decent score they're coming through right now it's a 6.77, so still doesn't better the 7.33. She's still going to need the low 8, Shannon. Still going to need the low 8 with a 6.77. That would be a great heat total in any other heat of the round or maybe even of the event so far with that 14-point heat total. But it's a young Betty Lou who's taking the win over a slightly older Sophie McCulloch. Now, Betty Lou, we noticed she's had that shoulder strap throughout competition this week. But I had a chat with her mom, Shinobu, early, earlier uh, on this morning. There she is sitting on the sand. Her little brother, Ollie, is traveling with her, and Ollie is a huge baseball fan. So they checked out the Angels game earlier this week. They've also been hitting the batting cages. Shinobu said that herself and Betty Lou have been in there hitting some baseball. So I've got to think that that shoulder's feeling okay for Betty Lou. Dude, she didn't give me any credit. I told him Shohei was pitching on a certain day. They should have gone and seen him. No, but they're uh, they're cool people, and their father as well, back home on the North Shore. Um, they've been on the road for a long time now. Betty Lou hasn't been home, I think, since late January, so she's been traveling quite a bit. Got knocked off to her, unfortunately, and now had to pursue the Challenger Series after. But unfortunately um, for her, she's in the top 10 right now with a good chance of requalifying in. Just going back to you know the shoulder tape, want to give a big shout out to Dr. Tim Brown, Terry Romine. Jason, Jesse, Ali, everybody there in, in the tents uh, over at the competitors and VIP areas. They've been doing an excellent job all week. They actually worked on my hip a little bit. It was a little tight, Shannon, so gonna see them later too. Nice, taking a look at the deep stats powered by Hydro Flask for this one. Betty Lou Kerr Johnson took out the win at the Haleiwa Challenger at the end of last season, which secured that position for her on the championship tour. She's got a, a pretty good stack of career Challenger Series heat wins. Yeah, 14 and her best wave so far, a 9.43. It's not surprising to see her, her amount of success so far in the Challenger Series, especially with only the second season being right now. The one thing that I will say about Sakura is that she has a sort of resiliency around her that a lot of people don't tend to have at such a young age. She's only 17. She qualified when she was still 16 years of age, got knocked off, and despite, you know, the kind of lack of excellent heats that she had on the challenger on the ct excuse me she's making up for it on the challenger series right now sophie work with some work to do she'll fall out of that first turn she's been traveling alongside of a younger australian in holly williams it's been the first time that holly's qualified for the challenger series she got a win out of her first round, which was her first win for a Challenger Series heat as well. So she's had some growth opportunities. And I think it's been really cool for the two of them to just have each other's back. They've been surfing north side in between, you know, the duct tape invitational events and getting a lot of time in the water there. They had one day earlier in the week where they headed down to the pack at Trestles to get a few of the best waves in this region. And uh, it's been exciting to see the two of them on the road together and that Australian pack really sticking together. Yeah, and it's a real young Australian crew, by the way, uh, as we're seeing Aton. Aton Osborne coming out for the semi number one against Zeke Lau, gonna be a stacked one. 27th in the rankings is Zeke. Aton number 40, they're gonna move up a good amount after this result here. But yeah, going back to the Australians, Mikey McDonough, Dylan Moffitt, Liam O'Brien, who had a great result in this event yesterday too. Um, I'm really excited to see a lot of the young kids, especially Joel Vaughn after his quarterfinal finish here. I think they got a good crew coming up in the land down under that they're gonna make strides in the next few events too. 
Yeah, it's been a great crew coming through. A couple of those names, like Azali Kelly from yep. the women's side, who qualified for last year's Challenger Series, but decided not to compete because she wanted to focus on finishing her high school career. She's been making it through some, uh, some good heats, and it's been just really fun to see that whole crew, that sort of fresh energy coming in from the Australian side, especially on the women's side where we've had the likes of a Nikki Van Dyke, a Sally Fitzgibbons, a Tyler Wright, a Steph Gilmore dominate that conversation of Australian women's surfing for so many years. Mm -hmm. No, and don't forget about the generation before that, Beck Woods, Lane Beachley, obviously, too. And I think they've kind of bettered over each generation, too. Dimity Stoy was among that one as well, as we're seeing Zeke on screen and going back to you know the focus on their education i said yesterday that zeke went to punahou he actually went to kamehameha i apologize but he was another person that never stopped going to school despite competing a lot and traveling a lot when he was still doing the amateur event so zeke another dedicated person i love to see that we're kind of implementing more of an educational side in terms of competing as well and i think that's where you're seeing a lot of the best competitors actually be that way as well shannon yeah really well rounded speaking of which so Sophie McCulloch is busy studying a, a double degree, a dual degree between marketing and biomechanical science. <laughs> she is extremely smart, takes after the likes of Isabella Nichols. Two of them have a lot of similar styles. Sophie maybe being a little shorter in stance, um, but they've been great friends. And that's something that we've really seen coming through in that pack of surfers coming out of that Australian region. And uh, some real smart ones coming through. Also making some great heat decisions, all that coming into play, as well as setting themselves up to maybe keep the future of our oceans clean and safe so that they and their children and so many more to come can enjoy the ocean for years. Absolutely. Well, Sakura is one of them, too. She's going to be a senior going into next year. But look at this, Shannon. Three minutes, 30 to go. Betty Lou still has priority. McCulloch needing the second best wave of the heat, the 8.18. Not impossible, but highly improbable with the amount of waves that we've seen come through in these 30 minute heats. But I will say this too, Sakura is an excellent tactician and she is masterful when it comes to using priority here at the end of these heats. So would not be surprised to at least see a block or see her just take away an opportunity from Sophie. Yeah, she's not gonna give her an inch to breathe right now. Sitting right underneath the pier, those spectators on top of the Huntington Beach Pier have a great vantage point to see what's been going on. Can see the two of them just trying to figure out will they go betty lou's gonna let sophie have a look at this one she is chasing an excellent score she knows that's not going to give it to her if she would have even been able to catch it small sized wave two minutes 30 seconds on the clock i just want to say i think there's actually a lot of similarities between zeke and betty lou they compete the same way they have similar styles kind of grew up in the same rankings too and obviously she's learned a lot from seeing Zeke compete over the years as well. So, you know, it's funny to see them go in back-to-back -back heats competing out here, especially getting that Kawaiian connection. Ooh, look at this wave, Shannon. On her forehand, drawn out, opening turn, links it for the second, hits that section, looking comfortable. And a great decision to take off on this ride. It does leave Sophie out the back with priority now. Two minutes on the clock and a nice section standing up in front of Betty Lou. Snap and goes for the finish on a hard section. She put so much power into that. So the last turn gonna be incomplete, but I mean, she did a lot of work on the outside and in the transition between the middle part of the wave and the shorey too, 90 seconds to go. And Sophie did catch a wave on the outside, but didn't seem like she was able to do enough right there. That section coming down on her real quick. A late drop too, so not the right amount of speed. And excellent use of priority right here from Betty Lou. Great carve, really opens up those shoulders. Kind of drifts the fins, lays back even a little bit on the second one. And how about the way she's made the inside shore break connection too. All week long, a couple of decent carves right there. The finish was strong, but unfortunately didn't completely ride out of it. So maybe better's the 6.5, maybe doesn't but the work was done. She took away the opportunity from Sophie, and now it's 60 seconds to go. If Sakura betters, Sophie's gonna need something more than an 818. Yeah, she could be looking even at a combination situation. Down to 50 seconds on the clock, and Betty Lou looking for her first final on the Challenger Series this year. Scores in for that last one, a 593 doesn't factor into it. But we do have to remember that not only did she get a quarterfinal finish in Bolito, she took out the win of the Bolito Pro Junior. She took out the young yeah. Sofia Medina there. So she's had a victory this season.
coming off of the championship tour at the start of the year. Her best result there being a semi-final at Sunset, which was huge for her career. And now looking to get back into that winning seat. Sophie McCulloch with a great snap on that opening section. Positions herself back into that reform. Looking really smooth, looking really stylish. I've been proud of her performance throughout this entire event. I think she's one that deserves to be on the championship tour. And she puts on a solid finish as well. But it's going to be those points from the finalists that are really going to get them into the running over the next few events. Yeah, strong performance, semifinal finish for Sophie. She's got to be proud of that, moving up into the rankings and maintaining herself within the top 10, too. Probably going to move up into the top five. But the favorite going into the final now is definitely Betty Lou Sakura Johnson. Macy Callahan, Betty Lou, Sakura Johnson will be the women's final. We've got Zeke Lau and Aton Osborne heading out next for the men's semifinals. The beach is getting packed because it's finals day here at the Vans US Open of Surfing and the men are in the water challenger series semi-final number one and it is quite a matchup and I'm expecting some progressive and aggressive surfing on the water. I'm Kaipo. You're rhyming. And this is Peter Mel. Uh, Pete, look at this matchup. And we're twinning. We're twinning because someone's going to be winning today at the Vans yeah. US Open of Surfing. That's exactly He does have actual going. soulful raps occasionally. So, Kaipo, I can't wait for this one. Great matchup, as you'd mentioned. Ezekiel Lau and Aton Osborne. Yeah. Zeke Lau would be the veteran of the two. Um, both of them do have a equal ninth uh, finish to their credit so far on the Challenger Series. The equal ninth for Aton came at the last event, the Bolito Pro, and then Ezekiel Lau opened up the Challenger Series with an equal ninth place on the Gold Coast. Let's take a look at the replay. This is the opener from Ezekiel Lau, Peter. So a little change of equipment for uh, Zeke Lau. You haven't seen this yellow board, at least I haven't, uh, throughout this event. I did go poke around, and this one is uh, an EPS. He's been riding Polly. So again, with the typical Huntington Beach today, look at that pop he gets. Yeah. So we'll see if that's complete, oh. though, and the judges deem it incomplete for 3.67. Back to the board, wow. that's a Takoro surfboard. It's six, six oh and a half, 19 inches wide. Dude, come on, Two. man. I went in there, too. I wanted to give the measurements. Oh, you, you did get the measurements I on did. this board? I'm sorry. Go ahead. 
<laughs> it's 6 and a half. But it's funny because his other board is 6 19 and 8. This one's 6 and a half, 19. So there's just a little subtle change in that, but the EPS is the biggest difference in this surfboard that he has, so it's going to have a little livelier feel. Yeah, Tucaro plus 5 model. Yep, riding the AM larges, which uh, I think the majority, actually, of the surfers have been riding kind of those AM templates. He's on the FCS tubes, whereas uh, Aton on, on Futures. Aton's going to be on a 5.5, a five, five, little difference. Wow. Spine Tech, happy every day. Riding the Captain Fins with the Future Boxes. Here we go, Z Cloud hooking off the top on the backhand, doubles it up for another bang to the lip. Redirects here, staying with the Whitewater, with, going with the flow into the inside shore break, unable to make that connection. Two turns outside, though, and the second turn straight up and vertical. That ability to really whip that board has been what he's been doing all event long. Um, that vertical approach has been paying big dividends for Zeke Lau. You know, he was able to get through those small days, being a, you know, big in stature, but sure can surf the small waves so well. Beautiful snap here, and then another section was up, straight up vertical with that 12 o'clock. So two turns on the outside. This could be his best wave. Yeah, now, they see. didn't, they didn't, uh, deem that last one complete which is pretty uh, interesting because he did rotate around but you got to really I mean he's a bigger guy so it's a little tough when that white water just doesn't have the juice to be able to flow through it and all the rotation all the way around but judge is very very critical bigger guy he weighs in at 202 pounds 202 and in contrast a much lighter Aton Osborne out there in the blue jersey uh, Aton yet to get going, got opened up with a three-point ride, actually, but yet to put down anything super um, fantastic. Here is a fantastic Pacifical fan picks Ooh. for semifinal number one. And Ezekiel with the edge over Aton Osborne. That was one of the closer matchups I've seen. There's been some lopsided ones. This one, though, but a lot of this uh, folks out there picking uh, Ezekiel with all the... Uh, expertise and experience but aton has been on the rise especially competitively I mean we've all loved his surfing and what he's been able to do but now I mean especially yesterday think about his quarterfinal he surfed an exceptionally smart heat so competitively he's had enough heats to know how to do it and now he's applying it here at the Vans US Open Aton on the paddle here with a wave coming through, Aton with priority decides not to go. Ezekiel is going to pick this one up under Aton's priority. Again, left into the pier, winds off off the bottom, chops it off the top. One more wind and another hack off the top for Ezekiel Lau. Looking for the connection, banks off the white water. Glides in here, trying to stay with the en energy right next to the pilings. Zeke Lau looking for the finish, a little snap. Little hung up, but no problem. Hippity hops over the double up and the finish for Ezekiel Lau. Aton Osborne right behind him, skating on that spine tech construction. And the board's looking skatey quick. And two quick trips to the lip for Aton Osborne. Nice exchange between the two surfers. Well, both riding EPS, which is styrofoam core. The differences being is that Ezekiel Lau's has a stringer, um, whereas Aton does have a stringer, but it's actually a carbon strip that runs almost the whole board, but not off the edge of the tail. So a little difference in the way that those boards are going to flex. And this is a battle right now to get back to the outside. Aton's way ahead at the moment, so uh, looking like he's going to win the battle for priority. Replays. Let's start with Aton. Oh, a right-hander here. Look at nice, almost head-high wave. Big snap. That was beautiful. Laid into it. Not able to get another maneuver done, but one big strong move. This would be a great contrast because they both got the inside connection. Aton slightly stumbled there, so that'll factor into the score, but three turns on the outside here for Ezekiel Lau. Beautiful snap. Again, another one in the pocket, and then finds a third little redirect. Knowing how important it is to get to the inside, he stayed with the energy. So this is really the first two real numbers we're going to see in this heat. And uh, splicing hairs, I feel like that big turn's been rewarded all event long. So we'll see where uh, today's factor in, because it is a different day. 
Yeah, well, it's been a history of the outside maneuver with the most weight and Ethan Osborne getting that big outside maneuver. Meanwhile, Ezekiel Lau kind of did the tap dance through the whole thing, stitching up multiple maneuvers on his wave. No scores as of yet for either Ezekiel Lau or Ethan Osborne for their last rides. Ezekiel Lau, when we talk about a veteran in, in this heat, you know, he spent a number of years on the championship tour, fell off and then got back on in 2021 via the Challenger Series where he ended up number two at the end of the year. So Zeke uh, has had that roller coaster already in his, um, I wouldn't say young pro career, but maybe middle age pro career. But he's he came had on the, so young. Yeah, he's won, he's won big events. Uh, he's won at Sunset Beach. He's won uh, on that Challenger Series and he's, you know, been an understanding of uh, how to re-qualify. So uh, that experience pays off in a big way. He's on his way right now to try and re-qualify. Yeah. So remember, we take the top four results at the end of the year out of seven, out of seven goes here on the Challenger Series. Uh, so Zeke already has kind of a keeper with a ninth place finish. Uh, this is for sure a keeper, just make it to the semifinals, but a win would be outstanding for Ezekiel Lau. More lines coming through here. At 19 minutes and 55 seconds. Scores are in. A 6.5 for Ezekiel Lau. A 6.77 for Aton Osborne. And this heat continues to be a tight one. Here we go. Zeke Lau up and doesn't even get to his feet. So just take a little sniff at that wave. Didn't like what he saw. And he's going to maintain his role on the outside. However, he is under the priority of Aton Osborne. Wow, splicing hairs. 0.27 different going in the favor of Aton Osborne. But again, we're now looking at the next number. Who's going to get themselves into a position for a nice solid set wave? 19 minutes to go, lots of time. Aton just sitting nice and close to Ezekiel Lau, applying a little bit of maybe mental pressure to the big Hawaiian, not backing down whatsoever with that priority. Well, we got a, we got a finalist for our women's division. Betty Lou Sakura Johnson, she surfed excellent. she, excellently. She got a nine-point ride out there in her two-wave total. And Betty Lou Sakura Johnson is with Louisa. Betty Lou, went to the finals. We could definitely see your competitive prowess during this competition. Super consistent, 9.0 again. What do you think it's like has been the secret to carry you through now? Um, honestly, it's just I think it's my mindset. Um, this event, I have everything I need. I have all my friends and family here supporting me. I have family from Hawaii that's watching, getting up really early, and um, my coach Russ. I think it's all coming together, and it uh, feels great. And I just keep going. How are you gonna bottle up all that now for the finals? Um, now it's re it's a ball that's ready to be thrown, and I'm really excited and. Um, yeah, it's an honor to be in the finals here at the US Open. Based on what you have experienced throughout this week, very, um, you could not really understand the conditions, what was going, you know, what do you, what do you have like that is like the right thing for you that you're just going to do it at the finals now? Um, hopefully, you know, just we're praying for the ocean to give what we need, which is waves and, you know, give, hoping for the best opportunity, putting yourself on the best waves. Um, and I think that's what you got to do to win, and we're just going to keep going. Congratulations. Thanks. On to the finals. High five. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right. Well, it's going to be Macy Callahan and Bailu Sakura Johnson in our women's finals. We're setting up our men's finals right now in semifinal number one for the men. And Ezekiel Lau throws the tail some jumbled water for the big Hawaiian to ride out of and he does so so flared it on the outside a little bit recovery time now the Huntington hop comes into play pushing that board against the flats gets through there with a couple tic tacs and the finish for Ezekiel Lau he likes it he's giving himself a round of applause what do you think Peter as needed I love how he solidified the score you know the fact that he wasn't able to really glide out of that uh, move on the outside I mean, that'll factor in slightly. Let's take a look here at first at that last attempt by Aton, and uh, we saw him do this to success. Oh, man, he pulls that off. Amplitude was there. Backhand, always a little more challenging. Here, tries to find a right, but there's that flared out reverse with the air. 
You know, I didn't glide out of it with a bunch of speed, but certainly did make it. And it'll be a complete maneuver, much unlike his earlier one. So he liked it with the solidification on the inside. That is going to be uh, advantage. Zeke Lau, he pulls his air off. And he will get the score and the lead. He's already got it, but he's going to add to that lead. Well, Mitchell Salazar is on the surfer's deck. What do you got for me, Mitch? Hey, Kaipo, I was just going to mention to you guys that the equipment change for Zeke is actually something very surprising considering that the board that I'm looking at right now is his board that he was using the rest of the week is still intact. It does have a crease that has been fixed, though, but the board outside that he's riding the yellow one, as Pete mentioned, an EPS, similar to the one that actually Aton is riding. That's his everyday board. It's an MJW model for Aton. It's a board that's very buoyant. And if you've noticed, he's one of the very few surfers in the event, too, that's actually riding a front pad. So you normally see that with a lot of people with airs. The difficult thing about it, though, it's it's way more difficult to actually shift your feet from the front pad all the way to the back. So we're going to see that being more of an air game for Mayton. But as of right now, I really like the approach from Zeke Lau. I think the change to the other one, the one that he's riding, just a bit thicker, a bit wider, as you're seeing his back board on the beach. It's just a bit narrower, so kind of for better waves. But as of right now, I actually think this played out the way I was thinking it too. I think Zeke was going to start off really well and then pressure Aton to make those mistakes. Wow, thank you for all of that insight, Mitchell. That was that was a whole lot from the surfers deck. Mitchell Salas are breaking it down. Score in for Ezekiel Lau during that breakdown. A 6.27 for the last for Lau. He's out in the lead. Osborne now needs a six-point ride to take that lead off of Ezekiel Lau. Eitan Osborne does have the advantage of having the single highest wave score with that 6.77, Peter. Yeah, and... Uh that's what it keeps it pretty even, Steven. But I, I love it. Eitan's approach personally. I think that that's what he saw big numbers come for. That's what he's known for. Uh, that's what he wants to do out there is perform uh, above the lip. And I expect it to. Uh, and there's a great. Well, let's take a look at the backup board for Ezekiel Lau. We're going to wait for that because Eitan Osborne setting up for an air, looking for a ramp down the line. And you could see the te him telegraphing that maneuver. However, that wave did not have an adequate cup to it. Yeah, it didn't. It, it unfortunately, he had to like almost move across a little wedge to get there. And uh, that's un uh, unfortunate because I know Aton, that's what he's looking at. He wants to find that ramp and he's so good in the air. He's got such a mixed bag of all different types of grabs, rotations. Yeah, clearly showing his attentions here. Osborne again. Flat face wave there does not offer a ramp. Continue to surf under the priority of Ezekiel Lau's Lau with heat control. He's got the lead as well as priority, so he wants to better his score line, and he can do that by just topping a 6.27. There's the backup to Coral of Ezekiel Lau, Peter. Yeah, and you can see there the, the measurements, 19 and 8. It's actually, I think, uh, this, this board here said 19. Uh, the yellow one has 19, so it's slightly narrower, actually. Osborne tap and then throws it up in the air. Does not revert out of that. So well done. Didn't really try to do the connection there. The wave did dissipate underneath his feet. We'll see if that improves on the three point ride that Aton currently has in his score line. However, doubtful that he's going to get that six. Yeah, I would say that he understood that the, the fact that he went to layback to pull it off. Ezekiel Lau throws it again, and that one was looked like a disastrous landing. Uh, that's the kind of landing that yeah, puts knees and ankles into jeopardy, Pete. It sure does. But uh, no worries there. You can see he was able to slip off there. But yeah, I think Aton understood that the fact that he went to layback, and again, he knows by all those video clips, you know, when you start to go those A-plus bangers, you don't go to layback afterwards. Uh, and so Aton, you know, he knew it. The judges will know it. The score will reflect it. Even though it's a beautiful little air, the fact that he went to uh, the layback here, right in that moment, it factors into the score. It's like uh, in snowboarding where you butt check, you know, on an air and land, it's going to factor into the score. You want to pull it off clean and keeping yourself uh, on top of your board. Yeah, or skateboarding if you put a hand down. Uh, speaking of skateboarding, we got the uh, showdown that's going to happen later this afternoon after the surf competition is, is concluded. The Vans showdown at the Vans Skate Park right here at the Vans U.S. Open of Surfing. So action-packed day at the world's largest action sports festival. And I think the best part about all of that is that uh, it starts after 
this finishes. Yes. So literally, you can go uh, watch the finals, watch the post show, head over there, and end up watching the skate right in there. So it's just yeah. nonstop action. Nonstop action. You can catch it at Vans US Open of Surfing com. Stay tuned. We'll be back with the conclusion of semifinal number one, and we'll find out who's going to be in the finals here at the Vans US Open. My job is professional surfer. My goal is to win titles. That's what I'm here for. The world's best surfers in the world's best waves. We've had a shark attack. Whoa. It's the most intense surfing scenario you can imagine. I have to step up my game now and not make any mistakes. Oh my god. <laughs> this is a war. You have to find a way to win it and do it at all costs. If you haven't watched it yet, you gotta check out Make or Break on Apple Plus TV. It is the diaries, behind the scene diaries of the 2021 Championship Tour. Seven episodes in that series and uh, some great dramatic moments. It's not all, you know, barrels and high fives on the Championship Tour, is it, Peter? There's some of that though, which is cool. But yeah, it's more about the, the stuff that happens behind the scenes, the emotion that happens behind the scenes. Well, sometimes, you know, surfers, like, heads get a little bit, you, you get flustered. And this happened during the break. Interesting for Aton Osborne to even go on that wave. It didn't seem like there was much. It's for sure there wasn't a six-point line. I'm going to defend that back. He's trying to move away from Zeke. Zeke's going to stay right next to him and, like, you know, try and move it. Maybe he gets the inside connection. He's able to skirt out and get away. Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, maybe it definitely wasn't going to be adding points to his total, but no, more. But maybe a change in the energy. Uh, yeah, I, right? I see That's, where you're going. Yeah, just in, in regards to just you know stepping away from from Zeke breathing down your neck. <laughs> yeah, well, if we really look at this matchup, uh, both Aton as well as Zeke Lau likely to be in the top ten on the rankings once we fit, conclude this event. So this is a great, great opportunity for both of these surfers in the search to be a part of the cast of the 2023 championship tour. Using his priority, Ezekiel Lau winds up off the bottom, 12 o'clock, rings the lunch bell on that first backhand re-entry. And now, once more, has to push that to Coral through the flat section. And the board just looking lively under his feet as he skips back and forth into the shore break, doubles it up throws the fins and slaps the hands saying, give me the score. I want something better than a 6.27. Do you well, think he I, did that, Peter? Yeah, and just in regards to a, a much more difficult maneuver and going straight up on the very first turn in the lip. So again, an adjustment by Zeke Lau to try and, and get those judges' attention. He would have understood that Aton was able to do it with one turn on that outside to get his best number. Yeah, but look out, here comes Aton Osborne, looking down the line, hooks it one time, a little caught up on that first turn, and now 
Uh, has to kick out, likely be able to regain priority because that wave just, you know, dissipated yeah, right at his feet. That was unfortunate because that was a, a bigger wave, right? And you think, oh, yeah, it's going to be the bigger wave. It's going to have the extra energy, but sometimes it just shoulders off, and that's exactly what that wave did. Whereas this one had a little bit of extra punch, a little double up to it. And uh, using that size to his advantage, able to accelerate up and into the lip. And then, of course, going to get that finish, showing those fins out the back. So a little extra punch there. Feels like it could be a slight improvement for Ezekiel Lau. Waiting for the number, and we're going to see what the situation is. Aton Osborne was able to maintain priority, so the surfer out of Ventura, California, out the back and just waiting for a set. At the moment, he needs a six-point ride, and we look at Ezekiel Lau's year so far on the Challenger Series. Really only one keeper result. That was at the beginning of the year at Snapper Rocks at the Boost Mobile. Gold Coast Pro, that ninth place finish, that would be a keeper, wouldn't it? Be? It would be, especially when you add it to this uh, semifinal, at least, right? Um, you know, it almost averages out at the quarterfinals, which is exactly what you want to do. You want to kind of have that average of court quarterfinals. That's going to keep you in the top 10 picture. Uh, it'll add, um, you know, this is especially uh, important for him if he to get into the final. Yeah, let's talk about points. That equal ninth finish is 3,320 points. Ezekiel Lau with his performance here is guaranteed 6,085 points. Taking a look here at Evan Geiselman dashing to the shore. He's going to be semifinal number two against an extremely impressive Brazilian surfer in the way of Joao Chianca. So another great matchup. Going back to the scores, Pete, 6.17 for the last ride of Ezekiel Lau does not change the situation in the water. Aton Osborne still searching for that six-point ride. Well. Here's, here's Aton's year so far on the Challenger Series. He f did not go to Australia for those first two events. Came into the series at the Belito Pro in South Africa where he earned himself a ninth place finish. Yeah, well, it wasn't that he did. He, he's basically coming in as a you know replacement, right? It's like he kind of earned his way. But this result here is going to pretty much, you would today, the Tours and Competitions Office are going to take note of that. He most likely will get a start in Aracera because uh, of this performance here. Shumbinho. Joao Chianca coming up in the next heat. And contrast, we saw Evan Geiselman sprinting down to the water, and we saw Joao Chianca with a slow roll. Saving his energy, man. But you, you, once he hits the water, watch out. Like, that's his, his deal. Like, you watch him he, when he doesn't have to use energy, like in his interviews, and he just kind of talks a very, uh, you know, slow pace. But shoot, once he gets in the water, watch out. Three minutes, 20 seconds, counting down, and the clock has been winding down for Aton Osborne, holding on to his priority. Looks like he may be interested in this wave. He says no, nope. Zeke says no, and they noticed that that wave quality was poor, it just closed out. Well, this one felt like it just flew by, especially, I probably think for Aton, he's like, darn it, you know, and it, hopefully he's not thinking about that one uh, backside air because if that he pulls that one down um, you know that ends up being a big number you can see there's a distinct uh, amplitude difference in uh, that's the one thing that I think that Aton has he has great pop oh incredible pop that he's able to do you know a lot of times I mean he came from a pretty brilliant pro junior career an amateur career um, and then I feel he broke away for a while just to be a free surfer especially doing all those projects with Chapter 11 TV and Dane Reynolds, but now um, he's got his comp hat on. He's 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 a brilliant competitor as well. Yeah, he sure is. Um, you know, he did win in Israel actually. Um, he won a 3,000, I would say four years, five years ago uh, on the QS. He's actually a runner-up to the World Junior to Mateus Herdy. So yeah, he competitively he has had a decorated career. Um, it's just a matter of putting a whole season together and consistently putting results together. And he's on his way now with that ninth in Belito and this at least a third here. Quiet ocean, quiet times, one minute and 50 seconds, scanning the horizon for any sign of a set coming through and an opportunity Ooh, for be something there, though. Aton Osborne. This is those moments. Yeah, priority, there's 140 to go. Got the entire beach staring at you. Zeke snuggling up on him just to keep him honest and make sure that when a wave does come that he's, you know, kind of forced into it in a way because Zeke will take it if Aton turns it up. 
That wave's not going to break on the sandbar. Ooh, that was a tough one. And now he looks out the back and it goes quiet again. One minute and 13 seconds. Here's our schedule for the year on the Challenger Series. We're at stop number four, Vans US Open of Surfing. Following this, October, we're going to be heading off to Portugal, then to Brazil in November, and then ending up at the Haleiwa Challenger, November 26th through December 7th. And that's when we're going to find out who made the cut. Here we go. Osborne throws a little kind of a, almost a disco spin right there. Back Needs the inside, though, here, Kaipo. I believe it. And they're looking for the inside. Hopping through this section here. Oh, uh -oh. no. This uh -oh. wave Increased is not out. going to cooperate at all. Watch it. He's going to go, bro. He's got it. Oh, that no, wave it's not going to cooperate. Yeah. That's, uh, oh. <laughs> See, there's a the frustration. He can do nothing. I mean, you uh. saw that wave just double tripling up on itself. All kinds of steps in there, taking away a lot of power in that wave. A little frustration for Aton Osborne, um, but he's got to hang his head high. Equal third. That's his. You already throwing it down? He's not going to get the score? A six point ride for that. Do you think so? Oh, uh, no. I'm just saying <laughs> you're, you're putting yourself out there slightly, but uh, I, I, there I it is. Came a, a point shy. Yeah. 4.57. Point and a half shy. Yeah. Yeah, he needed that inside. That's what he needed, unfortunately, there, but a, an incredible performance for Aton. Fun to watch. But look out for this guy. He's got the eye of the tiger. Ezekiel Lau is heading on into the finals. We return with semifinal number two here at the Vans US Open of surfing. Here we go, surf fans, semi-final heat number two, live from Huntington Beach, California. The south side of the pier is the scene of all the action. Chris Cote here with Surfing Hall of Famer, Pete Mel. Pete, I had the chance to go across the street and put my hands in your hands, and, and your hands are much bigger than <laughs> yeah, mine. Yeah, so I got that. a few, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Congratulations again. Yeah, thank you. Hall of Famer right there. We're speaking of Hall of Fame. Ezekiel Lau is getting closer and closer to an accolade like that, surfing his way through a hard-charging eight-ton Osborne to become our first finalist of the 2022 Vans US Open of Surfing. A huge result already for Ezekiel Lau and for Aton Osborne, semi-final finish, that's an absolute keeper. Now we look at semi-final heat number two, another great matchup, Evan Geisman going up against Jiao Chianka. We've got the Goofy versus regular, USA versus Brazil. 
And uh, both these surfers, you know, want it more than anything. Let's start with Evan Geiselman. Yeah, the goofy footer is going to go above the lip, which we saw already. And he's been doing that all event long. Just the quick little tail reverse rotation earns a 4.5. He's riding his dad's board, Greg Geiselman model, Orion surfboards. This one's an EPS, uh, what, 510? You know, that, not a lot of measurements on the bottom of uh, Evan's board. Pretty cool, though. Father, son, shaper. It's combo. epic. Epic. 510, 18.7, 2.28. So just a little slightly bigger than two and a quarter. That's probably two inches shorter than he is. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just checking out the curve on the bottom. Um, you know, three fin, a little squash tail, uh, some definite concave in there with a little curve out the tail. Made for uh, this type of conditions right here, especially with the EPS which means that uh, the styrofoam core with uh, epoxy glassing, where in contrast, Shianka, he's going to be on his PU. He's the board, same board he was riding yesterday. It's a CI Pro that was developed by Britt Merrick and uh, Parker Coffin and a lot of the whole CI team. But this board has been uh, very nice for Jao Shianka. And not for professionals only, right? No, not at all. But it is an advanced board. It's got a lot of curve in it, uh, deeper concaves. So there's a, a definite bunch of stuff going on in there. It's definitely high performance. 25.30 on the clock. Jao Chianka came into this event as a, a name that most people had on the top of their mind in terms of who would go deep in this event, and he's proving everybody right. Uh, he's had up and down finishes in this contest, but none of those matter. As long as you advance through your heats, you know, you, you find yourself here in the business end of it. He's had dominant performances. He's had squeak through heats. Uh, right now, he's uh, starting off going up against Evan Geisman, who just dropped a 4.5 uh, in the last heat. Totals were very close. 12.77 for Lau, 11.34 for Osborne. Now, of course, the conversation goes to performance versus power. Uh, you have to mix both things. Can you win this whole event with a big air? Sure. Gonna see? Yeah, I mean, but you'd also do it with two huge power hooks, too. I mean, you got to be able to do it all. Uh, and Shianka, he can. You know, looking at his results from uh, the beginning of the season have been great. To be honest, this is going to be his best result. So, uh, you know, he's been really kind of feeling from the moment, just came out of nowhere to get himself onto the championship tour. Had some amazing heats, some of the best heats that we saw at the beginning of the season. Didn't beat the mid-season cut. Yeah, he was Gets put onto the Challenger Series and uh, has been having a frustration go. But now, finally, comes into his own. He's into the semifinals. This could be a huge result for him. And that's where we expect him to be, is back onto the championship tour. Just because his surfing has been so exciting, so raw, so new. Uh, it's been fun to watch. Um, confused when I look at the results that he has had on the Challenger Series. He's better on the Championship Tour than he has been on the Challenger Series. Yeah, Why I mean, we, we just remember what we did at Pipeline. I mean, the heat against John John, uh, incredible. Some of the best surfing we've seen him. So he, he's able to do it all. Like, that's what I, I value, at least in surfing, is being able to go out there at 10-foot pipe and stick yourself underneath the ledge and get barreled completely and then go surf one and a half foot to two foot Huntington Beach and excite the crowd being so well-rounded uh, and if you want to be a world champion those are the elements you need to have being able to do it all we got 23 15 on the clock Geiselman in red Chianka in a blue with priority surfers waiting for the next set wave to come through let's go to the glass Louisa Florence standing by with Ezekiel Lau Ziki, you were telling me yesterday that you had some time to rest, and we also know that your dad is a football coach, that you also like, you know, put drills in your mind. Mm -hmm. Did you um, trace this statistics for today? Uh, not really. I mean, <laughs> the only thing I like was foreseeing was like I wanted to ride the yellow board, but it's an epoxy and you know, the conditions got to be right. It's got to be pretty clean and, you know, not too much bumps in the face. And, you know, I pulled up this morning. I was like, oh, I think today is the day. And I was just really excited to ride that board. And, um, you know, we're in the semis. I'm here to win today. And, you know, I'm just going to have that attitude going in every heat. 
What's so, sp so special about that board, besides the color, of course? <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's the most colorful board I have, but uh, it just works really good. It's just one of those magic boards. Uh, you know, the first session I ever had on it, I knew, I was like, wow, this is a really good board. I got to put it away. And, you know, this whole contest, I wrote it the first day, and, you know, the waves got really big, so I couldn't ride it, and I was just waiting. Like, yesterday, I was like, should I ride it or no? And uh, I held off, and, you know, today's the perfect day for it. So I'm, I'm happy, and, you know, I'm just stoked to be here on finals day and get to surf. Amazing. Congratulations. Yeah. We'll see you at the finals. Thank you so much. Yeah. See you guys. A huge result already for Ezekiel Lau. We know this is a surfer that loves to compete, that loves to win. And just judging by the way he surfed in that semifinal, he is going to be an absolute threat in about an hour when we run the finals here at the Vans US Open of Surfing for our Challenger Series. And then it's going to be really fun to talk about the ratings, talk about that top 10, which has completely been reworked since Monday. So uh, after this event, it's going to be a more clearer picture as to who are the favorites heading towards the 2023 championship tour. Just looking at Jiao Shanka, and uh, we had the water temp drop pretty significantly um, overnight from what the surfers are telling us. Uh, you know, if you head out to the island straight out of here, it's probably 65 degrees out there. But for whatever reason, there's these fingers of cold water that are uh, in this little bay in Long Beach. I mean, the Long Beach buoy has 60 degree water, which uh, for this time of year, that's chilly. Uh, usually you're seeing it around 65 degrees and almost upwards into the 70, 67. Um, and it hasn't warmed up. So there's these fingers of cold water, which is great for fishing. But, uh, you know, wearing a spring suit, the reason why I bring this up is because you can see he's been lifting his feet out. He hasn't ridden any waves yet. So I'm wondering if that colder water will factor in. Although I think uh, the blood is boiling right now because he sees an opportunity coming to the lineup. We have 2019, and it looks like Jiao Chianka having a good look at this wave, and he is engaged. Here we go, Jiao Chianka on his backhand, looking for a section. Gets a nice turn to start this wave. Quick foam snap right there. Now he's going to do everything he can to make the transition from the outside to the inside. Does it with ease. Could be looking at a weird little double up here for Jiao Chianka. That was a tough, tough section to hit. I wouldn't say it was the most dynamic finish, but he did the job. So that will be his first wave ridden. Jiao Chianka now on the board. He surfed that wave to the potential of the score there. I believe two turns on that outside section. Very solid, he kept his flow, kept the speed going. Nice snap, straight up. And uh, again, redirects off there. He really tried to punch the foam. And then, of course, this connection is so important just to really solidify the score. He found the energy bubble, stayed with it. You know, this unfortunately was where it doubled up underneath him, so he just kind of had to almost force this turn, but he got it done and rides out of it clean. So yeah, again, two turns outside with a finish on the inside. Now Evan, see what he can do. Putting that styrofoam core, didn't like the way that first turn was, so he's gonna keep that priority. So we'll see where this uh, Jiao Shanka score is coming. Oh, halfway out, just decides to turn and burn. That wave won't be a factor. Still waiting for his first score to come through. Guy Swimming, meanwhile, most likely getting something around the three range. Just a quick one turn, and he got out. So I, I like that these surfers are, you know, having uh, kind of that presence of mind to test a few of these waves. Priority hasn't really come into play much yet in this heat, but you know, as we get down to that three, four minute mark, that priority is going to be looming large in uh, both of these surfers' minds. Uh, I think Jiao figuring out that uh, there was uh, maybe some lulls going to happen. He just like literally turned around, turned to Burns just to back up the number that he just received. Playing field's pretty wide, uh, but so far today we've seen most surfers sitting kind of in the same zone. It's not quite Pierbold, not quite Rob's Reef. It's kind of just right there square in the middle. Uh, for conditions like we have today, uh, you know, that, that transition from the outside to the inside we saw earlier in duct tape competition wasn't, you know, hugely important in terms of your end score. But do you think that inside section here as we get to the semifinals and finals and Challenger Series surfing will have a little bit more more weight on the score? It's, I mean, when you think about Huntington Beach and you think about, you know, solidifying a score or getting scores at Huntington, yeah, I think the inside is important. Um, 
It hasn't been throughout this event, though, you know, I think because uh, when the swell's a little bit bigger, the, the critical sections are from the outside. So Jiao forcing a turn right there. Quick snap again. So that was just incredibly done for such a tough wave to surf. He's got some energy coming through to the inside. Here we go. Building up speed, coiling, sees the section. Blast the fins out, cannot ride out. That was going to be a pretty wild finish. That whole wave was working against Jiao the whole time. He had some nice reactions out the back. And now here we go, Geisman sees the section. Freeze the fins. Quick front side air reverse, spins it around, lets those three fins engage to whip his board around. Nice control, nice speed, but only a one turn wave. Remember, he got a 4-5 on the first wave that was kind of similar to that, so we'll see where the judges go. They do want to see you mix up your maneuvers, but of course, you also have to surf with what the ocean provides for you. Taking a look here at first at Joao's wave, uh, the bottom turn, he got a little stuck, so it's limited his speed, didn't get the squirt through the concave. I love how he made it to the inside here, and I think that he wanted to make this a big turn, knowing that he didn't quite get the connection on the outside section. This one had a little double up on it, and a little extra energy when you have a double up. It almost feels like they're combining two swells at once right on the top of the sandbar there. So it looked like this was going to be a pretty good way, but it used all its energy and then went into the dip, deep spot and had nothing, no bubble to get him back to the inside. So just another one turn wave. Yeah, that wave just completely disappeared under Geisman's feet. It was good enough for a 3.33. Now all of these surfers know they have to come down to the Van Gios Open of Surfing fully prepared for any types of condition from one foot to 10 foot. Mitchell Salazar is in the VIP zone with some board talk. Yeah, Chris, just looking at Evan Geisman's backup board, this was actually a mayhem driver. It was originally made by Mick for Mick Fanning and Evan was able to get this back up over at Lost with Gian Bernini riding his dad shape out in the water right now. But that 510 driver, not only one of the best sports he's had, but he also said that Mick didn't like it as much because he wasn't surfing beach break conditions like today. Fortunately, you know that somebody from New Smyrna Beach, Florida knows all about surfing conditions like here at Southside HB. But talking about more about Evan is that he's a second generation professional surfer. Both his dad, a shaper now, and his mom, Gina, have been professional surfers. So is his older brother, one of the best free surf in the, in the world, E.G. Eric Eisenman. The Eisenman family, they all rip. And Evan definitely has a uh, trophy room that is absolutely packed. I mean, multi-time East Coast champion. He's had a ton of big results on the QS. And now it's about the Challenger Series for Evan Geisman. What do you think his chances are of uh, making his way under the championship tour for 2023, Pete? I, I, I've always liked his chances. Um, you know, it, it's competing is, is so tough psychologically because there's a lot more losing than there is winning. Um, he's going to carry this result and carry some momentum. He's got himself a full-time start on the Challenger Series throughout the season, uh, but this by far his best result. So he did have priority at this wave. He's able to hold off Chianka. Quick snap there, and that wave just did not pan out. So it looked like a, a slight frustration there for Evan Geisman, but you got to keep going. You got to keep pushing. And both these surfers know full well the ramifications here. You make it out of this heat, you're in the finals. 13.50 to go, Chianka on top for now. You're watching the Vans US Open of Surfing Challenger Series semifinals. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to the 2022 Vans US Open of Surfing. It is a Sunday finals day here at Huntington Beach. This is the tunnel walk, if you will, for the surfers. They've parted the crowd to make sure that the athletes can get to and from the water as quickly, as efficiently as possible, which as you can see, quite the task. There are so many people out here on the beach. They're stoked. Last semifinal heat in the water. And then you guys, we got finals coming up next. Thank you, AJ. We are fired up. And check out the scene on the sand. All these seats, they are free to anyone. You still got time if you want to make your way down here quick. Our finals will be coming up momentarily. And this is going to be a really fun, unique day of surfing because we do have longboarding and shortboarding, males and females, taken to this lineup. And uh, we're going to really start to see uh, what the rest of the year is going to look like just in terms of who will be on top of the Challenger Series rankings as well as the WSL Longboard Tour rankings. Everything will change in about an hour. And our, our mathematicians behind the scenes will have their work cut out for them today as there's a lot of shifting around on all of the rankings. Don't forget the Skate Showdown. I know oh, yeah. that you'll be heading over there after this uh, to check it out right on the sands of HB. Can you believe it? I went over there and there's a, they have a bunch of different skate companies that made kind of their own obstacles, quasi hockey uh, and, a, and a handful more. And I'll tell you, it looks really fun. It looks warm. These guys and gals are flying around over there. So that is gonna happen right after the presentation here. So uh, our master of ceremonies, Kaipo Guerrero, will be probably running over to the uh, skate park after the uh, ceremony as well. Van Showdown starts at 3 p.m. It will be on vansusopenofsurfing.com. And I'm sure all your favorite skate Instagram sites will be showing you highlights of that as well. 10 minutes to go now. He's starting to feel the tension build in the lineup. Evan Geiselman just keeps throwing punches at these uh, small, I would call those jabs, right? They're not super effective. You get enough of those, you might get lucky, but right now they're all coming through at that you know, two, 1.5 range. And are those waves gonna help him in the long run? Well, I, like I mentioned, it's a little chillier. So yeah, staying warm, staying in the groove, uh, you know, part of it also kind of making Joao think a little bit, right? Right. You know, make, psychologically is like, you know, cause you're all sitting with priority and knowing full well that he needs to better the three, four, three, just to find a match to the six, one, seven. As a matter of fact, he was looking for something in the excellent range. And there has been a slow, slowness in the, uh, conditions with as far as consistency goes I mean we uh, have had a change with the wind swell kind of coming up so we've got this like eight second four foot three foot wind swell that's coming through the channels in between us and the Channel Islands which has actually kind of helped with the consistency there is still the trickling south you look at other buoys there's some 15 14 second interval out of that 200 degree stuff so that's probably the major sets but you know again the consistency is a lot less of those waves it's cool that they named that island chain after that surfboard company. Here goes Evan Geiselman speeding down the line, looking for a section. Will he find it? He does. Goes to the air, a tail high front side whip for Evan Geiselman. Now that's more like it. So sometimes you throw enough jabs, you land a big one. Out the back, Chianka now. Geiselman with the big finish. And another, the crowd going wild. The East Coast are representing New Smyrna Beach, Florida, followed by Sakurama's own Jao Chianka, who will get his finish on the sand. That is exactly the kind of exchange we wanted to see. The judges now head down, pen to paper. Who are they going to get the edge to in that one? That's the Geisman camp mixed uh, with the Chianka camp. This is awesome. It is so cool. It really is. Uh, that was a great exchange. I mean, Evan's going to get his best wave. And also, Joao, this was a little challenging wave. This one looked like it was going to shut down, but he floats over it, carries a ton of speed, and then goes up and over. Makes sure that he's going to get the inside section, and he gets another two turns on the inside. So this almost feels like Joao's going to improve. He'll improve on the 3.43, but this is an important exchange at this point in the heat. Watch this, though. The tail high. Frontside air gets the grab. Rotates out of it nice and clean, too. No stalls out of it. And he gets two turns on the shore as well. 
Wow, this is going to be a great exchange. And uh, you know, where he's splicing hairs, who's going to get the better of this exchange? And it's important. Kaiserman, in my opinion, I feel like the, uh, dynamic, like the, air. the dynamics out the back meshed with that you know, redirection. He went vertical, added that third snap, very Rob Machado-esque on that inside section. I don't know, it just felt like it was cleaner, faster. You know, the flow was there. Chianca, he had to, I think, work just a little bit harder to get up to the sections that he was going to, but he had a strong finish as well. I think it's going to be close, but I think the edge is going to go towards Evan Geiselman just due to the, uh, I don't know, the, the, the radical approach that he had, especially on the outside. Innovation and progression, definitely part of the criteria. I do like the fact that Evan Geisman actually got a little more loft and a little more amplitude in his air out there, comparatively to say the 4-5 the and the 3-3-3 three, three, three that he had earlier, which were both airs as well. But that one there, he had a, a bit more of a pop, got the uh, tail up high, like you had mentioned. So definitely the best air of the heat. I almost feel like Josh Yonka, though, he got two big turns on the outside, so we'll see what the judges think. I mean, uh, two turns on the outside, two turns on the inside. Evan had the big air, and then the two turns on the inside. Man, it's just, uh, again, splicing hairs, and I think that that's just why we'll see that there might be some time, because um, there is going to be some review of these last two A's, because they're going back to back, too. So as a judge, you're watching, trying to watch both, and you kind of almost miss a little bit if you're going to be watching, kind of, you know, watching one surfer and then going out to the outside, because you are kind of almost one eye on one server and one eye on the other. Well, then you can the, go with the review. We have the best judges in the business. They're from all over the world. They're all great surfers. They're surf fans themselves. The only difference between them and us is we get super excited when we see surfing like that. They, they study it, they research it, they go back and forth. They're able to, you know, really put a lot of thought into every second of every wave. So the first score comes through for Evan Geiselman. It's a biggie. Six, eight, seven, the highest single wave score of this heat yet. With five minutes to go, score being locked in for Chianka. Will it match Evan Geiselman's? It does. A six, four, seven. Chianka now back in the lead. Evan Geiselman needing a 5.77. It was pretty much what we thought it would be, a very close call. Chianka with the power, Evan with the progression. I love both of those scores. I think the judges nailed it. How clear, clear is this? Is that it's actually unclear because it's <laughs> so close. That's the word I was looking for. It is. It's so close. Right now, the early lead to Joao because he has the, the best of the backups. But uh, the 687 is important for Evan Geiselman because he doesn't need too much. Only a 577 will turn it for him with four minutes to go. And he has priority. See, he won the paddle race to get back out. Yeah, my eyes were kind of uh, transfixed on Zhao Chianka's 6-1-7, that first score that he got. Uh, that right now could be the difference maker because you're looking at Geiselman's first wave. It was a 4.5. So uh, it's going to be a battle of the backups. Here goes Chianka. He goes to the air, whips it around. And can he ride out? He does, showing that that was a completed air. It wasn't super high. It was a little messy, but it was definitely progressive and uh, not easy to do. That was not an air section, and somehow he was still able to ollie and just pop it right off that little piece of white water. And will it replace a 647 or a 617? Most likely not, but it was pretty cool to watch. No, it just showcases the fact that he does have that in his repertoire. You know, and if he were to get one of those little pure bowl rights, you would expect that he will do exactly that. Very exciting surfer in all types of conditions. Yeah, as we're getting down to the wire now, three minutes to go. So Evan Geiselman is out the back with priority. Now this is one of those instances where that's a lot of time and it's also a little bit of time because with priority, not only do you have your pick of waves, but you can also defend a little bit, but you can't defend too much to where you lose that priority. So uh, what do you think is going through the mind of young Evan Geisman right now with 2.44 to go? He's got his pick of waves. It's not super consistent. Does he fend off Chianka or does he just try to dig deep and find something and activate? Well, he's got to activate. He's uh, behind at this point. He needs to turn this heat. He was uh, right now. His thinking is send me an opportunity. Send me a nice set wave. And at that point, he'll get one chance with 2.20 to go, he's only gonna get his one chance. And so this is that, you know, again, that drill where there's that moment. 
You're at the semifinals of the Vans US Open. You have priority. You need a 5-7-7. And we, you know, we build up these moments. You want that buzzer beater. That's what he's thinking right now. Uh, as soon as I get that opportunity, I am going to execute. You know, luck is a factor in a lot of these heats and timing. You know, what is the ocean going to provide? Now we're seeing some activity out the back. A minute 50 to go. Chianka in the lead. It's slight. Evan Geisman only needs a 5-7-7. We've got a set coming through just this in time. Here we go, under the two-minute warning. Chianka and Geisman both looking closely at this wave. Geisman has priority, so he is going to go left. Here we go, Evan Geisman, New Smyrna Beach. Quick snap there, getting around this section. Throws the tail on the closeout, <laughs> and he's able to maintain control, still surfing his way towards the beach. Can he make that transition to the sand? Pumping that board for all it's worth, trying to fight into the shore break. He's gonna get it, it might not be much, but still a completed <laughs> wave to the sand for Evan Geiselman. Clutch surfing right there. Pete Mel, he needed a 5-7-7. Seven, seven. He didn't make it abundantly clear to the judges, but I think it's gonna be close. What do you think? In his eyes, he felt like the two turns on the outside were enough. Well, it's up to the judges. I mean, I feel like it's close. It, it not, it, not super clear cut, especially since we didn't get that inside as much as we would have liked to. If he, you know, for my eyes, if he really solidified, it would have been, yeah, he gets a nice solid turn on the inside section. He didn't get that, but there was those two turns on the outside. The snap, more of a, an acceleration snap, almost trying to keep his speed, but he really laid into the final maneuver here. Uh, and he got the opportunity. And, you know, and no mistakes here. This way, snapping it there, didn't really lay into it because he knew he needed to keep the speed for that final section and then gets the punch. And that was a little claim thinking, yep, the drill already. The fin drift, it adds some dynamics to it. It adds difficulty. You know, it's progressive. He did it with flow. Uh, this is going to be the longest wait of Evan Geiselman's life right here, waiting to see if the judges give him the nod. Uh, I feel like he couldn't have done anything more on that wave. The inside kind of died out in the shore break, so he didn't have an opportunity for a big finish. But now the question comes, did Evan Geisman do enough? That wave right there after the buzzer, non-factor. So now it all comes down to the people upstairs. What are they going to give Evan Geisman on that last wave? Uh, and again, he's thinking it's only a 5.77. So comparison-wise, the very first wave, of Joao Shanka, the 6-1-7. I guess that's kind of the closest score we could kind of figure out. He did have the inside on that one. So a little different, but uh, man, I, it's close. It really is. Yeah, if, uh, if we were playing, if this was professional baseball or football, we'd be watching replay after replay. The referees would be huddling up, trying to figure it out. But right now, it's all up to our judges. Evan Geiselman not only getting the wave right in the nick of time, but also able to hold Jao Chianka off that wave. You could tell Jao was looking at that right, but it almost looked like Evan was just in such a prime position that uh, there was nowhere for Jao to go, and he couldn't really battle too much because he didn't have priority. And just to give the folks at home a little bit of an understanding of what's happening in this situation is, is that they're looking at their best scores right now, so they're reviewing them right now. They'll be going back to back, so they can actually give an understanding. Is it enough to turn the heat? Oh, wow, look, at there's two on and two off right now. It's going down to one score. And here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, and heartbreak. It's literally. Heartbreak. Point one zero under oh man a heartbreaking finish for evan Crazy. geiselman he needed a five seven seven oh he's a, it was a five he's dirty. Six, seven well the thrill of victory the agony of defeat i mean that has happened to evan geiselman too many times in his young career but you know what the good news is a semi-final finish in a challenger series event is huge Congratulations, Jiao Chianka, a finalist. We'll be right back. More finals action coming up next.
Just when you thought it was safe to start your Sunday chores, think again. More finals action coming right up. And here is your second finalist at the Vans US Open of Surfing. Our Challenger Series finals for the men is set. It'll be Jiao Chianka going up against Ezekiel Lau. What a matchup we have in store. That'll be right around the corner. But right now, it's all about Vans Duct Tape Invitational. Chris Cote with Shannon Hughes. And I'll tell you, the excitement levels are at an all-time high. We just saw a down-to-the-wire semifinal. And guess what? The, edge of, the edges of your seat, wherever you're watching from, are about to be worn out. You're in for a wild ride. Duct tape finals coming right up. Oh, that last semifinal was nuts to see Joao Chianca take it out. I'm so proud of him for making it through. So tight for Evan Geiselman. That was ridiculous. But now we've got this amazing matchup for our first final of the day here for the Vans Duct Tape Invitation with Honolulu Bloomfield and Kalis Kaleopa'a. And this is one of those matchups of the Titans. You know, Honolulu Bloomfield with multiple world championships is up and riding now. Oh, Kalis Kaleopa'a in the red jersey. I both these surfers with such beautiful styles. I mean, I, I feel like this is a really great matchup. They're so similar in so many ways. Uh, both obviously hungry for a win, as you see. Elise right there gets five over the nose and she's gonna ride this one all the way to the beach so no problem with the transition there. I think things are changing a little bit uh, as we get through the day here. Uh, Huntington Beach is providing, and we saw a lot of waves ridden in that last heat. I think this heat is gonna go down to the last three or four seconds as well. I it definitely is going to. They've also got that extra five minutes on the clock, which is great heading into finals competition. The conditions are shaping up to be so beautiful out here today. That wind is still holding off. It's not glassy anymore, but that true onshore hasn't quite hit yet, at least for the women's duct tape final. And that's what we want to see. Nice, clean waves like this. Here is your three-time world longboard champion, Honolulu Bloomfield, doing what she does best, walking to the nose, finishing it off with a beautiful carve. Now she's fading right scanning what's in front of her doing some work there you go cross stepping another hang five Ooh, and she gets worked on the inside section you saw her running back to the tail really the only way you're going to be able to ride down a steep section like that is to jump back on the tail these boards have no rocker <laughs> they're not forgiving in tight closed out sections so honolulu bloomfield did most of the work out the back wasn't a clean finish, so we'll see how that wave translates to the eyes of the judges. Kalis Kaleopa'a is looking at a great start, but let's take a look back at Honolulu Bloomfield's first wave. Honolulu getting off on an early start, got that nice nose ride to kick it off, and a little cut back into the foam. This wave, not hugely critical, it goes for that switch stance approach, which Honolulu is probably the best of in the women's side of the field. She's, she's really been perfecting that over the last few years. It's been a specific part of her repertoire that she's wanted to bring into the game and practice on. And then Kalis got, got this for her opening ride. Beautiful footwork, style, grace, elegance, all coming through in the young competitor and sets herself up now for a really nice finish as well. So she got the work done that she needed to out the back, which the judges are gonna love. And then a nice critical in the pocket nose ride, beautiful rail work as well, and just stays silky smooth as she comes through to the inside section. That'll be the best of the exchange that we've seen so far. We get to take one more look at this one. That was a nice critical hang five from Hono. 
and then that nice carve redirects here and this is the really important thing these women have been watching the conditions all day and they've already surfed so they understand how important it is to find that inside reform and it's looking a little bit easier than it did earlier today an uncharacteristic fall from the always steady honolua bloomfield on the finish to me that was something that she would kind of be kicking herself with for just a moment she's got heaps of time on the clock but had she been able to finish off that in section she'd be looking at a decent score well Kalis Kaleopa out with a big number to start a six six seven uh, how the situation stands right now not uh not exactly how uh, on paper it is because Honolulu Bloomfield has a five that's a solid number but she's backed it up with a three eight five and we saw in that last heat you know, backup scores become so important, not only for momentum through the heat, but of course in the end result, you do not want to leave it up to the judges in the dying seconds. You do not want to make them think too hard. Give yourself those opportunities early and start strong like Kalise did. Uh, at the moment, even though technically she's on top, Honolulu Bloomfield is now playing catch up. Yeah, she's got a little bit of work to do. That 6 6 seven is gonna set her up really well. Honolulu, the three-time world champion, she won in 2017 and then consecutive back-to-back -back titles in 2019 and 2021 now we're missing the world champ from 2020 but we'll get right back to that Ooh, quick five to ten there for Kalise. fans going wild and this is just uh such a great matchup it's pure soul i mean both these surfers with beautiful styles incredible impeccable technique right there that is just grace under pressure Gets the toes over the nose, so multiple nose rides. Five and 10 combinations there for Kalise Kaleopa'a. I would say that wave is uh, gonna go into her score line in a nice way as well. Not sure if it'll reach the magnitude of that 667, but it'll be close. The 17 year old's looking strong. Only two waves caught and they both started out really well. It would have been nice, again, if she could make that reform straight through to the inside really clean. But look at this wave selection. Those left standing up perfectly, finds a 10 after that five, and then just stays with it nice and steady here. So that outside nose ride gonna be all of that critical risk the, the judges are paying close attention to. And then this is where I'm actually a little bit surprised that she wasn't able to make that transition. Found the nose right again, but maybe should have actually pedaled back just a moment sooner to try and get herself redirected. It's really difficult to turn a, a longboard from the nose. You'll see some surfers, and we've seen it throughout the week, but even just two steps off puts her into that kind of middle spot on the board, and she might have been able to find that trim line through to the inside. Elise Kaleopa, a second wave comes in where we kind of expected it to, a 5-9, so just under that 6-6-7, six, six, but what that does is put her in a really nice spot. She has the luxury now of waiting, picking and choosing the waves that she wants. Uh, with a lead like that, that means Honolulu Bloomfield now needs a 7-5-7. Seven, seven. And uh, Kalise is not gonna play the patience game. She's gonna keep the pedal to the metal and apply the pressure onto Honolulu Bloomfield. But uh, from what we know, historically speaking, never count out Honolulu. Been calling her the Terminator for a reason. That is because she never gives up. And after every wave, she will be back. Yeah, she's pretty much just unstoppable. The hang tens that she's been pulling out this week in very critical sections and being able to get a little bit of length out of them have been heat after heat, which is something that a lot of the surfers in the field on both sides of the draw, men's and women's for the duct tape invitational this year, have struggled to find because Huntington Beach, California, south side here, it's not always the most conducive to longboarding. So today we're probably looking at some of the better conditions right now during the women's final than what we've seen for the draw throughout. Even this morning, it was an extremely challenging lineup. Um, so for Honolulu, if she can continue capitalizing on her wave selection, she's gonna wipe that 3.83 off the board. She could easily get herself back into that excellent range as well, like we saw her do earlier this morning. Yeah, so this being finals, no more advancement. It all comes down to what happens in the water for the next 24 minutes and 35 seconds. As it stands now, Kalias Kaleopa'a in the lead, Honolulu Bloomfield in second with priority. She needs a 7.57. Seven. She's been dropping eights all week long. Uh, I think for her, from what it has looked like in past heats, you know, she has had just prime time wave selection in her quarterfinal matchup. I believe she had one of the highest heat totals of the entire event. Uh, and that really came down to the waves that she was getting. And of course, you know, her ability to just dance on that nine foot plus longboard is 
among the best to ever do it. She's got her hands up. Uh, she's got her hands full right now with Kalise Kaleo Pa. I know these surfers have gone head to head many times, even though Kalise is only 17. You know, she is already a veteran in uh, this game. As we see now, Honolulu. That's the combo that uh, she has used for a lot of success, but another unforced error. That wave wasn't offering anything else, but that to me made that turn an incomplete maneuver because she wasn't able to continue that forward momentum. Yeah, that's something the judges are paying close attention today. Again, when we look at the, the criteria for our World Longboard Tour, we're looking for surfers that perform to the highest degree of difficulty, uh, maneuvers that use the entire board from the tail all the way to the nose in a traditional longboard surfing style. Now, when we reference traditional longboard surfing, we're talking about the style of surfing, the approach rather than necessarily the equipment, which does help you to surf in a traditional manner or anything else in that conversation. It's really just that approach. And these two have a very traditional style to the way that they surf, but they're also kind of encompassing all of that with style, flow, and grace. And I think in the conversation, to be honest, between these two, 17-year-old Kalise, 23-year-old Honolulu, Kalise really encompasses style, flow, grace very naturally within her surfing. For Honolulu, coming out of a very strong competitive shortboarding background, she's a real master of all crafts. And for her, sometimes there are these kind of elements that, that don't entirely involve grace within her longboarding. They don't entirely involve that flow that she gets the work done on the maneuvers that she's doing. For her now coming out into these finals to beat the style, the flow, and the grace of Kalis Kaleopaa, she's got to really keep herself focused on that flow, on not trying to maybe force things a little bit too much to really focus on keeping that upper body quiet while still capitalizing on those critical sections in order to take out the young Hawaiian today. 21.50 now on the clock, Kalis out the back with priority. The last wave comes through for Honolulu, a 2.5, so did not get credit for the second turn. Uh, again, here in uh, the longboard world, these maneuvers last a lot longer than they do on a shortboard. You know, it's it's about riding out completely clean. And both these surfers right now looking to the horizon, wondering what is gonna happen next. And this wave just kind of perks up out of nowhere. And Kalise, looking like she's gonna activate her priority. She does, fading right, cross stepping over. And that wave dissipates beneath her. I'm not gonna call it a priority error just because there wasn't really anything happening right there and there's plenty of time to go. Sometimes you gotta roll the dice as she did right there. It's not gonna pan out for her, but she's got that six, six, seven and a five, nine, a healthy lead. Uh, flip side of that, you just hand a priority over to one of the best longboarders to ever do it. Even having that little uh, kind of panned back angle for a moment, we can see that trail of white water sitting in that middle section. There it is. You can see still still see that white water in the bottom half of the screen, which was the leftover of that wave that Kalise took off on. And I think she actually made a mistake by rushing out to the shoulder too quickly and not carving back. She could have had that inside connection really well and maybe done something with the score line. That was a ripple. It somehow formed into a that wave. That was a ripple, <laughs> definitely. Honolulu Bloomfield now. Kalise with the front row seat, and Honolulu now pulls out. I don't know if that was uh, a purposeful pull out or if the wave kind of just went underneath her. Either way, she's gonna keep priority as Kalise was paddling back out. So that just shows you uh, a, a bit of the competitive knowledge, the high heat IQ that Honolulu possesses. She was going through a lot of different thoughts. She stood up. She saw in front of her, Kalise paddling back out. She did the equation in her head. Is this wave a 757? She didn't think it was. It looked like she pulled out, of course. I'm just guessing as to what she was thinking, but it, that's what it looked like on screen. Kalise now back at it. Another ripple that could turn into something. So right now it's uh, really starting to feel like a cat and mouse game, right? They're just kind of testing the waves coming at them. They've got so much time too. They are they're on a longboard. You can paddle out to backline so quickly, especially when we don't have those giant sets. We don't have all that current today. They can get straight back out there really fast. 
And actually during the semifinals, I noticed Honolua, a couple of the scores that she got against Rachel Tilly came from waves that didn't look like they were gonna stand up into anything, but as she stood up to start riding them, they really developed. So even just that idea of staying a little bit active in this first half of the heat, I'm a fan of it because you don't know, you might have something pop up that matters. Oh no, it looked like Honolulu Bloomfield had a deep paddle for that wave and she did. She hands priority back over to Kalise. So a priority switch there. We'll see what that has in store for us for the rest of the heat. Uh, just a few moments ago, we did catch up with Jao Gianco, who's on the glass now with Luisa Florence. How was that exchange for you? Well, like it was a really tough feat. I had a couple of mistakes that put me in a situation that I shouldn't be. And I think it's just time to reset and like not commit th those mistakes anymore. E a galera vai à loucura, Brasil. Que semifinal final foi essa? Pelo amor de Deus, conta pra gente como é que ficou o coração ali naquela naquele momento que você não sabia que você ia passar ou não. Foi realmente muito apertado. <laughs> Eu olhando a onda de trás, eu sabia que a onda tinha dividido um pouco, então a primeira manobra dele, de repente, não tinha sido tão boa, eu tenho que olhar o replay, mas eu, eu tinha o pressentimento que, mesmo eu errando as minhas finalizações ali, em algumas ondas que não deveria ter errado, eu, eu, acho, eu acho que eu me sairia campeão e vamos para as finais, é, é um sonho realizado. Vamos para as finais, boa sorte. I was just asking him, you know, um, how he was feeling about it, and he was like, you know, I was looking at the wave from from behind, so he didn't really know. He has to watch the replay, but he was really holding that fear and that that the the, the feeling and that confidence that even with his mistakes, he was going to advance. So here we go to the finals. That's right. Our men's Challenger Series finals are set. Set. Thank you, Louisa. Yeah, that's got to be nerve-wracking. <laughs> and the difference here, which is a unique element to most uh, surfing venues, is while the surfers are sitting in the water, just like you would do in an NFL stadium, if you're the quarterback, you can look up and see what happened on the last play. And uh, that's what Jao Chanka was doing during Evan Geisman's wave. There was an exchange during the interview, starting with Honolulu Bloomfield. Gets a little bit of work done out the back. Nothing too extreme though, just redirects here through to the inside and finds herself another nose ride. Great trim line. I like the use of that upper body as well, kind of quiet. She always has that right arm up in the back, up held nice and high. It's really the Honolua style. And finishes off really well on the inside. She is looking to improve on a five and then Khalees had a look at this one. That was a beautiful little combination. Keeps that flow moving, nice bottom turn as well to project through after that outside nose ride. Start setting it up here. And we're really looking at this Grace coming through within her surfing, but also capitalizing on some great sections. That was a very well ridden wave from both surfers. Um, and I think with that, it's really gonna start to set the tone for what our surfer in second place is chasing to take the win. Yeah, and the score comes through for Honolulu Bloomfield. It's not going to help her out. A 4.6. I mean, I feel like all the momentum right now is with Khalees. And we're still waiting for her last score, which could potentially improve on the 5.9 that she's sitting with. So 15.24 to go. As it stands now here in the Vans Duct Tape Invitational Women's Final, Kalis Kaleopaa is in the lead. Honolulu Bloomfield in second with priority. She needs a 757. Nice looking peak here right at the pier bowl. So Honolulu has shifted over towards the pier a little bit. She gets up on the nose. And that's the combination that's been getting her through so many heats in this competition. A little nose ride to turn. She does get that cross step cut back there. This wave could form up for her nicely on the inside. She's got some open face to work with, building speed, momentum, gets the five over the toes, or the five toes over the nose, I should say. And that's the clean ride out that we've seen from Honolulu. Heat after heat, Honolulu Bloomfield is back. 14.30 to go, was it a 7.57? Wow, that was such a good wave. The outside section, the way that it actually broke up by the T on the pier, that's the bigger set that we've seen rolling through so far. She got such a perfectly placed nose ride and you could see she was able to take her time with it as well. Let's have a look at it here. Sets it up, quick footwork up to the nose, gets fully locked over. 
that board that nose way locked into the arch of her foot as well, which just shows that commitment. I love the use of variety as well. Something the judges are loving is that cross step cut back as long as it's functional. And then you can see that bottom spray off that turn looking really, really solid. And then this, I was not thinking she was gonna be able to make it through, but all of her experience in end sections like that means she just slices through with ease. I feel like that wave is gonna make this a heat. Judge is deliberating. Her high score so far is a five. I think she did more on that wave than she did on her five. You know, you saw her go to the nose multiple times. That was a really, really nice wave. We haven't seen any scores come through from the judges. The last one of Khalees was a 6.30, so she's sitting with those two sixes, which has set her up really well in that leading position. Honolua chasing an almost eight, a 7.97. And I just have to think that it's gonna get there because we saw that good outside section. We saw that nose ride. Now maybe something lacking in it, is the fact that it wasn't a crazy critical nose right out the back. She got the work done, but maybe not that steep section that we were looking at in some of the other waves. Yeah, I, I think you're right. That score comes through at a 5.77, seven, seven, so under the requirement. Now she needs a 7.20. We're gonna take a quick break, but we will be back with the culmination of the Vans Duct Tape Invitational Final. Stay tuned. So we are working not only with Native Like Water, but Stoked Mentoring and City Surf Project. Native Like Water works with tribes throughout the state of California and also internationally. The group that we have here today are representing various nations, sovereign nations from throughout Southern California and throughout the nation. So it's a, what we call an intertribal representation where we can all kind of get together and, and, and participate. It's native territory and it's super cool knowing that WSL is acknowledging that. One of the things in our goals and our, the grant that we received is to help restructure that narrative and to have that inclusivity of our people within these coastal environments. We want to go from just surviving to thriving and this surfing is, is an example of us thriving within our natural environments. For more information, check out weareoneocean.org. So the beach is popping, the pier is packed. 9.53 to go. Tension in the lineup is building as Kalis Kaleopa'a is in the lead with a 6.67 and a 6.30. Honolulu Bloomfield with a 5.77 and a 5.0. She needs a 7.20 to get back in the lead which has been held down since the very beginning of this heat by Kalis. But this happened during that break. This is Honolulu. She got that nose ride to start. This wave looking a little bit more bumpy as well. You can see that board just kind of picking up the bump as well as she's cutting through. It doesn't have quite as much flow to it. Still a nice nose ride out the back though. Doesn't make the inside connection. Curious to see what Kalis got up to on this one. 
Nice footwork, finds that little quick hang five, nice and smooth, and I love that little redirect as well. Beautiful rail to rail surfing, which is what we want to see when those surfers need to gain a little bit of speed. Looks like she's not going to make that connection. And I'm just loving the battle between these two at the moment. We got North Shore against South Shore. Honolua from the North Shore, Kelis from the South Shore. We've got a little bit of age on Honolua, a little more competitive experience behind her. The first year she made it onto the world stage at this level for the Hainan event, which is where we used to crown our world champions, was back in 2015. We didn't see Elise graduate to that level until the 15-year-old made it into the pack in 2019. But she did take out a big win within her career already. Kalise won the 2020 Noosa Longboard Open, which set her up as a front runner in the title race that year. And here she is. Quick hang five, cut back. That's the formula for success as we've seen so far. Now she's got a nice section to weave through and is unable to continue on down the line. That little lump that keeps coming up underneath these surfers, making it that much harder to do the connection. You know, it's a flat section and then the lump comes up. So it just adds difficulty of making it through. And then of course, boom, you got that close out right on the sand, which is really scary on a nine foot board. It's pretty much the opposite of what we ever want to surf on a longboard is a close out on the shore break. Exactly. Seven and a half to go. Honolulu Bloomfield now. There is an opening. So if she can put up a big score right now in the wave out the on the outside section, no help at all, closes out all around you. You see her throw her hands up in frustration. So not only did that wave not do anything for her scoreline, but she's basically handed priority over to Kalis Kaleopaa, who uh, is in a healthy lead. And she's throwing away fours like they're nothing. She's got a 6-6-7 six, six, and a 6-3-0. Zero. 7 two, zero right now is going to be a tough, tough wave to find. But if anyone could do it, it's Honolulu Bloomfield. It's definitely Honolulu. She's had excellent scores in her last two heats in that eight-point range. And maybe she'll be able to find it again. Kalise, though, a little bit younger. One of the other cool dynamics between these two is that in the previous two Vans Duct Tape Invitational events here at the U.S. Open in Huntington, they both competed and they were the finalists. They each won respective years. Honolulu, the very first year that the Duct Tape Invitational was introduced here. She took out a first place. Kalise took out second in a four-woman final. And then in 2019, Kalise got it back. She took the win over our new longboard senior manager, Kira Seal, who took away a second, and Honolulu Bloomfield took away a third. A lot of history, a lot of recent history. And so much of course, recent history. There are a lot of reasons why these two surfers can and probably should be rivals. You said it, North Shore versus Town. Uh, you know, they, they, they both, of course, run in kind of similar groups. They're all one big happy family, of course. You know, I think on the, uh, the Longboard Tour, especially since it's a, a condensed field, everybody knows each other really well. But right now, no friends in the lineup. It's all about traditional longboard competition. And if you go way back, I mean, yes, longboarding is filled with soul. It always has been. And here's a soulful character right here, Taylor Jensen making his way into the lineup. He's gonna go out in his final, going up against Kaniela Stewart, number nine and number three in the world. Ford's looking nice, freshly waxed. He's ready to go. Taylor Jensen about to put on a show for all of us watching. 5.16 to go. Activating on this left, it is Kalise. She gets to the nose. Has to straighten off the wave crumbling around her, but it's gonna give her enough energy to make this inside section. Be careful what you wish for. It's gonna bowl up in a strange way, and here we go. It does, she rides straight down, nice and clean to the sand. The best way to prevent a stingray whack is to run it over with your surfboard. There you Don't go. Me, that's totally fine. I love all creatures. Except stingrays. <laughs> Except stingrays. Bonus being a longboarder, you got a huge fin in the back, so you can try and chase them away with that too before you actually step down onto your feet. That was a great wave. Let's take a look at what happened with Blue. So she's chasing a big score already, a 7.2, finds that hang five, but just gets stuck with that coming off of it. And then Kalise 
We're taking a look at this one. I love that outside combo, finds a nose ride, gets that little car back. This wave closes out really quickly. It wasn't like a really huge redirect either until this moment. And then she just finds that flow and she does everything she needs to at this stage. She doesn't push that nose ride, which she would have fallen on. She pedals back and as a long border, one of the most important things to riding out of a closeout section like that, no matter where you're at in the world, is to get your back foot over that fin to really push down on the tail so that you can keep that nose out of the water and you can keep a lot of control. You can ride out of a well overhead closeout that way as long as you've got your feet in the right position and still keep that style, maybe even get just a little bit of a check turn like under the lip. And uh, Khalees did well with that one to just finish out complete. Well, we got three minutes, 25 seconds to go. 22 waves ridden in this final. Of course, on a long board, easier to paddle, easier to get into waves, easier to get back out to the takeoff zone. Uh, and both of these surfers have made full use of their time. They both have 11 waves ridden. But it doesn't matter how many waves you ride. It's two waves that will be totaled up figure out who will be first, who will be second. As it stands now, Kalis Kaleopa'a in the lead. Honolulu still needing that 7-2-0. And that was Kaniela Stewart, who's paddling out in the men's heat against Taylor Jensen. Connie is Kalis's cousin, and with the Hawaiian flag on him was Kalis's little brother, Moses, who is an absolute champ. He was sharing with me uh, Kalis's taste in music is very traditionally Hawaiian. She's got some massive playlists that go up to, you know, well over that two day mark. You just keep listening to music that never ends and it's all Hawaiian style. Where Honolulu, I think has a little bit of a different taste, prefers little Justin Bieber, some other little, you know, flavors within it. And um, at the moment, it's, it's one of the Hawaiian natives in the lineup that's gonna be taking the win. And it looks to be very favorable for Kalise, the princess of Waikiki, following very well in the footsteps of Kalia Muniz, the two-time world longboard champion who bowed out of competition this year, although she was in the rankings and had a spot. They're expecting their second child and just really starting to set the tone of that South Shore crew out of Waikiki. There's so many great kids that have come up, but women like Kalia Muniz, who's kind of set that tone for that next generation. And it was Honolulu Bloomfield last year winning her third world title in the water while Kalia Muniz was surfing to take away that two world title tie between the two Hawaiians. Oh man, so Honolulu Bloomfield, you see her sitting out the back. This is a, her moment to ponder what happened. I mean, she's probably getting very used to winning all the time and this is a win. I mean, a semi or a final finish, second place on the world longboarding tour is huge. Uh, it's a rare occurrence for Honolulu, but <laughs> you don't want to uh, poke that monster because if you make her mad, she will make you pay. And going in to our final stop at Malibu, where she's got probably a little bit of a you know, mix, right? Residual scar tissue from not winning, but also that's where she won her last title. So uh, it is going to be a epic finish to our WSL World Longboard Tour. Can't wait to see what happens next. I can't wait to see in the next 47 seconds if Honolulu gets an opportunity to put something on the board. I've got to feel like all the momentum, it's been with Kalise from, from that opening exchange. She found a 6-6-7 from her first wave. It took Honolulu seven waves to get herself into the fives to put something that really counted on the scoreboard. And for Kalise, with her taking a win here, it now ties up the rankings. Both Honolulu and Kalise are going to head into Malibu with 5,000 points with a tiebreaker on the line to win that world title. 15 seconds left. Will this wave come in time? Both surfers having a dig for the first wave of this set. Eight seconds left. Honolulu identifies something coming in. Time is winding down. Three, two, one. And the horn blows just a second too soon. Honolulu can't catch that wave. Congratulations to Kalis Kaleopaa representing Oahu getting the win here at the Vans Duct Tape Invitational 2022. Gets a hug from Cousin and wow, you know that has to fire up our surfer in blue. Kaniala Stewart, his cousin just won the Vans Duct Tape Invitational and he's right out there to greet her. What a story we're starting to see unfold and what a performance by Kalise. I mean, style, grace, elegance, you could not crown a better woman to encompass 
this traditional longboard manner that we're celebrating here at both the Van, Van Duct Tape Invitational as well as the World Tour for Longboarding. Well, your 2022 Vans Duct Tape Invitational champion is Kalis Kaleopa'a. And we're going to crown more champions around the corner. Stick around. We'll be right back with more action. Welcome back to the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. We just saw a big win for the Hawaiian, Khalees Kaleopa'a, to take out the women's title. And she is basking in the glory of the Hawaiian flag getting chaired up. Wow. I just get, this is like a chicken skin moment for me. Um, Kaipo and this Peter Mel. That was pretty cool. Meaningful, meaningful stuff. For sure, you know, and uh, you know, Hono had actually paid tribute to Kalis and about how much fun they were going to have together in the water. Uh, Kalis taking this big win for her, congratulations, and it's a major win, you know, being a, a Vans U.S. Open champion or a Vans Duct Tape Invitational champion here on the sands of Huntington Beach is a huge uh, accolade. Not to mention 5,000 points to her credit and an opportunity to become a world champ when we head to Malibu in October for that championship. Well, it's the men's final right now, and it is a veteran, a three-time world title champion in the way of Taylor Jensen against another upstart from Queens on the south shore of Oahu, another upstart from Hawaii, Kaneala Stewart. I love this matchup. We're going to have power in the way of Taylor Jensen versus the smooth style and footwork of Kaneala Stewart. Yeah, thinking about this already, I was realizing in the final, you've got representation of Hawaii in every division. That's right. What is it about Huntington Beach in, the, in Hawaii? It, it, I mean, is it, is it the wave? Is it the vibe? I think it's just effort, you know? I mean, I think, I feel this wave takes a lot of effort. And um, Hawaiian's putting in that effort. Look at 2011, 2012, 2017, Taylor Jensen. He's also won two U.S. Opens as well back in 2003 and 2008 so very decorated and he would be the veteran amongst uh, these two competitors versus Kaneala Stewart hometown Waikiki Oahu a classic surf break Queens that has been surfed for hundreds of years and Kaneala Stewart continues on with that cultural tradition of surfing so cool and uh, you know of course Duke Anamoku a huge part of that heritage, you know, going to the Olympics and he's recognized around the world. 
All right, well, hey, let's celebrate a win. Let's celebrate a win for Hawaii. Kalis Khalil Pa'a is your 2022 Vans Duct Tape Invitational Champion, and I want to hear from her. Yeah, so many hugs and kisses over here. It was a huge win for you. Thank you. How are you feeling? Um, I just feel so loved. I like the support with my family and friends. Like, it's un like unbelievable. Like, hugging my cousin in the water after that final was just, like, so heartwarming. And, uh, yeah, I feel I'm filled with a lot of love. <laughs> Did you tell him something? Oh, I just said, like, you got this. You can do it. I was like, bring it home, like, so we can have a bigger rager when we get home. But, no. I was just hanging out with your family in the athlete zone, and they asked me to tell you how proud Waikiki is <laughs> of you. Do you want to say something to them? Yeah. Literally, my whole entire family and friends, our surf community back at home, like, they're my motivation when I come out here because like, we come from such a special place. And uh, I grew up surfing my whole entire life around my uncles and aunties. And, like, this, I do this, like, for them as, like, a thank you for, like, introducing me to this sport or passion that I love so much. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Go bask in the victory. You deserve it. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Congratulations. Kelis, that was awesome. Again, chicken skin. Well, here we go, Kaneala Stewart now up and riding, representing Hawaii in this final. It gets to the nose. And that style just oozing from the lanky Hawaiian surfer, also from Queen Surf Break, makes his way again to another five, skates through this flat section, and a light-footed rebound on the inside before ending up on the shore. So Kaneala Stewart, that's going to be his start to his matchup against Taylor Jensen. Such great board control. It's truly incredible how he's able to just weave back and forth and read it so well. Again, to see how quick footwork. Look at where he's actually trimming on the other side of the stringer. When he's going right, you see the footwork is over on the rail side holding it in and then again onto the tip all this work just keeping the glide roller coaster from the midpoint of the board once again best number of the heat obviously but a great start waiting for that number to hit our scoreboard so we can update you on the earnings of Kaniala Stewart on his second wave first wave not going to be a factor, just a just a fractional up and down. So this is going to be his first real number. You can see that 0 0.77. That's going to count for nothing at the end of this, this heat. A 4.83 checks in for the start for Kaniala Stewart. Priority shifts now to Taylor Jensen. You can see him, see him sitting out in the back in that red jersey. Big week for Taylor Jensen, three-time world champ. Dropped a uh, new pro model with Firewire surfboards, the TJ Pro 5 made in that Thunderbolt construction. So all that stuff hitting stores right now. And what a timing for yeah. Taylor Jensen to get a new a new model out on the store shelves the same week that he finals here at the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. And you know that someone with his caliber and accolades and understanding of equipment, that the design is going to be something that's going to work pretty darn well. Well, it's been working pretty well, right? That round pin that he's been utilizing and it's been looking smooth as opposed to the majority of the field with big square nose rider tails. So uh, the TJ Pro 5, looking the goods. You know much about that Thunderbolt construction, Peter? Not a ton. Uh, it hasn't made it into the floor of a Freeline Surf Shop, so I, I don't have uh, all of the... Uh, tech aspects of it, but I know that Firewire is at the forefront of trying to mix up and utilize different materials, and I feel like of anything that's happening in board design, yes, template, uh, rockers, uh, fin plates, fin design, all that stuff's um, pretty cool, because, but we're, we're, we're recycling a lot of design theories there, you know, it's not like you can go all of a sudden just completely throw that upside down, but as far as construction goes and utilizing different materials, those are always getting refined, you know, the cores, foams, uh, carbon and, and epoxy, those types of things, and flex pattern, all of those things are still in the infancy in my eyes. Well, I, I think that construction works pretty well for long boards. Uh, also, boards built for Kai Salas in that construction, Ben Skinner and Soleil Erico, all for that same construction. So. Um, good job to all the people over there at Firewire and their commitment to longboarding. We're committed to longboarding as well here at the World Surf League. We've already got a women's champ. 
We're looking to crown a men's champ as well. This is stop number two on the World Longboard Tour. With the tide filling in, Peter, things have slowed down just a tad. Well, we expected that. You know, one thing that happens uh, at Huntington Beach, you know, we just hope that that windswell holds. We did see the Surfline forecast saying that it will decrease through the afternoon. We've been fortunate enough to actually wake up this morning with the still having a bit of south swell in the water. You see that there's both, you know, these southerly angled swells that move from the left part of the screen to the right, and they kind of just shift ever so slightly that direction towards the pier. And then we've seen some wind swell that goes the other way. So we've had sets from both directions. Taylor Jensen and a quick cross step to the nose for a five. And stays steady through this flatter water on the inside, unable to make the connection to the shore break. Both these surfers have an incredible read on you know, the energy of a wave and where to keep the trim. And sometimes they're like, okay, well, am I gonna have to commit to the inside in this one? Taylor says, no dice, there's not enough energy for me, so I'm gonna kick out. Kaniala perched on the nose for an extended period of oh. time. And unfortunately, seems like he got a little greedy on that tip time and it cost them. Overcommitted, uh, understanding that, you know, the time on the tip translates into extra commitment. But the course, when you do that, there's always a chance that you're going to fall. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's what happened there for Kaniala. Yeah, lost the balance and lost that kind of um, planing ability. And the nose poked a little bit for Kaniala. And that's how he lost the wave. Just a 1.2 for that ride. Last score for Taylor Jensen, a three-point ride. Jensen looking for a 3.04 at the moment to turn this heat. Early days, though, 23 minutes and 15 seconds on the countdown here. And priority back with Taylor Jensen. So opportunity for Taylor Jensen when the next set arrives, Peter. We've saw, understood and talked about how important priority is. We actually saw Kaniala utilize that at the end of the last heat. So smart. Understanding the priority can be that power position, especially at the back end of a heat. And he was kicking out to make sure that he was able to get that priority. Worked out well for him. He's in the final. One more heat to go. 22 minutes be able to pick up. It feels like that 483. I mean, yeah, he's got the lead right now, but I don't know if that's going to be truly enough to be held on to as a top two score. I feel like you're going to probably need something. Ooh, look at this. They're both like quick flinch. Saw something going on outside. Wave number one. It looks like a two wave set and decision time for Taylor Jensen. He's going to go on wave number one. Here we go. Fade into the right and gets a 10 arching through that hang 10. Powerful turn, signature move for Taylor Jensen. Cross-stepping and getting into the planing area of the board to connect the dots from the outside to the inside. Pushing down on that rocker and makes it to the inside again. Oh, some beautiful tip time there and a finish. So you talked about a breakaway score, Peter. I think we just saw that. I would agree. Extra time on the tip. Again, great footwork, utilized the entire wave from start to finish. He actually moved outside a little further than we'd seen anybody grab a wave. So he saw that that opportunity was there and he put himself on that outside section. And you see that little bottom turn. It's not really even a bottom turn, it's almost a stall, but and then jumps to the tip. And look at that, the style arches his back. And then this cutty, and look at the arm placement, drives through it too. You know, held the rail through the maneuver nice and smooth, and then actually pulls that arm up over his shoulder little extra accentuation and then this here had to make that inside section and look at back on the tip and then the little swivel on the tip control with the finish i mean this is going to be a magnificent number for taylor jensen yeah i i concur he uh, checked all the boxes uh he utilized the entire length of the board he got some nose riding time style flow and grace all executed there making the difficult look easy and just check the boxes, all the criteria, and checking them in the number of a 7.67. So as we anticipated, Pete, that was the breakaway score for Taylor Jensen. And now Connie Alice Stewart needs to answer back with a 5.85 or higher. And here's all the judges' numbers. Pair of eights there, pair of seven fives and a seven, knock out the seven and the eight, average the two seven fives and eight together, that's where you get the 7.67. I'm feeling good about the score. I, I, I think the judges got that one spot on, um, given that performance. They did leave a little bit of room 
into the excellent range, in which they should because there may be some bigger, better waves and maybe even more nose ride time available. Paying our attention to Kaniala. Pier Bowl on the nose, has to step back quickly. Little bank on the oncoming Whitewater. Now some footwork through this middle sec transitionary section. And cross step to the nose, gets the 10, and Soul Arches through that 10, hangs on to it, and gets the finish, Kaniala Stewart. We also had Taylor Jensen on that same wave further down the beach. And another paddle race out to the outside. And a paddle race is going to begin right now for priority. So both surfers taking that wave, and that's going to mean the judges are going to take a little bit of time to get these scores in because I guarantee you they're going to have to do some video review, which are available to our judges. Yeah, no, that's exactly it. We get to watch also on this one is Taylor Jensen. So at different peaks, priority was with Kanyala. Wow, nice little driving turn there. We saw him quickly run to the front of the board at the very beginning of that way, but really the outside move was that turn. I really like how Kanyala is able to move his board through that midsection. He's always moving left, then right. He's committing the rails through it, not just a gliding straight. He actually moves back. Watch. You see him, he just goes up to the front of the board, and then he'll transition the inside rail, and then he'll go back to the other rail. And that was pretty cool right there, especially That's when he gets 10. the 10 and is able to pull it out. Well, so we're going to see, uh, I think we're going to see Kanyala's best number for sure, obviously. And, uh, you know, in comparison to the 767, that's uh, what the judges are looking at. Taylor's going to keep the lead most likely because his backup number is going to be better than the 483 of Kanyala, but it feels like this pretty close to the matchup of uh, the 767. Kanyala taking a look at this one. On the paddle, Stewart going left this time. Cross stepping up, five there. Has to skip through some slow water. Gets back on the nose and hangs there for a bit before redirecting on the inside. Smooth cross step cut back and weaving through a flat section back up on the nose for Kanyala Stewart. Pressing down on the nose and stepping back on the board to control the finish, Stewart. Last score for Taylor Jensen, a 6.17. Waiting for two scores for Kaniala Stewart to set the situation. Six point ride for previous wave of Kaniala Stewart. We're still looking for another score to set the situation. Here's the replay. This was the last wave. We haven't seen this score yet, but I mean, I felt like to me personally, Kaniala's wave was a little better than Taylor's in my eyes. That's just my opinion. It came on slightly under. We're watching this one here, outside work. Wasn't able to get the full tip time, but that was beautiful. A little swivel on the nose, pressing as you had mentioned. So difficult to do to keep that board and lift it up. Well, Connie Allen needs a 7.84 if he wants to turn the heat in one wave. And the waves are starting to turn on. Here we go. Big set wave here too. Taylor Jensen on the nose and pearls there. So missed opportunity for Jensen, but quick hands to grab that board and not lose it. Um, as he, both surfers are surfing uh, free, freely without leashes. So really good to, for Taylor Jensen to have that quick reflex to grab those bo that board and uh, yeah, he loses avoid board. having to swim to shore. Yeah, he loses that board. He's going to waste a good three, four minutes of a you know final heat. Not a good idea. Still waiting on that last of Kanyala. You know, again, he's going to be still behind most likely. This was an opportunity, I think, for Taylor to extend his lead because that was uh, probably the biggest wave of the heat. Overcommitted on the nose. And then uh, you run back as fast as you can, but you're also falling from the lip and the nose grabbed, you saw it pearl. Very difficult to actually keep it all together in that moment. But he was able to grab his board and save priority. 
Yeah, and he's going to maintain the lead as well because second wave for Connie Alice Stewart comes at a 5.3. The requirement remains the same for the Hawaiian at a 7.84. Connie Alice Stewart needs the best wave surfed so far in this final if he wants to take out a crown here at the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. They feel like uh, there's a pretty good gap between the two, so obviously seeing something different on the watch of the heat previous. More from the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. This is the finals, and the conclusion is on the way right after this. Vans U.S. Open of Surfing is brought to you by Vans, off the wall since 66. By Pacifico, official beer of the Vans U.S. Open of Surfing. Live life anchors up. By Youth Theory, official vitamin and supplement of the Vans U.S. Open of Surfing. By BF Goodrich, official tire of the Vans U.S. Open of Surfing. And by Stillhouse, the unbreakable spirit. It's finals time here at the Vans Duct Tape Invitational men's final out in the water. 12 minutes remaining and clock, counting down on the clock. Taylor Jensen, a three-time world champion, out in the lead over Connie Ala Stewart representing Oahu, Hawaii. And here we go on the replay of Connie Ala Stewart, Peter. Again, that beautiful walking up and down the board. So nice from Connie Ala. He stays with this one. Even during the midsection, he's able to walk up and down that board, just gliding. He's like he's on an escalator. Back to live action. And looks like it was just uh, Taylor Jensen coming off the wave. And that score is in there, Kaipo. Uh, doesn't factor three. in. Yeah, for Kaniala Stewart. Doesn't factor in. The need remains the same for Kaniala in the blue jersey, a 7.84. Taylor Jensen was able to get back out the back and regain priority priority in the lead heat control with jensen yeah at this point i think canela's strategy would be just wait it out wait for another you know major set wave because that'll be a point of difference if he can find himself a nice sizable one and just do the surfing he's been doing all week long that's going to be able to if you can get into the excellent number there that's going to turn the heat for him and turn the momentum Let's check out our heat recap, Peter, starting off with Taylor Jensen. So Taylor Jensen, this was uh, early momentum with him, 7.67. The engagement of the rail on the outside section, the tip riding as well. You see the difference for me is that mid part of the wave where Kaniala is able to kind of engage his rails through it, whereas Taylor kind of glides through it. But the inside, you see he's able to get a little bigger guy, so he's able to get that board driving through maneuvers. This one here came in at a 6.17. Again, that was, a, again, a full engagement of the rail. Judge is digging that one as it came in as a 
So those are the two top numbers for Taylor Jensen. This was actually being written at the exact same time that Kaniala was riding his best wave. Back to live action and caught, catching up with Kaniala Stewart. Smooth through the middle, nice redirection, and now planing through some dead water, no problem. He makes the connection into the shore break. And great footwork finishing off there. Kaniala Stewart again. Needs a very good score of a 7.84 for Stewart. Yeah, unfortunately for me that just the wave quality on that one wasn't as high, but I mean, I love the way his transitions are from that outside to the inside. It's just smooth, it's silk. He's actually moving up and down the board at the same time, just gliding. Look at that, ooh, 10 out there on the back part of it. I like that. On the backhand, you see this little moments where he just looks at it, it's following the energy of the wave and able to get to the tip, even on the mid part, just gliding in. Again, just such great footwork. And it's nice, he just gets on the tail at the appropriate time, right as the wave gets really steep and to avoid purling that no nose. Still waiting on this score here. Bobby's got the judges thinking too. I mean, there was um, about as smooth a footwork as you're gonna have, especially when he was able to get to the tip several times on that wave. Not even into his top two, Kaipo. 5.3, so Kanye Stewart continues to knock on the door for a score. Yeah, I just feel like it needs to be a little bit better wave quality, a little bigger wave. And then that will be uh, the point of difference in my eyes. You know, getting that outside work done with the, on a bigger, steeper wave, because that is the most critical section. That's where they want to see you riding the tip on the, is on the biggest, steepest part of the wave and then do the gliding work through the inside and then get that finish. Yeah, eight minutes remaining and uh, Taylor Jensen still with the, that heat control. Well, when you have priority in the lead, that's what it is. You generally do not want to see one of those major set waves go and not have priority. Hey Pete, you know what's coming up next? What? Not the World Surf League? The outer known Tahiti Pro, that's gonna start August 11th through the 13th. And we're gonna see the fight for the final five. It's a close battle when we look at the cut line between Griffin Colapinto and Kanoa Garashi. On the women's side, Brisa Hennessy and Lakey Peterson need those crucial, uh, need a result there for those crucial last spots. Final five is important. That's where you're gonna be fighting for a world title. Five surfers gonna be the one chance one day to be able to get it done. Yeah, and there is actually gonna be a, a race for that yellow leader's jersey as well. Carissa Moore and Felipe Toledo coming into Tahiti with that yellow leader's jersey, but Joanne DeFay and Jack Robinson can take that leader's jersey, snatch that leader, leader's jersey, and become the number one seed in that final five as we look forward to the Rip Curl WSL Finals. That's gonna happen August 11th through the 21st is our waiting period, but it's a one day event. It's the Super Bowl of surfing. That's gonna happen at Lowers. That's in September. But I'll say that number one seed so important, being that uh, you've gotta beat the number one seed two out of three. Yeah, that's right. Correction, that's September. Yes. I, I held, I had your back, Kaipo. Thanks. You're, you're reading the screen. That's the Outer Known TD Pro. That's coming up August. We're going there. You're leaving tomorrow. I yeah. get to leave the day after. Yorana. You get an extra day in the beautiful island of Tahiti. Yorana Mareva. They're going to welcome us over there. And Save my bed place. over there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm saving your place. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be staying together. I love that we get to go down there and stay with families. You know, it becomes like, uh, you know, you're the end of the road. You're actually... We're actually staying on the other side of the river, so literally no cars. One of the few, you know, similar to say G-Land. And not to mention, just one of the miracles of the surf world, Te Ahu Po'o, that wave is very, very intimidating. And uh, so that's gonna happen, check it out, just in a few days. Connie Alice Stewart out on the water and he wants, speaking of waves, wants a wave, needs a wave, and it has to be a quality wave because he needs a 
And he's sitting with second priority. So this is a, a point where he needs to, you know, obviously he would love for the fact that Taylor make a mistake, take a wave, not improve his score. He's actually a good strategic plan here by moving away from Taylor Jensen. That pure bowl has been very good to Kanyala. Let's take a look at the highest single wave score in this heat. This is the 7 6 7. So not a major set wave, at least uh, from what we've seen, but just the outside work. Beautifully done. Tip ride, held it for a moment, and then that nice engagement of the rail through to the inside. Again, more tip work with the five and that little swizzle up top. Great control, little point of difference. And a finish with actual like rebound off the foam after the tip ride, which is, again, great fit work, footwork to be able to get up to the tip and then all the way back to be able to finish that move. Four minutes remaining and the Kaniala Stewart starting to feel like pressure. Yeah, yeah pressure. just like an Eagle song, Desperado. <laughs> I mean, what you can you Cote do? You and the music connotations to surfing. I guess in music and surfing are very uh, close to each other. Oh, intertwined. Yes. Yeah. Well, Kaniala Stewart, I mean, what can he do, Pete? I mean, if the strategy, let's, let's do the three. He's going to get there connected right now. Start doing a wave chant. Just uh, a two wave set. That's what he's going to need, right? He's going to need a two wave set just to give himself a chance because Taylor Jensen, you don't surf your way to two U.S. Open titles and three world titles by not knowing how to play a heat. It's true. And it's funny because I, I, in Taylor, just watching his demeanor throughout the heat, I mean, as competitive, I'm sure he is. He doesn't really ever play defense. He just sticks to his guns. Yeah, the, in the semifinals, uh, he really had a, a gentleman's finish, if you would, where he, he had priority, but he gave a lot of space. Yeah, he just sat in the spot and said, I'm just going to, you know, he's pretty much one of those guys that just wants to keep surfing well and, and getting the best waves. And he has his spot in the lineup, and he's going to sit out there and wait it out, just like he's doing right now. I mean, in his eyes right now, he'd love her just to stay flat for the next 250. Do you have a wave chant? Um, yeah, I do. You want to? Wanna... No. No? You've heard it before. Here we go. Stewart with an opportunity, but not a lot going on this wave. Gets up to the nose, taps a five. Nice redirect, nice drop knee, some cross foot steps there. Gets more nose time coming through here needs to get lucky in the shore break five spins around tries oh. for the switch stance which would have been brilliant but the wave got away and against that pier there's definitely the agitated water which is always so hard because the water is actually moving out as a current against him and so that's what gets that water all agitated you're riding backwards through that water was takes a lot of skill here's our tides for today we've passed the high tide we're, I mean, past we're past the low, the low tide. tide, I'm sorry, on our way to a high tide. Local time here, almost 1 o'clock, so um, we're, we're in a mid-tide zone. Yeah, well, and 2.6 low is not a very low tide. So, I mean, it really not didn't get low like we saw early in this event. So we watch the replay here. He had to transfer over to that section, and that's where his footwork really started. But you can see right here is where all that water moves out underneath the pier. Oh, that was such a brilliant. Creates a lot attempt. more friction. Yeah, the wave almost stops right there, right? Well, you see the wave actual speed. Yeah, it does. It slows down, and then the water's all choppy, so you have to plow through that. And it's just a, a challenging part of the lineup to really execute any maneuvers. Although a longboard, it kind of plows through it. Is that? But I just felt like you know when he's on the tip of the nose of the board, it just hitting those rails and slowing him down. Wasn't able to get down into the shore break section. So it didn't factor into his top two. Taylor Jensen's going to use priority right now. That is definitely a paddle. Here we go. Taking it left. And just has to trim there. Kicks out. Well, there's the first defensive move I've seen so, <laughs> from yeah. Taylor Jensen. That was certainly a defensive move. Now, 30 seconds. Is there a wave? Connie Olive Stewart. 7.84 is the lead. Here comes a wave. Oh, we like those finishes. It gets the opportunity here. 
And Connie Alice Stewart gives thanks before he paddles into this wave. Now it's all Connie on the nose. They'll so large through that section. Explosion there, a little unstable water. No problem for Connie Alice Stewart. He needs to stick with this. As he stays in the white water, reading the bump, heading on to the inside, Connie Alice Stewart cross steps his way to another tap of a five on the inside here. She has to straighten out as the wave doubles up. 7.84, it's a big ask, it's a big number. And Connie's just gonna step off on the sand. I love that he gave thanks. Best. That he was like, hey, give me the opportunity. That's, that's all you can ask for. And he beached it. So he's got the judges thinking. Casually out of the water as Taylor Jensen's gonna near the shore. In anticipation of that final score, let's take another look at the last ride for Connie Alice Stewart. Good size wave. Look at that's full on, shoulder high, on the tip. Was able to get quickly back. Keeps his balance. Engages the rail. And again, I love this mid work from Kanyala. Just so good at transferring his weight through the rail on the tip. Again. Wow, he's definitely going to have those judges think about it. Yep. Well, the judges thought about it, Peter. And is a 5.6. Not enough for Kanyala Stewart. So it's Taylor Jensen, your 2022 Vans Duct Tape Invitational Champion. Big congratulations, has been on point all week long. And security grabbing Taylor's board. Does he need security? <laughs> There's security that takes you up and down, yeah. He's a big guy, but a yeah, standard procedure. All right, there's your champ, Taylor Jensen, for the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. When we come back, we're going to switch gears. Oh, well, it's we going to be the up. Women's Challenger Series Finals out in the water. down two more to go for the vans us open of surfing we've just wrapped up the vans duct tape invitational it was so much fun to watch the action but now we're into it with two women fighting for a chance to requalify for this well for next year's championship tour shannon hughes in the booth alongside of the great mitchell salazar and we've got a hot heat on our hands we do and we're gonna have a new champion in the women's division here whether it's betty lusakura johnson or macy callahan who has been consistent and on fire all week long Look for Macy to control this heat at the beginning, especially since her best scores have really come off of lefts. Betty Lou has had a good balance of both of them, rights and lefts, over the course of the event. It's going to be a great one, Shannon. Seen some excellent scores thrown down between these two. And getting that first opportunity for Macy Callahan. 
Snap on her backhand, uses priority on this wave, tags the finish. Now she might stick with this, looking for that reform, and she's gonna do the work here. Wanting to really capitalize on that first exchange, but it goes soft, flat, really, and that'll be impossible. Betty Lou already with a 1.67 on the scoreboard, so she's now out the back with priority, looking to wash off that first wave and start to set the tone for the next 31 minutes. Yeah, so the only reason Macy was able to take that wave was because Betty Lou actually took this one as the first of the heat. Just a little speed float down the line, kicked out real quick, not a wave that she wanted to keep uh, surfing on. And then Macy with a great start right here, the setup turn and then straight up into the lip afterwards. So this is easily gonna be not only the best wave of the heat, but I think as far as the starting point goes for the surfer in red, I think she's going to have what could easily be her backup wave at the end of this one. Coming into this event, both of them were already in that conversation right on that bubble of qualification. We're taking five women from this year's Challenger Series to join the championship tour next year for 2023. And Macy Callahan out of Avoca Beach in New South Wales. She came into this event currently ranked, well, ranked number five. She's already jumped up to at least a number three spot on the rankings coming into the finals. And so she could be looking to secure her position as we head into the final three events of the year. For Betty Lou Sakura Johnson, coming out of Haleiwa, Oahu, on the North Shore of Hawaii, she came in ranked number six. She's already jumped up to at least number four. And we'll see how it all filters through as we crown our champion. Yeah, and looking at the score right there, a 5.67, a good opener for Macy. And as you were mentioning, both of these ladies have a lot on the line in terms of qualification. Five versus six right now on the water. And that was before this event, so they moved up a few spots as well. I will say, though, that not only is Macy on the best run that she's had in her career, making back-to-back -back finals. This would also be the biggest win of her career if she would be able to crown herself the first time champion here at the Vans US Open in terms of Challenger Series events. Actually, second last year was the first one really, but um, in terms of her winning one, it would be her first. It would be huge to see either of these women walk away with the win, and we will see one in 29 minutes. Macy Callahan currently sitting in the lead with a 5.67. In that last heat, we saw none other than the three-time world champion in TJ Taylor Jensen take out Connie Ella Stewart. Let's catch up with him now. Taylor, you're normally somebody who sticks to his plan, but on that last wave, you use your priority, and then you see that wave come in for Connie. What is going through your head? Uh, yeah, look, it was a gamble, of course, but that wave that I took, he could have gotten the score on too, so I couldn't let him have it. I didn't know if there was something else, and then, yeah, paddling back out, I saw that. I was definitely nervous. Um, yeah, Connie can throw up eights, nines all day long, so yeah, I just had to wait and see what happened. What was working for you so well in that heat and the ways you did pick? Um, I tried to pick cleaner waves and the rights. Obviously, that benefits me being front side on those. So, yeah, just pick clean rights and, and make sure I got that reform and, and finish strong and, yeah, just put it all together. The last time you won here at Huntington Beach, your daughter's not even born yet, but they're here celebrating this moment. How sweet does that make this victory? The 2022 Vans Duct Tape Invitational Champion. Far out, yeah. That's it's like to have my kids and my wife here is insane. It's like 2008, that's a long time ago, 19 years or whatever it is. So yeah, it's uh, it's yeah, it feels good. With all that space in between it, how validating is it for you to get this win against such a strong field of competitors? Yeah, it's it's huge. I mean, these are all the best surfers in the world. So to get a win, uh, I, I've had a couple bad results in the last few events. So, yeah, to come back and get a win here close to home, yeah, it sets me up going into Malibu. And, yeah, I'm happy with where I am. Congratulations. Thank you. A massive result for Taylor, a big win for him. It's been a little bit, a little while since we've seen him at the top of the rankings like that. Now tied with Harrison Roach heading into the final event for this year's longboard tour. And we could see him finding that fourth world title that he's been very hungry for. Would have to say out of the four divisions, he was probably the most consistent surfer out of everybody. At least, you know, 11, 12 points in the first five to eight minutes of every single heat that he served. So he's looking good to crown himself four-time world champion at the end of this year. That's right. He began competing here at this level back in 2002. His first world title came in 2011. The length of his career, now 20 years down the line, has proven to be just as strong as when it started. And that's something that we hope to see from someone in the water like Betty Lou Sakura Johnson and from Macy Callahan, both getting those championship tour opportunities at such a young age, you know, 16, 17 years old, 
when we saw Betty Lou qualify and get that start to the first part of this year. We can see there her rankings coming into this event. She took away a, a semifinal, a, a third place finish at the Boost Mobile Gold Coast Pro, backed it up well in Bolito with a fifth place finish while also taking out the Pro Junior there. Yeah, and if you look at the results right here, no shame in losing to either Molly Picklum or Caitlin on the Gold Coast. The fifth place finish, it was a close heat in the quarterfinals at Bolito, but at this event so far, I think she's proven that she's more than capable of winning those close and tight heats, especially when a few of them have been comeback wins too. Um, take note of Macy Callahan though, and the way she's not only made her way to the final, but as far as her results go as well, she's better than each and every time. A couple of ninth place finish, uh, finishes, and then the second place finish at Bolito, but I truly think that we're gonna see the best version of Macy in the next few years. Still relatively young, only in her early 20s, so she's got a lot more to give, Shannon. That's right, and if she does take the win here for the Vans US Open with 10,000 points on the line, that will be her career biggest win. This year, she took out what is her career biggest win at the AAP Consulting Women's Pro at Newcastle, a QS 5000. She also won at home in Avoca for the Sister Revolution Central Coast Pro, which was a QS 3000. And that was just a really sweet taste of victory that set herself up on momentum in that Australian regional QS to get herself back on the Challenger Series. Yeah, and a few years ago, I forget which event it was, but um, there was a six star, the last event of the season for the qualifying series. She actually needed to make the final to requalify for the championship tour. She ended up winning the event, and because of that result, she was able to move back up onto the CT. But, you know, besides the World Pro Junior Championship win a few years ago, I don't think that she's really had an opportunity to really showcase what she's capable of. And so far, she's doing it in this event and has the highest wave of the heat so far, 5.67. Still plenty of time, though, 25 minutes. I would think you're needing at least 12 to 13 points to win this one, Shannon. There's definitely got to be more available for them. It's a little bit slow. It's a little bit sleepy here on finals day. But when we get that pulse, there's some great quality waves available. For Betty Lou, I think it was her capitalizing on those right handers where she found herself with a nine in that semifinal against Sophie McCulloch. That was a tough loss for Sophie because she knew if Betty Lou found herself on a right, she's pretty much unstoppable. And I think that's something that Macy really needs to have in her mind as well, knowing that Betty Lou has been so lethal on the right handers throughout competition. Maybe the Australian and Sophie pass the word on to Sheldon Simkis, Macy's partner. There's her camp there with Nikki Van Dyke in support as well. Yeah, and Shelly is at a great season so far second place finish on the Gold Coast and maybe not the last three results that he's liked but at least he has a keeper result so far so be cool to see a power couple on the championship tour as well but I mean I think the conditions have really delivered to uh, Shannon it's been clean it's glassy it's been fairly consistent throughout each and every heat I think each heat 30 35 minutes regardless of how much time they've been they provided at least four to five sets each and I think we're going to see a lot more consistency as soon as that tide starts rising a little bit more. And the quality of waves that have been coming through, they've offered great pocket and great mm. sections for everyone. Yeah, and both rights and lefts, too. And I think the only heat that needed a few lefts was the one with Justin Quintal. And unfortunately, he just couldn't uh, get through that semifinal. But it seems like we might have a paddle here. Macy looking. Macy with priority holds off Betty Lou. It's a good sell. That was a very good sell. That wave didn't quite have that quality. It wasn't quite going to be there for a big score. And now Betty Lou has priority. Yeah, I get a pressure from Sakura, and she might be going on this here. On her forehand. Nice carve to start. Throw some spray. Sets it up into that second maneuver really well. And now into the Huntington hop to try and make it through that section. The two-turn combo out the back. She's now going to need a strong finish here. To put that pressure onto Macy Callahan and the snap under the lip will do it. So going to be her best wave. Don't know how much I agree with the actual wave selection right there, though. I feel like if you switch priority and forced Macy to commit an error right there on the outside, I probably would have waited a little bit longer knowing that you at least have a 3-6-7 in your scoreline. Still, as I said before, I think it's going to be her best. So she catches this one kind of in the midway point and the one reason I say it is because those two cars were a bit flatter. The section wasn't very steep. Got the inside Shory connection though and got a decent finish. I mean, could be high four, low five at the most, I think. But I just think for where we're at at the competition and the kind of decision making that you need to have, don't know if I 100% agree with what she was trying to do there. 
Betty Lou Sakura Johnson with a score to come through. She just needs a small 2.88 to take the lead, which will definitely happen. And then we'll see where Macy's sitting with the requirement. I think that opening exchange was really important with Macy scoring that 5.67 because it could be a challenge to find a second backup score. If she's able to build on it, I would expect that. But to be able to have that five, that mid-range five in her score line could be quite important coming down to the finish. Absolutely, and that's where the good start just puts you in a great position to really gain momentum throughout the heat too. And if you've seen what Macy's done every single heat that she's had this event, she's posting at least 11, 11 and a half points which means she's getting a six and a five the entire time. So she at least has one of those scores so far. And there's the one for Betty Lou, a 4.43. So as I said before, you at least want something that will match or rival the five that your opponent has. Unfortunately, in this case, that didn't happen, Shannon. Falling short by more than a point, which could hit, hurt her in the end. Macy with priority now chasing a 2.43 to take that lead away. And Betty Lou's going to have a go on this one on the paddle back out. Nice bully section in front of her. Extends those legs so strong on that first section. And she'll have to kick out. She's catching these waves too far inside. She's too late on the takeoff. She's not getting into the section early enough to actually commit to it and have the steepness when she's riding out of the turn. As you saw right there, she had to do more of a carve rather than actual hit into a lip. And you're not going to get the same scores, especially after seeing the 5.67 and the two turn column on the outside. So looking at the replay here, see how she's laid on it too. So almost gets the airdrop, but see how flat it went when she was actually going into the lip. That's not going to score very well with these kind of conditions out here. I would say if it were a bit bigger, yeah, that's fine, but not with this size right now. Just a 2.00 on the board for Johnson. Won't factor into her top two. And it does seem like maybe that, that edge of uh, age as well as experience that Macy Callahan has starting to come into the equation. She's been really patient. Mm -hmm. She took off on that opening ride. It was a great score. Just has a throwaway underneath it. And there we've got the camp for <laughs> Betty Lou Sucker Johnson, her mom, Shinubo <laughs> there. Mother of uh, Luana Silva as well. And it's been a great time to see the two, both Luana and Betty Lou, graduating to that championship tour together, coming out of the North Shore of Oahu, pushing each other, just about a year difference in their ages. And now to see them traveling together, their family spending some time together on the sand. Yeah, and Gabby Bryan also too, you know, they have a cool little sisterhood going on. And it was cool to see all of them qualify at the same time too. And guess where it all started? At this event last year, the first Challenger Series ever. So. It was cool to see that kind of dynamic, especially play out at Haleiwa when Be Betty Lou needed a result last season to qualify for the championship tour. She qualified in her first full year of competition at only 16 years of age. And now, as you said, you know, a little bit more mature, 17 years old. But I think despite that small age gap between her and Macy, I think there's a huge advantage in having won the World Pro Junior Championship and been on the CT for as many years as Macy was. It's so true. Macy has just so much more experience to draw from. But even saying that, I feel like the experience that Betty Lou has gained in the last year since quarterfinaling here in 2021, since taking that win last December at home in Haleiwa, the level of maturity that I see within her now, the experience that she's had, I think she's really applied everything that she possibly could in that short stint on the championship tour before the midseason cut. And I think she's all drawing from it, every single heat that she paddles out for. Betty Lou now with that first turn, car for the second, goes really soft here and flat on that middle section. And now she's gonna just keep that speed as she comes in for the finish. We're looking for power. We're looking for a link together between these finishing oh, maneuvers good. and she capitalizes so well. I was about to say, I didn't know why she was going on that wave when it was so flat on the outside. She just shut me up with that last turn, though, on the shore break. And that was radical. 17 minutes and 30 to go. Would probably have to say this is her best wave. So as I said, just a smaller one, not too big of a section on the outside, much flatter, too. Does the wrap right there. But look at the amount of speed she gains after this first setup turn right here. Just sets it up, and then a huge finish. I mean, when you see all three fins come out the back like that, it means that she had enough speed to actually capitalize with the amount of power that that lip had. So gonna be a good score. And especially based off of how poor the wave was, she actually made something out of nothing right there, Shannon. 
scores to come through. I'm excited to see where the judges will go with it and so that we can get a gauge on the reward for a good finishing section like Well, that. and I'm about to say, you want quality over quantity. Callahan had two good turns on the five, six, seven, but what are the points of difference, especially when it's a singular maneuver? That wave had it right there. It had that one spike, that one kind of moment where you're thinking at the end of the day, wow, how did she do that? And that explosiveness comes from surfing those kind of waves on the North Shore that have a lot of power. So I would even think this could be the best wave of the heat personally. 16 minutes, 20 seconds on the clock. Macy Callahan came out, started strong with that single score in that mid range of 5.67 has yet to back it up. She's been really patient as well. She hasn't caught anything in a while. Where Betty Lou's just stayed busy under priority. She's looked for a few different waves and it's paid off. Finding herself the highest score of the heat so far, Mitch, with a 6.93. And she manufactured that for sure, but takes the lead right now and has the best wave of the heat. Now Macy needing a 5.7. I still like her strategy, though, waiting. She knows that she needs to be on a set wave to compete with Sakura. And knowing Callahan, she's probably going to go left, too. If you look at her best results on both the QS and on the CT, she had a final against Courtney Conlog a few years ago in France. Her QS wins and her best results have all been at beach breaks, and it's mainly been because of her backhand attack. So I would not be surprised for her to look left again here, Shannon. Yeah, it was an amazing run that she had back in 2018 at the Roxy Pro France, making it into the finals, getting those call-ups to the championship tour that year as well before she'd ever properly, pro properly qualified. Big set coming right here. 15 minutes on the clock with priority. It's Callahan under priority Johnson. Callahan chasing a 5.7 now to take the lead as Betty Lou has increased that score line. And a dedicated paddle here from our surfer in red. Snap to wow. start on a huge section for Macy. Is she going to ride out of it? She's sticking those toes to no. the wax and just can't get that edge in front. Sakura. Hard off the bottom into a crazy looking lip. That just bowled out so much. Ouch. Hope she's okay. Seems like she is. Well, for both of them, they'll have maneuvers that go incomplete. That's a, sh a shame for Macy because it was a difficult section, but she nearly was able to sneak out in front. She, she misread that wave, though. She paddled into it way too late. I think she kind of thought that the wave was going to break a little bit further out. And Betty Lou, a little late to that section right there, almost misread it, too. So not the right angle, but see, she struggled to get into that wave. She was just too far out, and it just put her in a position where, despite the maneuver being as critical as it could have gotten, she wasn't able to ride out cleanly, and that's going to be deemed incomplete. It's a bummer and a shame, because that would have been the best wave of the heat. 13 minutes on the clock and a paddle from Betty Lou with priority now opting to go for the left, squares up and just mistimes that first turn. Mitch, it just seems like the rhythm has kind of dissipated. Yeah. I mean, you had a bad fall on the wave previous to this. Didn't need to really go on this one. You're in the lead. You're looking to better a 4-4-3. Kind of a desperation move right there, Shannon, where it would have been better to hold on to priority and maybe wait for the next set, especially knowing that Macy hasn't even made it back to the outside. So a rookie mistake there from Betty Lou. She'll be back out and try to better the 4-4-3 on the next wave she can go on, though. Macy Callahan now with priority at the 13 minute mark, chasing a 5.70 for her to take the lead away from Betty Lou Sakura Johnson. It's been a big day of competition so far and there's a little bit more to come. So stay tuned. We're gonna go to a quick break. We'll be back with more right after this.
directly following the, the, the women's and men's final is that. You can get a seat. You know what I also dig every day when I'm leaving? And I get the, the, the post show with the, our beautiful co-hosts there for the webcast. The monitor that's over on the, on the boardwalk on the north side of the pier. In front of the grassy knoll and all the benches and people kicking back, taking in all the action after the event. So Pete Young, Michael Guerrero, Shannon Hughes, Rich, Salazar, Chris Kay, all doing a great job all week long. Yeah, you can watch that on your WSL app on WorldSurfing.com. <laughs> so time to get down here, ladies, 11 minutes, 15 seconds. Why do I want to be on the championship tour? It's because it's all there, everyone wants it, and you're doing the Challenger Series to be there. It's the next step for me personally to pursue myself and learn more and be better as a competitor. I mean, I'm still learning, I'm still a kid, and I think this is the best way for me to like push through it with the positivity. I think we're all just stoked to keep going, and we know we're gonna be back there. The pier is packed here at the Vans U.S. Open of Surfing for finals day. The sun is shining, the wind has stayed away, and I think uh, we might see some more umbrellas popping up down on the beach as well as on the pier just to cover everyone from the sun because it has been shining. Specifically on Betty Lou Sakura Johnson in this heat, finding the best score with a 6.93 to improve on her 4.43. Macy Callahan has had an entirely different approach to this heat though, Mitch, getting that early score locked in and being very patient in selection for her last two opportunities. Yes, she has, and 10 minutes to go. Plenty of time on the clock for at least one exchange. You'd probably be hoping to get at least two just to get some more action in the water, but I, I enjoy these, heat, these heats a lot. As a baseball fan myself, I'd rather see a pitching duel rather than a home run derby, Shannon. And, these are, this is one of those heats where you just have a decent score. Nobody's really broken away with the lead so far. And look at Betty Lou just hanging on to positioning right there despite being under priority. And she does not want to give Macy a single inch where to work with. And one thing that we saw earlier today, and it's not very common to see it with a lot of longboarders, Kaniela Stewart actually pushed Justin Quintal out of position for the lefts at the beginning of the heat and never let, let him get started with his best scores. Look at what Betty Lou's doing right here. She's kind of put, pushing Macy out of position for the lefts, which have been her best scores so far in this event. See how she kind of pulled her away from that peak right there? That is smart, and only being 17 years old, she's going to be seeing that a lot more in the future too. She has some of the best in the business behind her with Ross Williams as her coach, writing Kelly Slater designs as well. She's had that duo to travel with in her rookie year on the championship tour as we will track with Macy on the split peak. She goes down. We'll try to find out if uh, Betty Lou Sakurt Johnson was able to find any rhythm on hers. But again, maybe just that sell. Well, and let's see what happens with priority here because it was a split peak. They're going to really have to convince our priority judge up there who's going to be rewarded priority. It seems like Macy is in the primary takeoff zone. She gets awarded priority after palling back out. She kind of stood up first, uh, then Betty Lou as well. So that could have happened. It could have gone to the rule book and just be like, hey, like rule establishes whatnot. But still, same situation, eight minutes to go. I, I still don't comprehend though how at this point there were a couple waves, the 3.67, the 2, and the big fall on the right for Betty Lou, where she could have easily bettered her low score. And there you see Macy needing a 5.7. I think those small and subtle mistakes, say if Betty Lou were actually to lose this final, those are the things that you need to look at and improve on. And look at the amount of waves that she's caught in comparison to Callahan. 8 to 4. And her semifinal also caught around 10 waves. So there's been a lot of... I don't want to say unnecessary use of energy, but I still feel like a lot of these waves don't need to be caught, Shannon. This is a good one, though. Still the Grom out in the water, now up and riding. Nice snap to start for Betty Lou. And finds that frothy section to connect with. Now looking for this reform. Putting all the work in, and it doesn't look like it's going to reform for her enough. So she'll fall out. Macy still holding on to priority. And the pack behind Betty Lou 
up and up and standing on their feet. Yeah, Ken and Carr right there as well. So they're stoked. I think this wave for sure going to get rid of the 4.43. Get a positioning for her and Macy was nowhere to be seen for that wave at all. Could have easily been the score that she was needing to get the 5.7 or better. And here's the replay. Good engagement of the rails coming off of the bottom right there. More of a setup snap, but then the second one up into the lip with a bit more release. Can't get the Shorey connection, but this was a good wave, and I like the second use of priority right here from Betty Lou underneath Macy's, and just knowing that she wasn't anywhere to be found. Good use of strategy right there, and looking to better the 4.43, think she's done that. Six minutes, 15 seconds on the clock, and the young surfer in the water currently controlling the situation. Now in her young years and her young career, she's already had some great success. She won last year on a Challenger Series level at home in, in Haliva. But even going back to 2020, when she first started competing on the qualifying series level, she won the very first event she ever entered. It was 14 years old to take out the 2020 Papara Pro Open in Papara, Tahiti. Yeah where she took out her good friend in Luana Silva. That was her very first event. Since then, she's already taken out some other victories. And she had close to a perfect final in that one, actually. Waves were pumping at Paparai, and there's a Hawaiian connection here in Huntington Beach, too. Ezekiel Lau, who's coming up in the men's final, he actually was an NSA, NSSA Open Men's National Champion here in 2013. Kaimana Hakias also won the Open Men's National title here uh, over a decade ago. and. Hawaiians have had a lot of success. Coco Ho, Malia Manuel. I do want to say that not only are they some of the most prevalent surfers in Southern California, but they also have a lot of preparation when it comes to amateur events. So good to see that they're still prevailing here in two finals. Taking a look at the heat recap, Macy Callahan had that strong start. Yeah, 5.67, a, a great start. And looking back at it, it was a good wave too. And then this is Betty Lou's best, the 6.93. Just a small turn on the outside, but the Shorey right here, the beautiful setup turn, and then the most explosive maneuver we've seen all heat long, just textbook. And betters her low score, a 5.07 on this one on the back end. Good use of second priority and bashing the lip right there on the back end. So Betty Lou so far in control with 12 points, Shannon. She's staying sharp, she's staying in the moment, and she's had a lot of waves, but she's been able to increase on that heat total with a 5.07 as her last. Macy Callahan needing a 6.34, uses priority on this wave. First turn and loses a bit of control. Good pressure right there from Betty Lou, forcing Macy to make a mistake, and with four minutes to go, it's all gonna be about control right here. Pressure, positioning, and making sure that you're forcing Macy to go on a wave that is not gonna give you, give her the 6.34. Less than four minutes on the clock and I can hear the cheers of our men's finalists running down the beach. Joao Chianca up against Ezekiel Lau. And this is going to be one for the ages. Joao Chianca coming, coming off of his rookie season on the championship tour looking for the first big victory of his life, but already sitting on his personal best result. Up against Zeke Lau, who's tasted some sweet victory and is looking to requalify himself for the championship tour. Yeah, he's been a finalist in smaller events, but nothing as far as the challengers go. Here goes Betty Lou. Betty Lou, Ooh. nice snap. Let's that tail loose and she'll now redirect for that reform. Nice S work. And now starting to go into that Huntington hop. Looking for that connection. It'll stand up for her. And she won't be able to connect for a finishing turn. Macy Callahan's last score, a 2.77. Keeps her still chasing the highest score for her heat, a 6.34. Betty Lou with the highest score of the heat with a 6.93. Still think it was the right decision to go on this wave though. Anything under three minutes, you just need to take away every single opportunity that your opponent can get. Get a pressure though by Macy. And it was a solid turn on the outside. Only looking to better a 507. I mean, it was strong. Probably gonna be around his mid four though, her mid four and here's Macy. Live action, so we'll see what happened out the back. I'm guessing she probably got a couple of turns in. Have a look at this set as well. Now Macy's gonna make it back with priority. 
Betty Lou with a farther paddle because she kicked off on the sand. And we do have scores to come through for both. Let's take a look at what Macy got up to. A good looking wave too. Beautiful first turn, a strong second one as well. And then this wave just faded out in the in the midsection right here. But that Inferno 72 from Sharp Eye looking good under her feet. It's a round tail using those DHD honeycomb future fins too. I still like the position that I'm seeing out of Macy. Is it her best wave though? Is it better than the 5.67? I personally don't think so. Now the good news for her is that Betty Lou did not increase her situation. A 4-3-3 for last of blue. But scores coming through now for Macy. And while it does jump into her top two, it's not the 6-3-4 she requires. Just a 4.73. And she remains in that runner-up position to Betty Lou Sakura Johnson, which is a position that Macy's familiar with at this high QS level now into Challenger Series. She had those back-to-back runner-up finishes at the Port Stevens Toyota Pro in Australia, but both results that led her into that qualification conversation for the CT. It also is a great result for Macy, walking away with another final. Two second-place finishes is going to have her high up in the rankings. And regardless of how the rest of this heat unfolds, we will have Macy Callahan sitting at number three on the Challenger Series rankings with Betty Lusa Kerr Johnson just behind in number four. 35 seconds though, there might be something on the outside and a 634 is not impossible. So we'll see what happens right here in the last 30 seconds. But Betty Lou so far, just it's been consistency of gaining those high scoring heats and 12 points today. As I told you, I think that's gonna be a decent total, a couple of sixes and guess what? It's gonna be Hawaii on the podium yet again. He's gonna be your champion. Kelis Kaleopa'a took the win for Hawaii for the island of Oahu in our women's duct tape invitational. And now Betty Lou Sakura Johnson, the Grom from the North Shore of Oahu, is your 2022 Vans U.S. Open of Surfing champion, taking out her friend in Macy Callahan in a well-fought battle between the two. Betty Lou finishing off with a 12-point heat total and all the emotions with the moms. That's awesome. It's awesome to see. Congratulations to Macy. A lot of consistency in the last two events. And as you mentioned, now number three in the rankings. But how about Betty Lou Sakura Johnson? Two Challenger Series wins in as many years. Congratulations to her at only 17 years of age. Incredible consistency from the young Hawaiians. Betty Lou Sakura Johnson, your 2022 Vans US Open of Surfing winner. The men's final, Zeke Lau and Joao Chianka. Will another Hawaiian take it? We'll find out.
We're back at the Vans US Open of surfing and it's finals time, our last final of the event. It's the Men's Challenger Series final out in the water. Stop number four on the World Surf League Challenger Series. And out in the water, we have an interesting mix with Ezekiel Lau versus Joao Chianca. I'm Kaipo. This is Peter Mel, the Hall of Famer. And, Mich and Mitchell Salazar also joining us on the call. Mitchell, that was an exciting women's final that we just came off of. Yeah, it was, it was great. Uh, congratulations to Macy Callahan, but how about the 17-year-old Betty Lou Sakura Johnson? And now another Hawaiian in the men's final, too, with another opportunity to maybe even get, even get a sweep here in the open division. Let's see what happens, Peter. Uh, your early assessment of this final between Ezekiel Lau and Joao Chianca. Very, very eager, and uh, I would say even um, experienced crew between Joao Chianca and Ezekiel Lau here. I mean, obviously, Ezekiel Lau probably having a bit more experience than Joao, but uh, both championship tour caliber surfers here in the final, uh, both exciting and raw, and I expect uh, fireworks here. And it looks like uh, early they're going to give each other a little room to yeah. start this heat off. Both surfers, Mitchell, um, victims of that mid-year, mid-season cut on the championship tour. And so both of these surfers trying to battle their way through the Challenger Series to get back on to the 2023 championship tour. Yeah, to me, the biggest difference between both surfers is the amount of experience that Zeke Lau has in higher level competition. He's won a couple of six star primes before, Sunset Beach, uh, Eris Era, and now coming back here in his career best performance so far at the Vans US Open. I think he's not only looked consistent, but his equipment has looked great. I really love the choice to switch over to Tokoro surfboards under Wei Tokoro now. And obviously, they've been working so far, he's in the final. Yeah, Peter, it was those victories, especially last year at Eris Era, which enabled Ezekiel Lau to use the Challenger Series to get on to the 2022 Championship Tour. He fell off in 2019, uh, but he's already had that proven track record in this Challenger Series, and it looks like he's on his way again. Yeah, exactly that, you know, and uh, already posting results and heading into, uh, you know, home for that final event, uh, coming into an event that he's the defending champion and at the uh, EDP Visla Air Sarah Pro. Those are um, an event that he would feel super confident in. Uh, you know, Sakurama is another Challenger Series event that's in between that and Haleiwa. But uh, yeah, Ezekiel looking good. And now uh, this is going to be a, in an optimum tie for Joao Shianka, who needed a result and needed some momentum. Um, you know, he's been surfing really well, but the heat results really haven't come. The Phenomena, the queen of Haleiwa, takes out another big victory. Let's hear from Betty Lou Sakura Johnson. All right, Betty Lou out here with all of her friends and family rooting her on that heat. Seems like it took everything you had. What was it that you were able to pull it off? Oh, thank you so much. Um, it's been a long week here at Huntington, um, but I have all the support. I have everything I need. I'm healthy. I'm, I've been training for this. So, um, yeah, super fortunate to take the win. How much confidence does this give you going into the last three events on the Challenger Series this year? Oh, it gives me a ton of confidence. Um, this is, I think this is probably one of the biggest events that we have on the Challenger Series. I mean, with the support and everyone's here watching, um, it's a huge event and I'm really, you know, this is my first event winning at Huntington Beach actually, so I've been always wanting to win a comp out here and super stoked I was able to do it here today. Now your mom during the heats, I think is almost as nervous as you are when you're out in the water. What did she say to you before you went out there and how did that impact your surfing? Oh, I, she tells me she's not nervous, but deep down she is. Um, but yeah, she was telling me you have everything here. Um, you know, you've, you've been going for so long, might as well just take out the win. And she's always been filling me up with positive vibes, um, good words. And yeah, I just I'm super thankful to have her on my corner. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. There you go, Sakura on her way as we check out Ezekiel Lau finishing off his ride, unable to ride out of the, in front of the Whitewater on that final maneuver. And so that's going to deem an incomplete finish, but he got some work done on the outside, fought for that position to get that wave while the two competitors were in open priority. And Zeke Lau on the paddle back out. So at the beginning of that wave, Peter, it looked like it was a little bit of a battle between Joao Chianca and Ezekiel Lau. Yeah, I don't think Joao totally backs down to it, but I would say Zeke's a pretty intimidating <laughs> surfer, right? Like, 
he definitely was kicking and scratching. He was in better position, and that's what it took was the fact that he put himself in a better position. This wave shut down pretty quickly, but beautiful work there just to bash that lip. I mean, a very strong maneuver. Just unfortunate that he didn't get this completion because that would have solidified the score in a big way. We know full well, even if you get the rotation, you got to ride out in front of that white water for those judges upstairs to deem it complete. So really going to get a score just for that one maneuver. Although all week long, if you get a nice strong maneuver on that outside section, the judges have been very good about giving you a score. Yeah, that's right. So we're waiting for the score for Ezekiel Lau. Just a fractional score checking in for Joao Chianca. Ezekiel Lau on the Challenger Series did start off with a pretty good keeper result. A ninth place finish at the Boost Mobile Gold Coast Pro. And uh, it was it was challenging snapper for that event, but Zeke with that ninth place finish. That's going to be a throwaway at the Sydney Surf Pro. That's going to be a throwaway at the Bolito Pro. So he's really going to be leaning on uh, his results for the back half of the year on the Challenger Series, Mitchell. Yeah, and look, uh, looking at the last three events to Aracero, where he's won before, he's competed at Sakuarema in big events before, and obviously we know what he can do at Haleiwa, so I think not only is the back end beneficial to him, I also think with the amount of experience momentum that he's gaining right now, he's going to look unstoppable to qualify for next year's Championship Tour Cup. I will say also that 10,000 points is basically like two results, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's two 5,000s if you split it in half, so a win is so important, uh, and I know that he wants it more than anyone. Joao Chianca, by contrast, uh, this is his first meaningful result this year on the Challenger Series. You can see a 37th at the Gold Coast, a 49th in Sydney, a frustrating 37th in Belito. So finally, this breakthrough, Peter, for Joao Chianca can actually give him some momentum again through the back half of this Challenger Series. Yeah, and he needs four results. A uh, win here, though, is like two. Also heading to his home turf, literally. He lives in Sakurama, so he would know that wave so well and be very comfortable sleeping in his own bed. Yeah, that will be stop number six on the Challenger Series that kicks off November 1st uh, before we conclude everything at Haleiwa Ali'i Beach Park uh, for the conclusion of the Challenger Series year. And that's when we qualify the top 10 men and the top five women to the championship tour. Mitchell. I want to say something, though, about Joao and the resilience that he's had this year because Despite maybe not requalifying in the first half of the championship tour, the amount of performances, the great performances that he had, to be able to bounce, bounce back after that, especially after the poor three results in the first three Challenger Series, this is a big win for him mentally. And I think obviously his boards, Britt Merrick and Brent Power being uh, down here from Channel Islands, it's huge. And they're supporting him in a big way. And mm -hmm. you know that he's riding that CI Pro, which actually was the stab in the dark winner yep. uh, this season, this year. So. Um, you know, that's a board that's a new design out of, of Channel Islands, and uh, you can see that Josh Yonka riding to success. All right, well, the number's in for Zeke Lau, a 4.17. So that's the start for the Hawaiian as we um, see the clock tick down. 24 minutes, still plenty of time remaining. Josh Shianka is sitting patiently with priority. And Zeke Lau taking a, you know, it's probably a secondary role on the sandbar, Peter. What do you think about his positioning? Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> giving a little bit of a gap, um, <laughs> you know, but I think in what two strokes he's right there. So it's not like it's a huge uh, position change. But I mean, I think that he's ultimately uh, looking at the possibility of some rights, uh, you know, give a little space. Well, I mean, at this I'm, point, what I'm alluding to is the fact that Zeke Lau has second priority. So. There's no use for him to sit next to Joao Chianca Mitchell. He just needs to sit at this point in the heat where the best waves are. And I think he's obviously been looking out at it. And sorry, I just dropped right in on jo <laughs> Mitchell here. But uh, I thought you said Mel. There, with that separation, able to get this wave under priority, throws the tail, spins it around. And that's exactly what he was looking for as he just distanced himself from Joao Chianca. So he got the outside maneuver now, bouncing to the inside shore break. Moving down the line, looking for finish, throws the air wow. in the short break, clicks it, Pull hits it. the Ooh, cat it out, out it in out. front of there the white is. water, and that's yeah. going to be complete. <laughs> sells it to the crowd. Uh, he had to sell that one for sure. Gianca catching up there, missed time for the finish, so we'll see what he got done on the outside. Um, but a little bit of missed timing for the finish for Joao Gianca, Shumbino, uh, but Zeke Lau. Just as we we're talking about it, you know, took an alternative kind of position out there underneath the priority of Joao Chianca's well played strategy, high heat IQ, and execution, Mitchell. Yeah, but look at what he's done every single heat that he served so far. He wants to be on the first wave of the heat, make sure that he's getting a score, 
in the first minute or two. And it was good reaction time there from Zeke on the Shorey too. Looking at Joao's wave on the outside though. He stuck to the left almost all event long. A great turn on the back and that's kind of his dynamic and spicy surfing that he's presented with that CI Pro. But as you were saying here, just not able to time that section well. Still went up into the lip though, so gonna add a little bit of points. But this right, Pete, is definitely the best way of the heat to yeah, me. Yeah, a little tail whip reverse out there again, showing a little point of difference on a little softer wave. Of course, uh, the inside, I love what he's able to do here. Again, just going up and over, getting nice pop with that EPS to Coro. And he'll make sure that he's gonna ride it out. And of course, looking up the judges, see, look. <laughs> I'm out front. We hey. saw that uh, <laughs> earlier today where he had an error that it was pretty right. well pulled, right? But it wasn't so completely ridden out of it. And uh, judges basically made it clear you Can need I to ride out in front of that white water because it was only a 3.67 when it actually probably should have been, you know, like in his yeah. eyes, probably a six. I like the eyes to the tower there <laughs> yeah. and, and that example. Uh, we're still anticipating both scores. Let me say something, though. That is a big guy. Yeah, 6'2", 202 pounds. And doing that air on the inside, gaining that amount of speed there, for people that have not surfed this way before, that shore break does not let you garner that amount yeah, of no, speed. There's no, there's zero energy there, yeah. right? I mean, it's rolling up the sand. There's no, you know, real push. <laughs> so the fact that he actually made sure that he wrote it out of it, just selling it completely, uh, he knows how, that just shows how important this is to him. 5.1 for Shianka, still waiting for last score. Still waiting for the number for this ride, Mitchell. Dude, look at that. I mean, those two pumps at the end, and then that's a tail high air reverse, too. Make sure to pull it off. And he gives the stare down. He's like, there it is. I gave it to you on a silver platter. Numbers of 5.5 for Ezekiel Lau. So Only a, a little bit different. of separation between the two rides. And um, I think Ezekiel Lau may be puzzled a little bit when he hears the number come to his ears. He does have the lead, however, over Joao Chianca. Yeah, that, to me, it's puzzling to me a little bit. I mean, I feel like there could have been a bit more separation between those two waves. I mean, the dynamic outside move, the dynamic inside move, uh, whereas Chianca really got that nice, strong backside hook, and really, that was kind of it. Here goes Zeke, looking left, winding up the hatchet. It chops it down, but pokes the nose. Pearl's incomplete. Yeah, I mean, for a big guy, that section right there where it starts to go flat real quick, if you don't have the right amount of speed for that section, you're just not going to ride out of it. But going back to the 5.5, I think it's really important to describe to our audience that, yes, there wasn't a huge amount of variation, but the throw tail on the outside reverse was completely different to the air reverse on the inside, though. So I thought it personally could have been a little bit higher myself. I think That's we're him. all across the board um, in the game on that, but we're just going to see Ezekiel Lau continue to surf through. What, Pete? Yeah, it was real. It's, yeah, that, that he got the air on the inside again. Zero energy in that wave, so he had to work. You saw him kind of pushing and pedaling to get back into it. Of course, the judges want to see you not have to do that, right, and ride out clean. So again, that probably factored in slightly. But who's done an air on the inside all week long, though? Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree with you. You know, yeah, like maybe maybe two or three people at the most, but for somebody his size, that's extremely difficult to do right there. I think that's good, the surfboard choice today. Less energy in the water for sure, and he's given himself a little extra spark. Let's review that surfboard choice for Ezekiel Lau. What exactly were we talking about? This one, the yellow one here, is a 6.0 and a half, uh, comparatively to the, the PU board, which he's rode throughout the week. Uh, that one's 6.0. Um, this one is narrower by an eighth of an inch. The other one is six uh, or 18 and an eighth. This one is just, or sorry, 19 and an eighth. This one is 19. So it's just slightly different. A little longer, a little narrower. But EPS technology Ooh. meaning it's got a styrofoam core well, rather than EPS a PU is core. floating nicely on this wave right now. A couple turns out the back for Ezekiel Lau, making his way into the shore break. Fades left. Now he's going to go right. And Zeke with the big snap to finish there. Right behind him is Joao Chianca. Joao kicking out, not able to make the connection into the shore break. So we'll see how that works out in this fat last exchange. Wave is uh, wave choice. Zeke Lau seems to be on point. I mean, right. how's this where you just got you know, wave after wave too? We like the action, but definitely Zeke seems to be able to connect the inside with ease. Again, under priority, he scored that wave. Here is a replay, Mitchell, of Joao Chianca. Yeah, beautiful first turn. And how was that elongated bottom turn, too? Not easy to do at a beach break, especially when the section's going flat like that at the end. But I agree with you, Pete. Zeke has had excellent wave choice 
all week long. That's the kind of setup turn, but the second one right there, nice and snappy under the lip. That's what that EPS does. It gives you that little quickness in the maneuver. You can see it's a distinct point of difference. Again, nice, strong finish, a little snap. That's his size, too. You know, he's tall, so he's able to really whip in and out of his maneuvers. There you go, Dwayne DeSoto, um, Zeke's wife, Jenna, and Kuil Young all over there in the Hawaiian corner of the surfer's deck. And they like what they saw from the big guy, Ezekiel Lau. I like it. 16 minutes and 55 seconds so far. He's had a good balance of heat wins on both the lefts and the rights. And earlier this morning, as you gentlemen were saying, he's had good heats where he's been able to distribute those waves across 30 or 35 minutes, Kaipo. Zeke knows how to play the game, and he's playing it well right now. But Joao Chianca, that electric surfing that he's able to provide all week long, Peter, he can easily gar gardener huge scores. For sure. Um, yeah, and, and uh, he's in this heat, too. I mean, a 5-5 as five, five the high number, and, you know, Joao only has the 5-1-0. Oh. I'm just reflecting, actually, and I think, I, as I remember, Zeke Lau's first real big win was a national title, an NSSA national yeah. title, and it was right, right here, here at this beach. And so there's fond memories uh, of that, because that, that first national title win was huge. Uh, and, you know, you would remember that and know that you're like, oh, I got success here at Huntington Beach. Anytime you come here, you're like, you can draw off those, those past results. All right, the two scores come in, and a 4.6 for Ezekiel Lau, a 5.2 for Joao Chianco. So I feel like the judges are really honoring those outside backhand hooks from Chianca. Yeah, and I think the bottom turn was really a big key to that score, too. I would agree with if, that. If we could... Look Points at that difference. replay, right? And the, the subtlety of that maneuver here at a beach break like this, too, is so unique and so different to what we normally see from those one turn waves on the outside. Junko with priority. He's going to take it left again into the pier, looking down the line. Vert little snap down, speeding through that second turn, pokes mm. the nose, incomplete. Now, some chance for Ezekiel allowed to answer back. Zeke needing 4.8 to turn this heat. And Zeke with priority. Can Ezekiel Lau turn the heat and take the win here at Huntington? We're going to find out when we come back with the conclusion of the men's final. Back throws the tail, uh -oh. spins around the revert, no problem. We've been working our way to finals day all week long, and we have arrived. Have some faith, I'll make you a believer. 
a compilation of the Flying Embers Air of the Day, an award that we've handed out every single day. And there's been, uh, it's been a hotly contested award. A lot of aerials going down here, Southside Huntington Pier. Thanks to Flying Embers for taking care of that air of the day. What was your favorite, Peter? I would think the Aton one on the outside section, I think that was pretty much the favorite for, I would say, the majority of people. Um, you know, it was big, and that's all that counts, right? It was one of the biggest airs we've seen uh, at this event. But that's what we want to see at Huntington Beach. I want to see progression. Wow, look at this set. Set looming, priority with Joao Chianco, Shumbino. A little soft carve off the top there, a lot of space. Bangs the oncoming section, wants to maintain forward momentum as the waves converge. Not going to give him a chance to continue with that energy into the shore break. Chianco, however, does have the lead over Ezekiel Lau. Priority switches to Ezekiel Lau at this moment, Mitch. Yeah, and he got a wave, a 3.77 that doesn't go into his top two, so doesn't seem like Sh Joao said should better his low score either right here and Pete we were talking about that kind of diversity of scores that Zeke has had as we're seeing the replay right here another left a great turn right there just seems like the section wasn't standing up as much as his other two scores though but we were talking about that kind of diversity of waves that he's caught over the course of this this event to me it just seems like he's he's such a good headspace knowing that he's won here and he's had a lot of competitive success it seems to me that Joao hasn't had that before, and in these high-pressure situations, that could make a big difference. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, again, there's a bit of an error here. But uh, I, I would like to see maybe um, these servers look at these rights, because uh, you know, with this kind of fuller tide against the grain, kind of would seem like to me, because it's really tough to, to do those backside hooks with any kind of, there's no power once that wave flattens out like that. So it feels like a right might be a good call. All right, so here we go with Joao Chianca, and uh, he's going down the line, and a big throw tail there on that oncoming section, looking just so light. Looks back to see what Ezekiel <laughs> Lau's doing before he connects to the shore break. Now, Shumbino paying attention to what's wow. in front of him with a big vertical on the inside, right behind him. The dance, the tap dance through this flat section by Ezekiel Lau to make the connection, unable to make the connection, Ezekiel Lau. So again, the advantage going to Joao Chianca on that exchange. Outside move, you mentioned it, in a smaller way, but he gave everything. There was commitment on that snap on the outside section, and I really like the inside hook too. Replay, Mitchell. Yeah, so this was what Zeke did on the outside. Good first turn right there, up and over the lip, and an even better second one. This should score well for Zeke, the surfer from Oahu. And then this was Joao's right on cue, Pete, as you were saying. You want to see somebody go right? Beautiful layback right here. I mean, that's committed. You know, he fully laid into it. I'm just going to say one thing, though. Yeah. The section was much flatter. Yep. It was a much easier section. I would agree. I would say this last turn, though, is the hardest one out of the two. Oh. The other angle was way better, though. <laughs> and I love that he just, like, turns this around. Up on the inside, here's a replay that Ooh. Wow, this happened during okay. us catching up on those replays. So Joao really active out here. And we're waiting for scores from the judges. 2-4 Joao Gianca, 1-4 Ezekiel Lau. And while we're waiting for those scores, let's see what the fans thought online. Who's going to win this final? For that, we turn to the Pacifico fan picks. 65% Mitchell picking Joao Chianca. Surprising, to be honest. I thought that with the experience and the amount of competitive, competitive success that Zeke's had out here, he would be the favorite, honestly. But I think that with the success and performances that Joao has had this year, a lot of people pick him. <laughs> well, you, you know, how you fan pick, it's uh, WorldSurfLeague.com. It's a global audience. And we know we have a giant audience in Brazil. True. And I'm sure they are up. It's and, a little bigger than Hawaii. And cheering <laughs> for Joao Chianca. 6.9 checks in for Ezekiel Lau. Yep. 6.23 for Joao Chianca. One more score for Chianca. But Zeke Lau for the moment goes up into the lead. Chianca now trailing. Needs a 6.18. Judges owe us a score. And we're waiting for that number to see if that changes the situation. I will say, though, that uh, the judges were very keen on those two top to bottom turns. There was a snap and he straightly engaged back in the bottom turn to get that second maneuver done. That's why it's the best number of the heat. The outside work, those two committed maneuvers outside. 
didn't need even an inside connection. So there you go, the comeback for Ezekiel Lau, 4.57, last to Shianka. So situation, Zeke Lau in the lead. Shianka trailing, needing a 6.18. Mitchell, now we got a final, and it's coming down to these last seven minutes. Yeah, and you know the strategic, strategist Lau, he is great with priority, and he's been in the situation many times before, especially with seven minutes to go. You know there's going to be at least one opportunity out here, Kaipo, but Pete... Looking at this heat fold out, I still think that they got it right with the 6.9, two big sections on the outside. And comparison, in comparison to the 6.23, you have the flatter section on the right, good variation with the layback. But really, I think the meat of the score came from the inside turn on the left. So I still like the reflecting back on the 6.9. Well, and again, it's like you, judges have been pretty clear in, in regards to getting the bigger numbers. You need to have those steeper sections that came on Zeke Lau's way. As a matter of fact, you know, he waited, let the first one go. Mm -hmm. I, I do feel, though, that Xiao probably surfed that wave up in its potential. Yep, you know, 100%. Because uh, it was that flatter section, and he did everything he could with it. And then the inside turn, too, was good. So, really, he turned that, you know, five-plus wave into a six. In the framework of the heat, we call this heat control by Ezekiel Lau. He has the lead, he has priority, and he has low numbers on the clock. Six minutes remaining. Still enough time for Shianka to mount a comeback, but with this heat control, Ezekiel Lau is able to really control the tempo and the pace of the heat and what's going on. He's the guy in the driver's seat making the decisions right now, Mitchell. Yeah, time management is going to be a big thing right here, Kaipo. 5.40 to go. You want to let Joao go on anything smaller than the 6.9 that you got, really. So if it's not a set wave, something comparable to those two best waves of yours, let it go by. Do not even flinch. Pete, I've said it before. To play the game, to, to win the game, you need to play the game. How do you play the game right now with five minutes remaining? Who are you referring to? Ezekiel Lau, <laughs> who's, in the, who's in the control in this heat right yeah. now. Uh, I mean, at this point... Yeah, he, he can't completely cover Joao. It's just too much. Um, there's too much time on the clock in my eyes. There's still an opportunity for maybe a set, you know, a two-wave two set or even, uh, you know, two opportunities. Um, but he needs to understand that if there is a set wave, he's got to choose the best one of it. He's just going to let Joao go on this one, seeing that it has a bit of a shoulder. He's not even looking at this one. Smart. And he was smart decision <laughs> That's what it right is. There. I mean, those choices have to be correct choices, you know. Um, if he sees that there's going to be a way with a little extra energy in it, a little double up on it, he's got to take it, and he's got to improve on the 5.5. Five. That's what it comes down to. The next choice he makes has to be an improvement with the 5.5. Five. Typo, can I say something? You, of that's course. Like, no, 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 no. Now, now, now I know why it's physically intimidating working with Pete all the time, because every what time I've worked with him, it's yeah. always been on the other seat. Right. I'm right next to him right yeah. now, and I know that's just got to do with me. We're talking about Ezekiel. talk over you a couple times, too. <laughs> Let's check out the heat recap and see how Ezekiel Lau ended up in the driver's seat right now. It started with Zeke Lau, Mitch. Yeah, a great wave right here, the 5.5, which I think looking back at, it, back at it could have even been higher right here. The inside shorey connection with the get air reverse on the inside, that was tail high. So surprised the score was only kept that low. But then Joao Chumbinho came back afterwards with the whistle one, Pete. This is, uh, yeah, the 6-2-3. Again, I feel like he surfed this one up its potential. It was a smaller outside section, and especially this one here, just so quick. A little tomahawk on the inside. Best wave here from Zeke Loud. Engaging inside rail, outside rail, inside rail, outside rail on the outside section. Best wave of the heat. Live action, couple hooks from Joao Chianca moving down the line with speed and a pretty gutless wave. So amazing how much speed he's able to generate tic-tacking through the flat water here for the connection. Gets the connection to the Shori, throws it wow. up and exaggerated snap at the end by Joao Chianca selling the judges, selling the judges a 6.18 or better and taking wants to take the lead off of Ezekiel out. Pete, do you think he, he sold him? Let's take a look at the replay. Beautiful hook that again spray off the rail, straight back into that next section. Love it where he's going straight to the bottom. I don't know how he was able to get that much speed across those flatter section there. It really did. He actually uh, that was electric. Yeah, he did. You know, a lot of speed carried through those maneuvers. Boy, it looks incredible, honestly. It looks springy. It looks very responsive. No wonder it won stab in the dark. Six point one eight and. Um, 
I don't want to jinx the score right now, so I'm I'm just going to watch this play out and see what the numbers come in <laughs> from the judges. What do you think, Pete? Just shy. Okay, I, li I like the commitment that you came in with that. So maybe the size of the wave coming into factor. It was speedy electric surfing, and you're right, Pete. A 5.07, not enough for Joao Chianca, and Ezekiel Lau continues to lead this final match. Much smaller sections, much flatter on the outside, too. I thought the best turn was actually the one where he redirected, right? So good scoring right there, still not beating red based off of two waves. And now with two minutes to go, it's positioning and control time for Zeke Lau out there with priority. It's a two-minute drill for Ezekiel Lau at this moment, and he's done this drill in real-life heats, and he's done it hundreds of times practicing for this. He's sitting steady and head on a swivel, making sure he's going to take every opportunity holding that priority. Look at him scoot up, Peter, to Joao Chianca, and now he's going to be chasing him. Looks like two waves here, too. Let's see what happens. Go on the first one, though. Take away the opportunity right here, in my opinion. It's going to let Joao go on this one. Chianca late to that, but pulls it down. Pretty dynamic maneuver on the outside. And now just cruising, not using too much energy through this midsection. He knows he's going to need a spectacular finish on the shore. And this wave double triples up with a bunch of steps. And late to the lip there. So that's not going to be the 6.18. Uh, he's calling it a heat. That's it with a minute to go. Yeah, I'm not completely sold, unfortunately. I think that the, the little stumble on the closeout on the inside didn't quite get it done. But we'll see. I mean, I, again, I'm not the judge. Stranger things have happened <laughs> not, in the world of pro surfing, Mitchell. Not just that. I, I don't think the maneuver on the outside was good enough to merit even close to five, five and a half points. You know, how much are you giving to the inside section right there where it's dirty, it's late to the section, and now here goes Zeke, the heat leader. And this is just going to be a ride to the beach because likely Joao Gianca is not going to get the number. But we're unable to make it official as of yet. Numbers trickling through for Joao Gianca. It's not oh. going to be enough. So right now you're watching the final ride for the 2022 Vans U.S. Open of Surfing Champion. Give it up as he hits the beach for Ezekiel Lau and the Hawaiian corner is going wild. Wow, huge win for Zeke, moving up in the rankings big time. He's going to move up into the top 15, and with this result right here, getting the hug there from his boy Keanu Singh. Huge result for Hawaii right here on Ezekiel Lau. Josh Moniz and Keanu Singh in the shore break to greet their good friend and congratulate him on a tremendous win. Again, your 2022 Vans U.S. Open of Surfing champion, Ezekiel Lau is going to enjoy this chair up the beach. Is there a better feeling, Pete? I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that it's pretty darn good, though. <laughs> well, Ezekiel's feeling it. Zeke uh, <laughs> make his way through the crowd, Mitchell. Yeah, and props to Zeke, too, because he's never the favorite in these kind of conditions either. He had to come from behind a lot of heats to win them as well. And even this one, too, he had his back up against the wall, showed his resilience and persistence to get that 6.9 and eventually the lead beat. Yeah, and if you remember the very first couple days of this event, uh, it was small, you yeah. know, and he had to work through that. Um, you know, then we got some swell, but then, you know what? Finals day, not exactly, as you mentioned, uh, one, of the th one of the favorites going into it, just, uh, you know, a big man, you know, but man, he surfs so good in the small waves, and that's what you have to do, especially on this Challenger Series. There's going to be those days that you're going to have to make it happen, and he did that. He does have the desire, I will say. Listening in on what it sounds like to get carried up a champion. Look at that smile, too. Uh, he knows how important this is. It's solidification of that ability to get back to the championship tour. 10,000 points is just huge. What a result then. I mean, he's had, what, four wins at the Six Star Prime Challenger Series level now, too? So he's had a few of them. And I think seeing the start of the year now for the championship tour going to 2023, pipeline that Sunset Beach, he's got two events, Kaipo, at home where he could easily do well. Well, he's got to come through this Challenger Series first, but that's a good start right now. He's going to have 10,000 points to his credit. 
Ezekiel Lau. And look at the crowd that has just made their way to the Vans US Open of Surfing this Sunday. Wall to wall people. And an exciting event again. This event, Pete, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Sure is, kind days. And that's the thing, there's just uh, so much energy, uh, you know, just walking out the beach, you know, you can feel it. And, you know, to be able to kind of stay focused and rested throughout the entire nine days is a feat in its own. Let's hear from our champ, AJ's with Ezekiel Lau. Zeke, you just won the 2022 Vans US Open of Surfing. What is the emotion that you're feeling right now? I don't even know. It hasn't really set in yet. I'm just so stoked. I've always wanted to win the US Open. You know, it's been an event I've watched since I was such a young kid, and I've competed out at Huntington Beach for so long. And, you know, I've always uh, admired this event, and, you know, I've always wanted to win it. Andy Irons won it a few years back, and, you know, he was my role model, and I wanted to do it, and this is for him and Sonny and all the Hawaiians, and there's so much Hawaiians in finals today. I was so stoked to be a part of that. Yeah, it's a Hawaiian sweep in the Vans U.S. Open. What does this mean for Hawaii? Uh, it means everything. You know, we're just, uh, we're all here trying to do the same thing, and that's represent Hawaii, and, you know, I was just really proud and happy to, you know, be here on finals day with all of them. Everyone was putting on, you know, crazy performances, and, you know, when Betty Lou won hers, I was like, oh, it's up to me now. I got to I gotta go put this away. The pressure's all the way on, but you're no stranger to pressure. You got those two-minute drills, the finals drills. How did the mental work that you put in come into play in this final heat? Uh, for me, those those finals are all mental. You know, you, you decide, you know, do I want to get second or do I want to win right now? And, you know, you got to make those decisions while you're in the water. So, you know, I'm not trying to make the heat anymore. I'm trying to win, and that's what I was doing out there. And, you know, I went hard at it in the beginning, tried to get some scores on the board. and be offensive and then you know towards the end needing scores and seeing what the situation was was just you know making those clutch decisions whether to go on waves or not and the decisions played off is there anything you want to say to your friends and family back home um for everyone back home my parents all my loved ones you know my my family all my friends thank you so much it's been a long year and you know this feels good and you know i love all you guys and i'll see you guys soon Aloha. congratulations thank you <laughs> stay tuned for the 805 post show
Surf fans, welcome to the 805 Post Show, the final post show of what has been an epic Vans U.S. Open of Surfing. Chris Cote, here with Shen Hughes and Pete Mel. And uh, wow, there's a lot to unpack from finals day. We started early and we wrapped it up on a beautiful afternoon here in Huntington Beach, Surf City. USA and the beach has just come alive. Two Hawaiians win in the Challenger Series and a mixed bag of surfers winning for the longboarders. It felt like today packed a week of surfing within a span of just a few hours. Uh, so this is going to be a really fun post show to talk about all the surfing we've just seen. I think this has just proven that the Vans US Open of surfing is back. It's been a few years since we've been able to see it at full force with all the fans down here, all the activations around the entire site, skating, everything else included. And to be able to see finals day light up with some really fun waves three hawaiians out of the four hawaiians in the finals took the win yeah a big day for hawaiian surfers and pete uh also uh, a day of underdogs you know ezekiel Lau, as i heard you guys talking during the final not necessarily the surfer you would pick in waves like this but he proved everyone wrong went out there and ripped from beginning to end taking out gel and he did a couple things to do that he picked the right board he used uh, the eps to help him today because it was a little less energy in the water but also just determination and grit you know he he went out there with a goal to win the Vans U.S. Open of Surfing, and he did not let anybody, he didn't disappoint anyone. He went out there and he achieved that goal. Yeah, and you know that that was a, a big emotional win for Ezekiel Lau. He's had a bit of a roller coaster surf career, often on tour, of course, winning the Ultimate Surfer, and now earning his spot on the top of the podium here at the Vans U.S. Open of Surfing. But going back to our first final of the day, the Vans Duct Tape Invitational women went out there and put on a show. Beautiful, fluid, graceful surfing. And uh, this was a, a great matchup. Some history between these two competitors, Kalis Kaleopa and Honolulu Bloomfield traditional surfing at its finest right here. Absolutely beautiful. Kalise just dancing her way through to the win in her first official head-to-head -head matchup with Honolulu Bloomfield, the three-time world champion. I think that in itself was a massive mental barrier that she had to hop through, and she did it with grace, with style, and with flow, and ticked every box of the judging criteria. Her wave selection, amazing, and to do it with her cousin Connie Ella Stewart in the water with her friends and family there to cheer her up, amazing. Big moment there, uh, Honolulu Bloomfield's basically won everything, came through and got second place, but uh, she's still right there up in the top ranks on the WSL Longboard Tour. So there you see the beach, everybody lining up. This is one of my favorite parts of the Vans, US Open of Surfing, our award ceremony and our master of ceremonies. I'm gonna throw it over to Kaipo Guerrero. Uh, thank you so much, Chris. And thank you, Huntington Beach, for coming out. <laughs> First of all, the WSL would formally like to recognize Huntington Beach as the traditional homelands and shared territory of the Aha Shaman and Tongva peoples. It is known by the name Lukupangma in Aha Shaman and, Tong and Tongva languages. The Aha Shaman people have lived in this place we call Orange County for over 10 thousand years and are still here stewarding the land along with surfers, environmentalists, and others who care about our shared coastline. We thank them for their ongoing presence and participation in this event. Now it's time to welcome to the awards presentation for the 2022 Vans US Open of Surfing. This is the fourth stop on the 2022 World Surf League Challenger Series and the second stop on the 2022 WSL Longboard Tour. I'd like to thank again the fans here at Huntington Beach. Love to thank all of the surfers that have made this happen and all of the crew because this has been nine days of the world's largest action sports festival. Of course, thank you to Vans. Again, I want to thank Vans as our pre presenting sponsor. Vans, keeping it rad since 1966. Thank you, Vans. Also, our event partners, and we have a lot of supporters, Visit Huntington Beach, Red Bull, Flying Embers, Hydro Flask, Shiseido, the good people at 805, 
Pacifico, Sambazon, Stillhouse, Youth Theory, BF Goodrich, Foo Wax keeping it sticky, Box Water, and Just Egg. Let's give a hand for all the supporters because without them, this doesn't happen. Special thanks to IMG and the event staff, all the athletes, and again, the local community for your support of this event. On stage with me, we have Kira Seal, the WSL Senior Manager of the Longboard Tour. Travis Logie, the WSL Senior Manager of Tours and Competition. Jesse Miley Dyer is here, the Senior Vice President of Tours and the Head of Competition. A man that needs no introduction, Mr. Steven Van Doren. And the mayor of Huntington Beach, Barbara DeGlaze. You guys ready to hand out some hardware? Let's get to it. Runner up for the 2022 Vans Duct Tape Invitation Award, Smooth Surfer from the South Shore of Oahu. Let's give it up for Connie Alla Stewart. Come on out here, Connie. Oh, yeah. Connie, I, I'm going to get you. <laughs> Finals, big week over here, and you were one of the smoothest surfers out in the water. Your takeaway? Uh, I had fun. I love it here. Um, it was just a little tricky to find the good ones, but Taylor got some good ones. But um, yeah, just happy to be here. Thank you, guys. Connie Ella Stewart. <laughs> Runner up in the women's division for the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. I want to call to the stage Honolua Bloomfield. Come out here, Hono. Another Hawaiian. Honolua, we've had two events on the World Longboard Tour, and you've been in the finals of both. Your takeaway from here from Huntington Beach. Uh, I'm just stoked to be here. I'm stoked there's three events this year. Uh, thank you all for coming to support and watch. And thank you, Vans and WSL, and all my sponsors and all the sponsors of the event. Let's give a hand for Honolulu Bloomfield. Now our men's champion for the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. He's a three-time world champion. He's a two-time US Open champion, and he's got another award coming to him. Let's give it up for Taylor Jensen. Taylor, the feeling right now, a champ once again here in Huntington Beach. Yeah, this is surreal. Just thanks everybody for coming out and watching. WSL, fans, stoked. Yeah, Brad, thanks. Round of applause for Taylor Jensen. Yeah, Taylor. And now, our women's champion from the Vans Duct Tape Invitational, beautiful surfer from the South Shore of Hawaii, representing Waikiki, and now she's our champ, Kelis Kaleopa'a! Congratulations. Kelis, I gotta talk to you. Oh, uh, yeah, I do, I do, because this is a big moment. <laughs> Kalise comes from a deep, deep heritage in surfing, and she's continuing on. I'm, I'm just so proud of this young lady. How does it feel to be the champ? Oh, I'm just stoked to be back in Huntington, surfing alongside all these amazing surfers, <laughs> especially Connie. But um, I didn't compete in the first WSL of the season, so it feels nice to come back here, get a win, and just have fun. Well, you got it. Some good points. 5,000 points leading up to our World Championships. That's going to happen in Malibu on October 3rd through the 13th. That's going to be the waiting period where we're going to have the final stop of the World Longboard Tour at the World Surf League. So congratulations to all of our longboarders. Now turning our attention to the Challenger Series. And um, the Challenger Series is the road to the championship tour. And it's a rough road, but at the end of the year, our top 10 men, our top five women are gonna earn their spot 
on the 2023 Championship Tour. And walking down the road and making some really yardage down the path is Sakurama's own Joao Chianca, our 2022 runner-up here at the Vans US Open of Surfing. Joao. Shumbinho, Shumbinho, I want to get some words from you. What's this feel like right now? You know, tough start of the season, but now you got to keep a result and you're making your way to re-qualifying for the championship tour. Yeah, I want to thank everyone in the beach. I want to thank WSL for the event. I want to thank Huntington Beach. I want to thank God. I've been asking for his strength. A lot of up and downs on this year and he gave me situations to become stronger. So I'm really stoked. I want to thank my family. I want to thank my friends, my sponsors, CI Team, Volcom, and nothing else. I'm becoming stronger. There's a whole, whole year in front of me. So yeah, stoked. Parabéns, João Chianca. Four. Our women's division in the Challenger Series, our runner-up, Australian, she ripped all week. And I want to congratulate and bring to the stage Macy Callahan. Come out here, Macy. Macy. Oh, oh, we're good. These are strong trophies, built to last. Um, Macy. Macy. <laughs> We're good. So, Macy, second final in a row. You're on a roll right now in the Challenger Series in looking at requalification for the championship tour. How do you feel for back-to-back -back finals? Yeah, um, I'm very tired. Uh, that was a long week. Um, I'm very happy to make the final again and get another result. The, the girls, uh, you know, they only take five, so all the girls have great results. And, um, yeah, I'm just happy I got another keeper. Let's give it up for Macy. And now, our men's champ, the 2022 Vans US Open of Surfing champion. Let's give it up for the big Hawaiian. Bring to the stage Ezekiel Lau. <laughs> hold it up, Zeke, hold it up. There you go, your champ. <laughs> Let me come in here. I want to get. I want to get a word from you. This. This is a. It's not a sprint, Zeke. It's a marathon this week, and you came out on top. How you feel? Oh, it feels great. It's definitely been a long week. There's been a lot of conditions, but you know, I've been feeling the love out here in HB. I just want to thank everyone for coming out. I just really love the support from everyone here. It makes a difference, and uh, I was just glad I was uh, able to perform for you guys. Thank you. Oh my Kai, congratulations, Ezekiel Lau. We got one more award to give out, and that's to an inspirational young lady who came here and ended up being the champ. Your 2022 Vans US Open of Surfing, the Queen of Haleva, Betty Lou Sakura Johnson. <laughs> Betty Lou, Betty Lou, Betty Lou, I got to get some words from you. That what you've been ripping all week. That was a big victory. I want to know the feeling that you're feeling right now. I'm feeling really great. I mean, this, this is very special um, to be on the podium with all these great surfers this whole week. Um, it's been a very hard couple days of competing out here, and I'm super stoked to have a fun day today. Congratulations to all our winners here. Let's get them out here for some photo opportunities. You guys, hoist those above your head and let's uh, let the paparazzis do their thing. And just like that, Crowning champions here at the Vans US Open of surfing. Thank you, Kaipo Guerrero.
Great job emceeing that uh, emotional ceremony. Of course, Kaipo knew, know, uh, knows all three of those winners from Hawaii since they were probably about five years old. So, uh, Uncle, great job there announcing those winners and congratulations to all the winners. And now let's get back to breaking down finals day. So, as we all knew, coming into finals day, we were going to see semifinals action from both the Challenger Series as well as the Vans Duct Tape Invitational. We talked about the women's final. It's time to break down the men's final. So, all week long, the men went out there for the Vans Duct Tape Invitational and put on an absolute clinic. And these two finalists right here started off strong. Uh, this was a big final for Jensen and Stewart, and really anyone's call when they paddled out to the lineup. Yeah, for both TJ and for Coniella, they were in a rhythm this week. For Taylor to be able to take away the win here in a duct tape is, I think, extra special for him. And he really was kind of one of those surfers to beat. He knows this break so well, Pete. You got to call the action. Connie seemed to be in rhythm throughout all of finals day but it was Taylor's knowledge that took him to the win. Yeah, and I think that his wave choice was really the ch the difference in, in my opinion. He was able to pick those waves. It gave him the opportunity to get to the tip of the board, utilize the walk around, but also utilizing the turns, which uh, the judges seemed to really like. He was edging towards progression, but I think he kind of mentally calmed himself down. A 7.67 and a 6.17, two scores that would get you through any heat of the day. Yeah, a great result for Taylor Jensen and an excellent result as well for Coniella Stewart, the Waikiki kid advancing through, getting that second place finish behind him, heading into Malibu. That's going to be a great result, but we could see the three-time world champion now head-to-head -head with Harrison Roach. Maybe he goes for a fourth world title this year. Ooh, it's going to be very exciting as we head to Malibu. Iconic longboard spot, the spot where the finals of the World Surf League Longboard Tour will be. Let's take a look at the rankings as we see them now. Freshly updated, here is your women's longboard tour rankings. Honolulu still up top, Kalis in second, Chloe Kalman and Soleil both drop a couple spots along with Tully White. Rachel Tilly moving her way up along with Caitlin Mickelson, Avalon Gall as well. So you got 10 surfers, but a bunch of ties there, which we're going to decide just around the corner in Malibu. Well, but I mean, also you got to think about Malibu is going to be double the point. So really the champion's going to be decided there. You're taking one result probably from here and whatever you can do in Malibu. So it's going to be a big event there. And so from the women's longboard tour rankings, let's flip it over and check out what's happening on the men's side of the draw. Here are your men's longboard tour rankings updated just now. Harrison Roach in the lead. Taylor Jensen way up there, tied for that first place spot. And everybody else shaking up. Ben Skinner drops one spot. Kaniela Stewart in third. Quintal in fifth, tied with Kaimana, Takayama, and Declan Whiten, all the way down to Cole Robbins. So again, a bunch of ties there, Shannon. All these surfers will be headed to the Cuervo Classic Longboard Championship October 3rd through the 13th, Malibu, California. And of those names that we just saw right there I mean it is still anyone's ball game there's still so much on the line because there is 10,000 points heading into that event but it's got to be those top two the surfers that have taken the wins out for the first two events of the tour they're keeping those as their highest scoring events heading into that we're dropping that bottom result so everyone's just got that singular result to them which is why there are so many of those ties I'm really excited for uh, finals in Malibu and I think we're going to see those surfers that tend to thrive in a traditional wave like Malibu really find more success than maybe they did here at Huntington. Well, October can't come soon enough. The finals right around the corner at Malibu. So from longboard, let's go to shortboard. Challenger Series women went out there on day one and put on an amazing show all the way through. Betty Lou Sakura Johnson, so good. She's got named three times. And she went out there in this final and started doing damage early. Macy Callahan had a decent start with a 5.67 and a 4.3. But Betty Lou Sakura Johnson hammered down pedal to the metal surfing. It was pretty wild because Macy kicked off early with that 5-6-7 and then never really got a scoring wave until close to the finish. Betty Lou, it took her a few waves, maybe some little mistakes within her surfing as well as far as wave selection and pushing a little too hard, maybe catching too many waves. But she found those best scores out there and she seemed to just dominate once she got into a rhythm. To see the young Hawaiian win her second event of this level, Another challenger series after taking one out last year speaks to the consistency that she's beginning to find and the threat that she is. And one thing that's good for Betty Lou here is that she's had some struggles surfing outside of the home state, you know, and this is something that she can now realize, hey, I can win outside of Hawaii. And it's a big win for her.
Yeah, not just a charger. Now she is a bona fide small wave wizard. Did it in a huge way here in Huntington Beach. So the Challenger Series for the women is heating up at the top of the pack right there. But for the men, we just watched an epic final. We were hoping and expecting big things, and we got it. We had paddle battles. We had everything you wanted to see, but Zeke Lau just looked in form. His board looked perfect. He did everything right in this heat. He got the momentum early and kept it all the way through to the final. Pete, this was a amazing, dynamic performance from Ezekiel Lau. And he didn't make uh, many errors throughout the entire week. You know, in a lot of variety of conditions, he was making good choices on waves. He was making good choices with his equipment, but also he competed very, very well. He put his head down. He didn't let the scores discourage him a little bit. I mean, there was that one moment when he got a 3-6-7 in the semifinal this morning after he did a nice air reverse that he probably thought he had completed, but he didn't let it affect him. He stayed positive. He stayed on tack. He stayed on the point, and look what happened. He took the win. Yeah, you had three out of four Hawaiian surfers up there on the podium. Pretty cool to see that. Uh, the Vans U.S. Open of Surfing Men's Final went like this. Ezekiel Lau with a 6-9 and a 5-5, enough to get him the win. And also a huge boost for Ezekiel Lau as he jumps multiple spots up the Men's Challenger Series rankings. So uh, for Ezekiel Lau, you know, he's put himself right in the driver's seat to potentially re-qualify to get back onto the championship tour. Rio Wida still in the lead. He's got a huge lead with that 21,050 points. And you look down that list, we do have some ties still happening in the top 10. Nice to see Aton Osborne make a big jump as well into the top 10. So from the Men's Challenger Series rankings, Let's flip it over and check out what's going on in the women's top 10. Caitlin Simmers in the lead. Molly Picklum right there in second. Macy, Betty Lou locking themselves into the top five. Sophie McCullough with a huge jump as well. So our top 10 for the women's rankings, very tight up at the top. And uh, we're looking forward to some big things for the final three spots on the women's and men's challenger series. Well, that was an epic series of finals and there will be more to come. We're gonna take a quick break, but we come back. Let's talk a little bit about Tahiti, the end of the road. It's gonna be epic. This is the 805 Post Show, stay tuned. We are with Wild Coast and Shiseido and WSL here doing a beach cleanup. We're just picking up trash up from HB and collecting as much trash as we can. We Are One Ocean is a global initiative to inspire our global surf community to protect and conserve our one ocean and preserve the future of our sport. 
In partnership with local nonprofit organizations, We Are One Ocean activates at WSL events, giving back to local communities around the world via coastal restoration activities and environmental initiatives. At Wild Coast, we are all about saving our wild coasts and oceans, and we have partnered with WSL to help clean up the beach and save our oceans worldwide. Today, we are here on the beautiful Huntington Beach, driving not just awareness, but action on this beach, cleaning this beach. It's just amazing to continually be a part of organizations that take care of the places that we come to compete. For us to come down and do our part right now, it's been inspiring me to get down more often, and this is what it's all about. As a surfer, sustainability means a ton to me, and uh, I'm pumped that Shiseido and WSL are supporting the ocean and the environment. We've been doing these beach cleanups for three years now. It's a really beautiful campaign that we're doing to bring people together to raise awareness as a brand in partnership with the World Surf League and with Wild Coast. To have them kind of come into the surfing world and also want to make a difference in terms of keeping our oceans and beaches clean and to be able to collaborate with such a big brand on that level has been really, really cool for me to be a part of. Our contribution from the indigenous nations that we work with and we represent is to help to restructure that narrative and to have that inclusivity of our people within these coastal environments. I grew up at the beach, and these are beautiful spaces that everybody can go enjoy, and it's a space that we can really help. Everything around the world is connected, and they're just very easy things that we can do to go out and help save the ocean worldwide. What she said is doing is so amazing, and I feel so proud to be a part of it. It's our way of giving back to the ocean. Uh, not only surfers, but the whole world, we all need the ocean. You know, we're not only spreading the message, but also physically doing it. Try to hook up with your local nonprofits and help them as much as you can because we want to keep the beach clean so we can get out there and have a clean, nice ocean. This is where the big change happens. It's when multinational companies are coming together to do this type of work at this level on the ground and building a community around it. The more people we can get on board, the bigger difference we'll make. So these events are great for that. What more can you say about WeAreOneOcean.org? A great, great time down here. The 805 Post Show rolls on. Speaking of rolling on, the Vans Showdown starts any minute. It might already be going. Skate Park is going off just on the other side of that big WSL tent. There's a purpose-built skate park that Vans made for uh, some of the world's best skaters to get involved, and that's going to be happening all afternoon long. So as uh, we kind of digest everything that's gone down, it's nice to know, of course, heated competition out there. Everybody comes to the beach. It's a show of great sportsmanship, a celebration of surfing, and uh, part of the Vans U.S. Open of Surfing, of course, the activities behind us. They'll be going on until about dark. So if, uh, if you can get down here, get down here. But you missed an epic week, and I'll tell you, one thing that we're very excited about is Tahiti. It is right around the corner. The Outer Note Tahiti Pro is rearing its scary head and you can almost hear the waves breaking. And uh, speaking of that, there is some breaking news. Unfortunately, we do lose one of our favorites in this competition, in any competition. The one and only John John Florence has announced that he will not be competing in the upcoming Outer Known Tahiti Pro. Uh, this is due to an injury he sustained recently. Uh, it's kind of bittersweet because obviously when you see John John Florence and Tahiti in the same sentence, you know big things are going to happen. So true. You know, it really is a bit of a disappointment. He uh, is on a boat in the middle of the Pacific. I know that uh, for sure. We've been following on on social media. He is one of the best at Tahiti, one of the best in the barrel. Uh, unfortunately, that injury that he did sustain is too serious. Also, uh, you know, I think the boat got some damage too, but either way, I think the knee is really what's holding him back. Got to get him 100% so we can see him back at Pipeline. Well, with that bad news, there is good news. The Spartan will be back in competition. Michelle Perez gets the call up to compete at home at Chopo, well the end deserved. of the road, uh, basically his backyard. And so uh, anytime you get to see the Spartan in big barreling waves, that's a good thing to see. What do you think Michelle Perez's chances are in Tahiti? Oh, so high, so, so high. I love that he's gotten the call up. Sad to see John out of the mix, but to be able to see Michelle Perez getting that call up back on the championship tour this year, he's been fighting hard for that requalification on the Challenger Series. 
Pete, it's going to be a pleasure to watch him, and he could easily take out the Yeah, lead. and he's not going to have any pressure this time. I mean, we've seen him in the past here. He hasn't had great success, even though he surfs the place so well. This time, though, hey, it's all for just fun, right? So he's going to go out there and get barreled with only another one other surfer in the water. So uh, I can't wait to see Michelle Perez, and I can't wait to get to he because I'm, uh, I'm almost there. I'm going to be there in like 48 hours. It's Must crazy. be nice. Put me in your board bag, Pete. <laughs> I know you got room. Well, another Tahitian that we're excited to see is Vahine Fierro. She has been an absolute standout at all the mega sessions that have gone down at the end of the road. Vahine Fierro getting herself involved in WSL competition at Tahiti. Vahine is going to be a threat and some in big barreling waves at Chopo. I think we could see very easily the repeat of what we watched at Pipeline this year with Moana Jones-Wong, the Anne-Marie Blue Crush story coming alive in the most death-defying wave in Tahiti and on the planet with Fahine Fierro getting into the draw. I'm so proud of her for the performances that she has put together. And I think with the wave she's been bagging in her free surfs recently, that she is going to be the surfer in the draw to beat above every woman on the ch uh, championship tour. I would agree. I think that she's going to go there very confident. Uh, she did have a wipeout that she had to deal with. I think that that's something that plays into your head slightly. But I mean, what's the worst to get happen? A scrape on your foot. So I think that she's going to be one to watch. Uh, she's a goofy foot, which is perfect for surfing here in Tahiti. Uh, and again, very comfortable over that shallow reef. Yeah, fantasy surfing team, team captains. Make note, you should probably put Vahine Fierro on your team. She's going to do some damage out there. Well, there it is, the wave that strikes fear through the hearts of every oh surfer gosh. on the planet. And do uh, you think we're going to see waves like that? How's the forecast look? The forecast looks like we're going to have some swell. I wouldn't say necessarily like that, but ultimately it has improved, uh, at least the forecast that I've been looking at. Um, you know, it didn't look great a couple days ago, and it's getting better. So hopefully, fingers crossed, that's uh, the case. It keeps getting better each day before we start the event. Well, August 11th, it's right around the corner. And it's not just the wave that's scary. It's also the ramifications for the results. This is is the final stop on the WSL Championship Tour, so the last chance for surfers to make their way to the Rip Curl WSL Finals, which is directly after Tahiti. So a lot at stake in many ways. Anytime you go to the end of the road, you never know what's going to happen. But I'll tell you what's going to happen right here on the 805 Post Show. This is the Stillhouse Top 5. So this is a, a moment that we've been waiting for, your unbreakable Top 5. We're going to start with the heir of the event, Aton Osborne going upside down for a 9-6. Six, seven. And how good was the landing? That's really what made it for me. Obviously, the size, the rotation, all of that, but the landing was stomped, stomped as you can make it. I mean, literally, no worries. Got a new, undeniable nine point ride. Could have even been a 10. Straight, yeah, straight up video part surfing right there. So, from number five, Aton Osborne's air, let's go to some finalists. This is your Stillhouse Unbreakable number four moment, Kalis Kaliopa'a, our Vans Duct Tape Invitational winner. Back-to-back -back wins for the Vans Duct Tape Invitational here in Huntington Beach. And for her, she's now tied in the rankings with none other than the three-time champ in Honolulu Bloomfield. But it was the style, the grace, the poise of the Hawaiian, the young one, and Kalis taking out the win. Yeah, and I love to see that when your competitor is carrying you up the beach. That means uh, great sportsmanship. Now your number three, Stillhouse Unbreakable Moment, Taylor Jensen. This guy's been around the block and back, and it's pretty cool that he can adapt and, uh, you know, kind of not change his style, but rework what he does best to fit into the traditional longboarding format. Well, what we know of Taylor Jensen's style of longboarding, how he won his world titles was pretty much the opposite. For him to make those adjustments now, coming into the tour the last couple of years, has been great to see and, and a, a solid performance to take out the win. And those, uh, those guys are, must be pretty strong to carry a <laughs> big man like that up the beach. Number two on our Stillhouse Unbreakable Top 5, Betty Lou Sakura Johnson. Style, speed, power, finesse, wave selection. She's been on fire since day one, continued her role, making it look easy out there. She sure did. It was really cool to see because, uh, you know what, again, as I had mentioned earlier, to have her be able to win, you know, outside of Hawaii, she, her best results came at Sunset Beach, and, you know, at the championship tour level, she got an equal third there, but just could not find results outside of Hawaii. So to have her winning here in North America is a huge confidence builder. Absolutely. That brings us to our Stillhouse Unbreakable number one moment, Ezekiel Lau, your Vans U.S. Open of Surfing champion. He did it with power. He did it in the air. 
Ezekiel Lau was unstoppable all week, all week long. The ultimate surfer, the ultimate champion here at the Vans US Open of Surfing, brought in that rail game, brought in the air game, everything that we would have hoped for, that the fans would have hoped for here in a final. And to take out Joao Chianca, who's been one of the informed surfers of the year, is a really impressive victory for the Hawaiian. Well, congrats to all of our surfers involved. Thank you to all the fans for tuning in, for showing up at the beach, for cheering for your favorite surfers. You made this a very special week here at the Vans US Open of Surfing. And uh, if you think back to day one, these surfers had to go through all different types of conditions. And the good news is the beach was packed. It was a beach party for the ages, the largest action sports festival on the planet. So you think we're going to be back here tomorrow, uh, next summer? Maybe tomorrow. Who knows? Day <laughs> 10 out tomorrow. of day nine, though. It's that good uh, of a we'll time. We'll definitely be back here next year. And I think uh, the crowd's going to love it. Well, I can't wait. Well, we got a lot of big things coming from you for you from the WSL. We've got Tahiti, and right now we're going to give you a highlights package that starts way back on Monday. Here you go. Thank you for watching. We'll see you in Tahiti. Welcome, surf fans. We are all systems go here at the Vans U.S. Open of Surfing. The women will be taken to the water all day long. Alba Lopez just entered her name into the game. Whoa, that was massive. I don't know who told you different. I work hard for this. Sacrifice so much to make it here. I came too far for this. They were sleeping. I was up and training, going off for this. Push myself to limits unimaginable to average folk. And no, this don't come overnight. You get there staying gradual. Bang, big spray to the sky. One-two punch there by Mark Solid Surfing. Molly Picklin, boom. History you about to witness. Victory awaits, I'm with it. Mama said I'm something special. Now it's time I go refill it. Beast mode, I'm about to kill it. Competition about to fill it. If you ain't telling yourself that you the greatest, why you win it? I'ma keep on going hard till it's all mine. Won't stop until I am the greatest one of all time. Can't nobody out here see me or go toe to toe. No, one of four hundred none coming for all the gold. Massive air reverse, Aton Osborne. Oh. Marks, she just slams it. Another big day here at the Vans US Open of surfing. What a way to start things off for young Bronte. Betty Lou, oh. nice snap to start. The Johnson family feeling stoked. Caitlin Simmers, a prodigy. This is your first look at the Duct Tape Invitational. Look at that nose ride. We're making history. Two broken boards. Look at that, hang 10. Wow. Tony, wow, beautiful five. No surprise, just another win at HBP. That's Wasabi. Connie threw into the quarterfinals. Now we are into the quarterfinals for this year's Challenger Series here at Huntington Beach. Are you ready to go? A smiley Betty Lou Johnson. Bloomfield, a great ride. Beautiful, wow. We've been working our way to finals day all week long, and we have arrived. Heart of a hero, spirit of a champion, brave and invincible. Oh, man. A heartbreaking finish. The heart of a hero. Congratulations.
congratulations to Khalees Kaleopaa. There's your champ, Taylor Jensen, for the fans duct tape invitation. Exploding into the lift. Betty Lou Sakura Johnson, your Vans U.S. Open of Surfing champion. This copyrighted event broadcast is produced by the World Surf League for broadcast around the world and may not be retransmitted, reproduced, rebroadcast, or otherwise distributed or used in any form without the written consent of the World Surf League.